Section number one of the Ladies' Paradise. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine G. The Ladies' Paradise by Emile Sola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizetelli. Chapter one. Part one. Denise had walked from the St. Lazare railway station where a Cherbourg train had landed her and her two brothers after a night passed on the hard seat of a third-class carriage. She was leading Pepe by the hand, and Jean was following her, all three fatigued after the journey, frightened and lost in this vast Paris, their eyes on every street name, asking at every corner the way to the Rue de la Michaudière, where their uncle Baudou lived. But on arriving in the place Galion, the young girl stopped short, astonished. "'Oh!' "'Look there, Jean,' said she, and they stood still, nestling close to one another, all dressed in black, wearing the old mourning bought at her father's death. She, rather puny for her twenty years, was carrying a small parcel. On the other side, her little brother, five years old, was clinging to her arm, while behind her, the big brother, a strapping youth of sixteen, was standing empty-handed. "'Well,' said she, after a pause, that is a shop. They were at the corner of the Rue de la Mijodière and the Rue Nouveau Saint Augustine, in front of a draper's shop, which displayed a wealth of colour in the soft October light. Eight o'clock was striking at the Church of Saint Roche. Not many people were about; only a few clerks in their way to business and housewives doing their morning shopping. Before the door, two shopmen, mounted on a step ladder, were hanging up some woollen goods whilst in the window in the Rue Nouveau Saint Augustine, another young man, kneeling with his back to the pavement, was delicately plaiting a piece of blue silk. In the shop, where there were as yet no customers, there was a buzz as of a swarm of bees at work. "'By Jove!" said Jean, "'this beads for lawns. Yours wasn't such a fine shop.' Denise shook her head. She had spent two years there, at Connell's, the principal drapers in the town, and this shop, encountered so suddenly, this, to her, enormous place, made her heart swell, and kept her excited, interested, and oblivious of everything else. The high plate-glass door, facing the Place Gaillon, reached the first story, amidst a complication of ornaments, covered with gilding. Two allegorical figures, representing two laughing, bare-breasted women, enrolled a scroll bearing the sign, The Ladies' Paradise. The establishment extended along the Rue de la Michaudière and the Rue Neuveau Saint Augustine, and comprised, beside the corner house, four others, two on the right and two on the left, bought and fitted up recently. It seemed to her an endless extension, with its display on the ground floor, and the plate glass windows through which could be seen the whole length of the counters. Upstairs, a young lady, dressed all in silk, was sharpening a pencil while two others beside her were unfolding some velvet mantles. "'The Ladies' Paradise,' read Jean, with the tender laugh of a handsome youth who had already had an adventure with a woman. "'That must draw the customers, eh?' But Denise was absorbed by the display at the principal entrance. There she saw, in the open street, on the very pavement, a mounted of cheap goods. Bargains, placed there to tempt the passers-by, and attract attention— Hanging from above were pieces of woollen and cloth goods, merinos, cheviots, and tweeds, floating like flags. The neutral slate, navy blue and olive green tints, being relieved by the large white price tickets. Close by, round the doorway, were hanging strips of fur, narrow bands for dress trimmings, fine Siberian squirrel skin, spotless snowy swan's down, rabbit skin imitation ermine, and imitation sable. Below, on shelves and on tables, amidst a pile of remnants, appeared an immense quantity of hosiery, almost given away. Knitted woolen gloves, neckerchiefs, women's hoods, waistcoats, a winter show in all colours, striped, dyed and variegated, with here and there a flaming patch of red. Then he saw some tartan at nine sous, some strips of American vision at a franc, and some mittens at five sous. There appeared to be an immense clearance sale going on, the establishment seemed bursting with goods, blocking up the pavement with a surplus. Uncle Baudu was forgotten. Pepe himself, clinging tightly to his sister's hand, 
opened his big eyes in wonder. A vehicle coming up forced them to quit the roadway, and they turned up the Rue Neuve Saint Augustine mechanically, following the shop windows and stopping at each fresh display. At first they were captivated by a complicated arrangement. Above, a number of umbrellas, laid obliquely, seemed to form a rustic roof. Beneath these a quantity of silk stockings, hung on rods, showed the roundness of the calves, some covered with rosebuds, others of all colours, black open-worked, red with embroidered corners, and flesh colour, the silky grain of which made them look as soft as a fair woman's skin and at the bottom of all a symmetrical array of gloves with their taper fingers and narrow palms and that rigid virgin grace which characterizes such feminine articles before they are worn but the last window especially attracted their attention it was an exhibition of silks satins and velvets arranged so as to produce by a skilful artistic arrangement of colours the most delicious shades imaginable at the top were the velvets from a deep black to a milky white Lower down, the satins, pink, blue, fading away into shades of wondrous delicacy. Still lower down were the silks. Of all the colours of the rainbow, pieces set up in the form of shells, others folded as if round a pretty figure, arranged in a lifelike natural manner by the clever finger of the window dresses. Between each motive, between each coloured phrase of the display, ran a discreet accompaniment, a slight puffy ring of cream-coloured silk, at each end were piled up enormous bales of the silk of which the house had made a speciality the paris paradise and the golden grain two exceptional articles destined to work a revolution in that branch of commerce oh that silk at five francs twelve sous murmured denise astonished at the paris paradise jean began to get tired he stopped a passer-by which is the rue de la michaudière please sir of hearing that it was the first on the right, they all turned back, making the tour of the establishment. But just as she was entering the street, Denise was attracted by a window in which ladies' dresses were displayed. At Corneille's, that was her department, but she had never seen anything like this, and remained rooted to the spot with admiration. At the back a large sash of Bruges lace, of considerable value, was spread out like an altar veil, with its two white wings extended. There were flounces of Alençon point, grouped in garlands. Then from the top to the bottom fluttered, like a fall of snow, a cloud of lace of every description. Malinais, Honiton, Valenciennes, Brussels, and Venetian point. On each side the heavy columns were draped with cloth, making their background appear still more distant. And the dresses were in this sort of chapel, raised to the worship of women's beauty and grace. Occupying the centre was a magnificent article, a velvet mantle trimmed with silver fox. On one side a silk cape lined with miniver, on the other a cloth cloak edged with cock's plumes. And last of all, opera cloaks in white cashmere and white silk, trimmed with swan's down or chenille. There was something for all tastes, from the opera cloaks at twenty-nine francs to the velvet mantle marked up at eighteen hundred. The well-rounded neck and graceful figures of the dummies exaggerated the slimness of the waist, the absent head being replaced by a large price-ticket pinned on the neck, whilst the mirrors, cleverly arranged on each side of the window, reflected and multiplied the forms without end, peopling the street with these beautiful women for sale, each bearing a price and big figures in the place of her head. "'How stunning they are!' murmured Sean, finding no other words to express his emotion. This time he himself had become motionless, his mouth open. All this female luxury turned him rosy with pleasure. He had a girl's beauty, a beauty he seemed to have stolen from his sister, a lovely skin, curly hair, lips and eyes overflowing with tenderness. By his side Denise, in her astonishment, appeared thinner still, with her rather long face and large mouth, fading complexion and light hair. Pepe, also fair, in the way of most children, clung closer to her as if wanting to be caressed, troubled and delighted at the sight of the beautiful ladies in the window. They looked so strange, so charming on the pavement, those three fair ones, poorly dressed in black, the sad-looking young girl between the pretty child and the handsome youth, that the passers-by looked back smilingly. 
for several minutes a stout man with grey hair and a large yellow face standing at a shop door on the other side of the street had been looking at them he was standing there with bloodshot eyes and contracted mouth beside himself with rage at the display made by the ladies paradise when the sight of the young girl and her brothers completed his exasperation what were those three simpletons doing there gaping in front of the cheap jack's parade what about uncle asked denise suddenly as if just waking up we are in the rue de la michaudière said jean he must live somewhere about here they raised their heads and looked around just in front of them above the stout man they perceived a green signboard bearing in yellow letters discoloured by the rain the old elbeuf cloths flannels baudu late hochecon the house coated with an ancient rusty whitewash quite flat and unadorned amidst the mansions in the louis the fourteenth style which surrounded it had only three front windows and these windows square without shutters were simply ornamented by a handrail and two iron bars in the form of a cross but amidst all this nudity what struck denise the most her eyes full of the light airy windows at the ladies paradise was a ground-floor shop crushed by the ceiling surmounted by a very low story with half-moon windows of a prison-like appearance the wainscoting of a bottle green hue which time had tinted with ochre and bitumen and circled right and left two deep windows black and dusty in which the heaped-up goods could hardly be seen the open door seemed to lead into the darkness and dampness of a cellar that's the house said jean well we must go in declared denise come on pepe they appeared however somewhat troubled as if seized with fear when their father died carried off by the same fever which had a month previous killed their mother their uncle Baudu, in the emotion which followed this double mourning, had written to Denise, assuring her there would always be a place for her in his house, whenever she would like to come to Paris. But this was nearly a year ago, and the young girl was now sorry to have left Valence in a moment of temper without informing her uncle. The latter did not know them, never having set foot in Valence, since the day he left, as a boy, to enter as junior in the drapery establishment kept by Rochecorn whose daughter he afterwards married. "'Monsieur Baudu,' asked Denise, deciding at last to speak to the stout man who was still eyeing them, surprised at their appearance. "'That's me,' replied he. Denise blushed and stammered out. "'Oh, I'm so pleased. I'm Denise. This is Jean, and this is Pepe. You see, we have come, uncle.' Baudu seemed amazed. His big eyes rolled in his yellow face. He spoke slowly and with difficulty. He was evidently far from thinking of his family, which suddenly dropped down on him. "'What? What? You here?' repeated he several times. "'But you were at Valence. Why aren't you at Valence?' With her sweet but rather faltering voice, she then explained that, since the death of her father, who had spent everything in his dye work, she had acted as a mother to the two children— but the little she earned at Cornell's did not suffice to keep the three of them. Jean worked at a cabin's maker, a repairer of old furniture, but didn't earn a sou. However, he had got to like the business, and had learned to carve in wood very well. One day, having found a piece of ivory, he amused himself by carving a head, which a gentleman staying in the town had seen and admired, and it was this gentleman who had persuaded them to leave Valence, promising to find a place in Paris for Jean with an ivory carver. "'So you see, uncle,' continued Denise, "'Sean will commence his apprenticeship at his new master's to-morrow. "'They ask no premium, and will board and lodge him. "'I felt sure Pepe and I could manage very well. "'We can't be worse off than we were at Valence.' "'She said nothing about Sean's love affair, "'of certain letters written to the daughter of a nobleman living in the town, "'of kisses exchanged over a wall. "'In fact, quite a scandal which had determined her leaving.' and she was especially anxious to be in Paris, to be able to look after her brother, feeling quite a mother's tender anxiety for this gay and handsome youth, whom all the women adored. Uncle Baudu couldn't get over it, and continued his questions. However, when he heard her speaking of her brothers in this way, he became much kinder. "'So your father has left you nothing,' said he. "'I certainly thought there was still something left. 
Ah, how many times did I write advising him not to take that dire work? A good-hearted fellow, but no head for business. And you've been obliged to keep and look after these two youngsters since. His bilious face had become clearer. His eyes were not so bloodshot as when he was glaring at the ladies' paradise. Suddenly he noticed that he was blocking up the doorway. Well, said he, come in now you're here. Come in. No use hanging about, gaping at a parcel of rubbish. And after having darted a last look of anger at the lady's paradise, he made way for the children by entering the shop and calling his wife and daughter. Elizabeth, Genevieve, come down. Here is company for you. But Denise and the two boys hesitated before the darkness of the shop. Blinded by the clear light of the street, they could hardly see. Feeling their way with their feet with an instinctive fear of encountering some treacherous step, and clinging still closer together from this vague fear, the child continued to hold the young girl's skirts, and the big boy behind. They made their entry with the smiling, anxious grace. The clear morning light described the dark profile of their morning clothes. An oblique ray of sunshine gilded their fair hair. "'Come in, come in,' repeated Baudu. In a few brief sentences he explained the matter to his wife and daughter. The first was a little woman, eaten up with anemia, quite white, white hair, white eyes, white lips. Genevieve, in whom her mother's degenerateness appeared stronger still, had the debilitated, colourless appearance of a plant reared in the shade. However, her magnificent black hair, thick and heavy, marvellously vigorous for such a weak, poor soil, gave her a sad charm. "'Come in,' said both the women in their turn. "'You are welcome.' And they made Denise sit down behind a counter. Pepe immediately jumped up on his sister's lap, while Jean leant against some woodwork beside her. Looking round the shop, the newcomers began to take courage, their eyes getting used to the obscurity. Now they could see it, with its low and smoky ceiling, oaken counters bright with use, and old-fashioned drawers with strong iron fittings. Bales of goods reached to the beans above. The smell of linen and dyed stuff, a sharp chemical smell, seemed intensified by the humidity of the floor. At the further end two young men and a young woman were putting away pieces of a white flannel. "'Perhaps this young gentleman would like to take something,' said Madame Baudu, smiling at Pepe. "'No, thanks,' replied Denise. "'We have a cup of milk in a café opposite the station.' And as Genevieve looked at the small parcel she laid down, she added, "'I left our box there, too.' She blushed, feeling that she ought not to have dropped down on her friends in this way. Even as she was leaving the lawns, she had been full of regrets and fears. That was why she had left the box, and given the children their breakfast. "'Come, come,' said Baudu suddenly. "'Let's come to an understanding. "'Tis true I wrote to you, but that's a year ago, "'and since then business hasn't been flourishing, I can assure you, my girl.' He stopped, choked with an emotion he did not wish to show. Madame Baudu and Genevieve, with a resigned look, had cast their eyes down. "'Oh,' continued he, "'it's a crisis which will pass, no doubt, but I have reduced my staff. There are only three here now, and this is not the moment to engage a fourth. In short, my dear girl, I cannot take you as I promised.' Denise listened, and turned very pale. He dwelt upon the subject, adding, "'It would do no good.' either to you or to me. "'All right, uncle,' replied she with a painful effort. "'I'll try and manage all the same.' The Baudus were not bad sort of people, but they complained of never having had any luck. When their business was flourishing, they had had to bring up five sons, of whom three had died before attaining the age of twenty. The fourth had gone wrong, and the fifth had just left for Mexico, as a captain. Genevieve was the only one left at home, but this large family had cost a great deal of money, and Baudu had made things worse by buying a great lumbering country house at Rambolier, near his wife's father's place. Thus, a sharp, sour feeling was springing up in the honest old tradesman's breast. "'You might have warned us,' resumed he, gradually getting angry at his own harshness. "'You could have written. I should have told you to stay at Valence. When I heard of your father's death, I said what is right on such occasions.' "'But you drop down on us without a word of warning. "'It's very awkward.' "'He raised his voice, and that relieved him. "'His wife and daughter still kept their eyes on the ground, "'like submissive persons who would never think of interfering. 
However, whilst Jean had turned pale, Denise had hugged the terrified Pepe to her bosom. She dropped hot tears of disappointment. "'All right, uncle,' she said. "'We'll go away.' At that he stopped. An awkward silence ensued. Then he resumed in a harsh tone. "'I don't mean to turn you out. As you are here, you must stay the night. Tomorrow we will see.' Then Madame Baudu and Genevieve understood they were free to arrange matters. There was no need to trouble about Jean, as he was to commence his apprenticeship the next day. As for Pepe, he would be well looked after by Madame Grasse, an old lady living in the Rue des Hortiers, who boarded and lodged young children for forty francs a month. Denise said she had sufficient to pay for the first month, and as for herself, they could soon find her a situation in the neighbourhood, no doubt. "'Wasn't Vincart wanting a saleswoman?' asked Genevieve. "'Of course!' cried Baudu. "'We'll go and see him after lunch. "'Nothing like striking the iron while it's hot.' Not a customer had been in to interrupt this family discussion. The shop remained dark and empty. At the other end, the two young men and the young woman were still working, talking in a low, hissing tone amongst themselves. However, three ladies arrived, and Denise was left alone for a moment. She kissed Pepe with a swelling heart at the thought of their approaching separation. The child, affectionate as a kitten, hid his head without saying a word. When Madame Baudu and Genevieve returned, they remarked how quiet he was. Denise assured them he never made any more noise than that, remaining for days together without speaking, living on kisses and caresses. Until lunchtime, the three women sat and talked about children, housekeeping, life in Paris, and life in the country, in short, vague sentences, like relations feeling rather awkward through not knowing one another very well. Sean had gone to the shop door, and stood there watching the passing crowd, and smiling at the pretty girls. At ten o'clock a servant appeared. As a rule, the cloth was laid for Baudu, Genevieve, and the first hand. A second lunch was served at eleven o'clock for Madame Baudu, the other young man, and the young woman. "'Come to lunch!' called out to Draper, turning towards his niece. And as all sat ready in the narrow dining-room behind the shop, he called the first hand who had not come. "'Columban!' the young man apologised, having wished to finish arranging the flannels. He was a big, stout fellow of twenty-five, heavy and freckled, with an honest face, large, weak mouth, and cunning eyes. "'There is a time for everything,' said Baudu, solidly seated before a piece of cold veal, which he was carving with a master's skill and prudence, weighing each piece at a glance to within an ounce. He served everybody, and even cut up the bread. Denise had placed Pepe near her to see that he ate properly, but the dark closed room made her feel uncomfortable. She thought it so small, after the large well-lighted rooms she had been accustomed to in the country— a single window opened on a small backyard, which communicated with the street by a dark alley along the side of the house. And this yard, sodden and filthy, was like the bottom of a well into which a glimmer of light had fallen. In the winter they were obliged to keep the gas burning all day long. When the weather enabled them to do without gas, it was duller still. Denise was several seconds before her eyes got sufficiently used to the light to distinguish the food on our plate. "'That young chap has a good appetite.' remarked Baudu, observing that Jean had finished his veal. If he works as well as he eats, he'll make a fine fellow. But you, my girl, you don't eat. And, I say, now we can talk a bit. Tell us why you didn't get married at Valence. Denise almost dropped the glass she had in her hand. Oh, uncle, get married? How can you think of it? And the little ones? She was forced to laugh. It seemed to her such a strange idea. Besides, what man would care to have her, a girl without a sou, no fatter than a lath, and not at all pretty? No, no, she would never marry. She had quite enough children with her two brothers. "'You are wrong,' said her uncle. "'A woman always needs a man. If you had found an honest young fellow, you wouldn't have dropped onto the Paris pavement, you and your brothers, like a family of gypsies.' He stopped, to divide with the parsimony, full of justice, a dish of bacon and potatoes which the servant brought in. Then, pointing to Genevieve and Columban with a spoon, he added, "'Those two will be married next spring, if we have a good winter season.' Such was the patriarchal custom of the house. The founder, Aristide Finet, had given his daughter, Desiree, to his first hand, Hochecorne. He, Baudu, 
who had arrived in the Rue de la Michaudière with seven francs in his pocket, had married all Hachecorn's daughter, Elizabeth, and he intended, in his turn, to hand over Genevieve and the business to Columban as soon as trade should improve. If he thus delayed a marriage, decided on for three years past, it was by scruple and obstinate probity. He had received the business in a prosperous state, and did not wish to pass it on to his son-in-law less patronised or in a worse position than when he took it. Baudu continued, introducing Columban, who came from Rambouillet, the same place as Madame Baudot's father. In fact, they were distant cousins. A hard-working fellow, who for ten years had slaved in the shop, fairly earning his promotions. Besides, he was far from being a nobody. He had for a father that noted Topa, Columban, a veterinarian surgeon, known all over the department of Saint-Nervouz, but so fond of the flowing bowl that he was ruining himself. "'Thank heaven,' said the draper in conclusion. "'If the father drinks and runs after the women, the son has learned the value of money here.' While he was speaking, Denise was examining Genevieve and Columban. They sat close together at table, but remained very quiet, without a blush or a smile. From the day of his entry the young man had counted on this marriage. He had passed through the various stages, junior, counterhand, etc., and had at last gained admittance into the confidence and pleasures of the family circle, all this patiently, and leading a clockwork style of life, looking upon this marriage with Genevieve as an excellent, convenient arrangement. The certainty of having her prevented him feeling any desire for her. And the young girl had also got to love him, but with the gravity of her reserved nature, and a real deep passion of which she herself was not aware, in her regular, monotonous daily life. "'Quite right, if they like each other and can do it,' said Denise, smiling, considering it her duty to make herself agreeable. "'Yes, it always finishes like that,' declared Columban, who had not spoken a word before, masticating slowly. Genevieve, after giving him a long look, said in her turn, "'When people understand each other, the rest comes naturally.' Their tenderness had sprung up in this gloomy house of old Paris like a flower in a cellar. For ten years she had known no one but him, living by his side, behind the same bales of cloth, amidst the darkness of the shop, Morning and evening they found themselves elbow to elbow in a narrow dining-room, so damp and dull. They could not have been more concealed, more utterly lost than they had been in the country, in the woods. But a doubt, a jealous fear, began to suggest itself to the young girl, that she had given her hand, for ever, amidst this abetting solitude through sheer emptiness of heart and mental weariness. However, Denise, having remarked a growing anxiety in the look Genevieve cast at Columban, good-naturedly replied, "'Oh, when people are in love they always understand each other.' But Baudu kept a sharp eye on the table. He had distributed slices of brie cheese, and, as a treat for the visitors, he called for a second dessert, a pot of red currant jam, a liberality which seemed to surprise Columban. Pepe, who up to then had been very good, behaved rather badly at the sight of the jam, while Jean, all attention during the conversation about Genevieve's marriage, was taking stock of the latter, whom he thought too weak, too pale, comparing her in his own mind to a little white rabbit with black ears and pink eyes. "'We chatted enough, and must now make room for the others,' said the draper, giving the signal to rise from table. "'Just because we have had a treat is no reason why we should want too much of it.' Madame Baudu, the other shopman, and the young lady, then came and took their places at the table. The niece, left alone again, sat near the door waiting for her uncle to take her to Vincart's. Pepe was playing at her feet, whilst Jean had resumed his post of observation at the door. She sat there for nearly an hour, taking an interest in what was going on around her. Now and again a few customers came in. A lady, then two others appeared, the shop retaining its musty odour, its half-light, by which the old-fashioned business, good-natured and simple, seemed to be weeping at its desertion. But what most interested Denise was the lady's paradise opposite, the windows of which she could see through the open door. The sky remained clouded, a sort of humid softness warmed the air, notwithstanding the season, and in this clear light, in which there was, as it were, a hazy diffusion of sunshine, the great shop seemed alive and in full activity. End of chapter 1, part 1
translated by Ernest Alfred Vizetelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter One, Part Two. Denise began to feel as if she were watching a machine working at full pressure, communicating its movement even as far as the windows. They were no longer the cold windows she had seen in the early morning. They seemed to be warm and vibrating from the activity within. There was a crowd before them, groups of women pushing and squeezing, devouring the finery with longing, covetous eyes. And the stuffs became animated in this passionate atmosphere. The laces fluttered, drooped and concealed the depths of the shop with a troubling air of mystery. Even the lengths of cloth, thick and heavy, exhaled a tempting odour, while the cloaks threw out their folds over the dummies, which assumed a soul, and the great velvet mantle particularly, expanded, supple and warm, as if on real fleshly shoulders, with the heaving of the bosom and the trembling of the hips. But the furnace-like glow which the house exhaled came above all from the sail, the crush of the counters, that could be felt behind the walls. There was the continual roaring of the machine at work, the marshalling of the customers, bewildered amidst the piles of goods, and finally pushed along to the pay-desk. And all that went on in an orderly manner, with mechanical regularity, quite a nation of women passing through the force and logic of this wonderful commercial machine. Denise had felt herself being tempted all day. She was bewildered and attracted by this shop, to her so vast, in which she saw more people in an hour than she had seen at Garnales in six months. And there was mingled with her desire to enter it a vague sense of danger which rendered the seduction complete. At the same time, her uncle's shop made her feel ill at ease. She felt an unreasonable disdain, an instinctive repugnance for this cold, icy place, the home of old-fashioned trading. All her sensations, her anxious entry, her friend's cold reception, the dull lunch eaten in a prisoner-like atmosphere, her waiting amidst the sleepy solitude of this old house doomed to speedy decay. All these sensations reproduced themselves in her mind under the form of a dumb protestation, a passionate longing for life and light. And notwithstanding her really tender heart, her eyes turned to the lady's paradise, as if the saleswoman within her felt the need to go and warm herself at the glow of this immense business. "'Plenty of customers over there,' was the remark that escaped her. But she regretted her words on seeing the Baudus near her. Madame Baudu, who had finished her lunch, was standing up, quite white, with her pale eyes fixed on the monster. Every time she caught sight of this place, a mute, blank despair swelled her heart, and filled her eyes with scalding tears. As for Genevieve, she was anxiously watching Columban, who, not supposing he was being observed, stood in ecstasy, looking at the handsome young saleswomen in the dress department opposite the counter being visible through the first-floor window. Baudu, his anger rising, merely said, "'All is not gold that glitters. Patience!' The thought of his family evidently kept back the flood of rancour which was rising in his throat. A feeling of pride prevented him displaying his temper before these children, only that morning arrived. At last the draper made an effort, and tore himself away from the spectacle of the sale opposite. "'Well,' resumed he, We'll go and see Vincar. These situations are soon snatched up. It might be too late tomorrow. But before going out, he ordered a junior to go to the station and fetch Denise's box. Madame Baudu, to whom the young girl had confided Pepe, decided to run over and see Madame Grasse to arrange about the child. Sean promised his sister not to stir from the shop. It's two minutes' walk, explained Baudu, as they went down the Rue Gaillot. Vincar has a silk business, and still does a fair trade. Of course he suffers, like every one else, but he's an artful fellow who makes both ends meet by his miserly ways. I fancy, though, he wants to retire, on account of his rheumatics. The shop was in the Rue Nouveau de Petit Chans, near the Passage Chouiseul. It was clean and light, well fitted up in the modern style, but rather small, and contained but a poor stock. They found Vincar in consultation with two gentlemen. "'Never mind us,' called out a draper. "'We are in no hurry. We can wait.' And returning to the door, he whispered to Denise, "'The thin fellow is at the Paradise, second in the silk department, 
and the stout man is a silk manufacturer from Lyon. Denise gathered that Vincart was trying to sell his business to Robineau of the Paradise. He was giving his word of honour in a frank open way, with the facility of a man who could take any number of oats without the slightest trouble. According to his account, the business was a golden one, and in the splendour of his rude health he interrupted himself to whine and complain of those infernal pains which prevented him stopping and making his fortune. But Robineau, nervous and tormented, interrupted him impatiently. He knew what a crisis the trade was passing through, and named a silk warehouse already ruined by the paradise. Vincart, inflamed, raised his voice. "'No wonder! The fall of that great booby of Vabre was certain. His wife spent everything he earned. Besides, we are more than five hundred yards away, whilst Vabre was almost next door to the paradise.' Gauchon, the silk manufacturer, then chimed in, and their voices fell again. He accused the big establishments of ruining French manufacture. Three or four laid down the law, reigning like masters over the market, and he gave it as his opinion that the only way of fighting them was to favour the small traders, above all those who dealt in special classes of goods, to whom the future belonged. Therefore he offered Robineau plenty of credit. "'See how you have been treated at the paradise,' said he. "'No notice taken of your long service?' You had the promise of the first hand's place long ago, when Boetemont, an outsider without any claim, came in and got it at once. Robineau was still smarting under this injustice. However, he hesitated to start on his own account, explaining that the money came from his wife, a legacy of sixty thousand francs she had just inherited, and he was full of scruples regarding this sum, saying that he would rather cut off his right hand than compromise her money in a doubtful affair. No said he. I haven't made up my mind. Give me time to think over it. We'll have another talk about it. As you like, replied Vincar, concealing his disappointment under a smiling countenance. It is to my interest not to sell, and were it not for my rheumatics. And returning to the middle of the shop, he asked, What can I do for you, Monsieur Baudu? The draper, who had been listening with one air, introduced Denise, told him as much as he thought necessary of her story, adding that she had two years' country experience. "'As I have heard, you are wanting a good saleswoman.' Vincart affected to be awfully sorry. "'What an unfortunate thing,' said he. "'I have indeed been looking for a saleswoman all the week, but I have just engaged one, not two hours ago.' A silence ensued. Denise seemed disheartened. Robineau, who was looking at her with interest, probably inspired with pity by her poor appearance, ventured to say, "'I know they are wanting a young person at our place, in the ready-made dress department.' Bardou could not help crying out fervently, "'At your place? Never!' Then he stopped, embarrassed. Denise had turned very red. She would never dare enter that great place, and yet the idea of being there filled her with pride. "'Why not?' asked Robineau, surprised. "'It would be a good opening for the young lady.' I advise her to go and see Madame Aureli, the first hand, to-morrow. The worst that can happen to her is not to be accepted. The draper, to conceal his inward revolt, began to talk vaguely. He knew Madame Aureli, or at least her husband, Lom, the cashier, a stout man, who had had his right arm severed by an omnibus. Then, turning suddenly to Denise, he added, However, that's her business. She can do as she likes and he went out, after having said good day to Gaujon and Robineau. Vincart went with him as far as the door, reiterating his regrets. The young girl had remained in the middle of the shop, intimidated, desirous of asking Robineau for further particulars. But not daring to, she in her turn bowed, and simply said, "'Thank you, sir.' On the way back Baudu said nothing to his niece, but walked very fast, forcing her to run to keep up with him, as if carried away by his reflections. Arrived in the Rue de la Michaudière, he was going into his shop, when a neighbouring shopkeeper, standing at his door, called him. "'What is it, old Bourras?' asked the draper. Bourras was a tall old man, with a prophet's head, bearded and hairy, and piercing eyes under thick and bushy eyebrows. He kept an umbrella and walking-stick shop, did repairs, and even carved handles, which had won for him an artistic celebrity in the neighbourhood. Denise glanced at the shop window, 
where the umbrellas and sticks were arranged in straight lines. But on raising her eyes she was astonished at the appearance of the house, a hovel squeezed between the ladies' paradise and a large building of the Louis the Fourteenth style, sprung up one hardly knew how, in this narrow space, crushed by its two low stories. Had it not been for the support on each side, it must have fallen. The slates were old and rotten, and the two-windowed front was cracked and covered with stains, which ran down in long rusty lines over the warm-eaten signboard. "'You know he's written to my landlord, offering to buy the house,' said Bourras, looking steadily at a draper with his fiery eyes. Baudu became paler still, and bent his shoulders. There was a silence, during which the two men remained face to face looking very serious. "'Must be prepared for anything now,' murmured Baudu at last. Bouras then got angry, shaking his hair and flowing beard. "'Let him buy the house. He'll have to pay four times the value for it. But I swear that as long as I live he shall not touch a stone of it. My lease is twelve years to run yet. We shall see. We shall see!' It was a declaration of war. Bouras looked towards the ladies' paradise, which neither had directly named. Baudu shook his head in silence, and then crossed the street to his shop, his legs almost failing under him. "'Ah! Oh, good Lord! Ah! Oh, good Lord!' he kept repeating. Denise, who had heard all, followed her uncle. Madame Baudu had just come back with Pepe, whom Madame Grasse had agreed to receive at any time. But Sean had disappeared, and this made his sister anxious. When he returned with a flushed face, talking in an animated way of the boulevards, she looked at him with such a sad expression that he blushed with shame. The box had arrived, and it was arranged that they should sleep in the attic. "'How did you get on at Vincard's?' asked Madame Baudu suddenly. The draper related his useless errand, adding that Denise had heard of a situation, and, pointing to the lady's paradise with a scornful gesture, he cried out, "'There!' in there the whole family felt wounded at their idea the first dinner was at five o'clock the niece and the two children took their places with baudu genevieve and columban a single jet of gas lighted and warmed the little dining-room reeking with the smell of hot food the meal passed off in silence but at dessert madame baudu who could not rest anywhere left the shop and came and sat down near denise and then the storm kept back all day, broke out, every one feeling a certain relief in abusing the monster. "'It is your business. You can do as you like,' repeated Baudu. "'We don't want to influence you, but if you only knew what sort of place it is!' And then he commenced to relate, in broken sentences, the history of this Octave Moray. Wonderful luck! A fellow who had come up from the south of France with the amiable audacity of an adventurer— no sooner arrived than he commenced to distinguish himself by all sorts of disgraceful pranks with the ladies, had figured in an affair, which was still the talk of the neighbourhood, and to crown all, had suddenly and mysteriously made the conquest of Madame Hedouin, who brought him the ladies' paradise as a marriage portion. "'Poor Caroline!' interrupted Madame Baudu. "'We were distantly related. If she had lived, things would be different. She wouldn't have let them ruin us like this.' and he's the man who killed her. Yes, that very building. One morning, when visiting the work, she fell down a hole, and three days after she died. A fine, strong, healthy woman, who had never known what illness was. There is some of her blood in the foundation of that house. She pointed to the establishment opposite with her pale and trembling hand. Denise, listening as to a fairy tale, slightly shuddered. The sense of fear which had mingled with the temptation she had felt since the morning was caused perhaps by the presence of this woman's blood, which she fancied she could see in the red mortar of the basement. "'It seems as if it brought him good luck,' added Madame Baudu, without mentioning Moray by name. But the draper shrugged his shoulders, disdaining these old women's tales, and resumed his story, explaining the situation commercially. The Lady's Paradise was founded in 1822 by two brothers named Deleuze, on the death of the elder, his daughter, Caroline, married the son of a linen manufacturer, Charles Hedouin, and, later on, becoming a widow, she married Moret. She thus brought him a half share of the business. Three months after the marriage, 
the second brother Deleuze died childless, so that when Caroline met her death, Moret became sole heir, sole proprietor of the Ladies' Paradise. Wonderful luck! A sharp fellow, a dangerous busybody, who will overthrow the whole neighbourhood if allowed to, continued Baudu. I fancy that Caroline, a rather romantic woman, must have been carried away by the gentleman's extravagant ideas. In short, he persuaded her to buy the house on the left, then the one on the right, and he himself, on becoming his own master, bought two others, so that the establishment has continued to grow, extending in such a way that it now threatens to swallow us all up. He was addressing Denise, but was really speaking more to himself, feeling a feverish longing to go over this history which haunted him continually. At home he was always angry, always violent, clenching his fists as if longing to go for somebody. Madame Baudu ceased to interfere, sitting motionless on her chair. Genevieve and Columban, their eyes cast down, were picking up and eating the crumbs off the table, just for the sake of something to do. It was so warm, so stuffy in the small room, that Pepe was sleeping with his head on the table, and even Sean's eyes were closing. "'Wait a bit,' resumed Baudu, seized with a sudden fit of anger. "'Such joke is always goes to smash. Mouret is hard-pushed just now. I know that for a fact. He's been forced to spend all his savings on his mania for extensions and advertisements. Moreover, in order to raise money, he has induced most of his shop people to invest all they possess with him, so that he hasn't a sou to help himself with now. And, unless a miracle be worked and he treble his sales, as he hopes to do, you'll see what a crash they'll be. Ah!' I am not ill-natured, but that day I'll illuminate my shop-front, on my word of honour. And he went on in a revengeful voice. One would have thought that the fall of the ladies' paradise was to restore the dignity and prestige of compromised business. Had anyone ever seen such a thing? A draper's shop selling everything? Why not call it a bazaar at once? And the employees? A nice set there were, too. A lot of puppies, who did their work like porters at a railway station, treating goods and customers like so many parcels, leaving the shop or getting the sack at a moment's notice. No affection, no manners, no taste. And all at once he quoted Columban as an example of a good tradesman, brought up in the old school, knowing how long it took to learn all the cunning and tricks of the trade. The art was not to sell a large quantity, but to sell dare. Columban could say how he had been treated, carefully looked after, his washing and mending done, nursed in illness, considered as one of the family, loved, in fact. "'Of course,' repeated Columban, after every statement the governor made. "'Ah, you're the last of the old stock,' Baudu ended by declaring. "'After you're gone, there'll be none left. You are my sole consolation, for if they call all these sort of thing business I give up, I would rather clear out.' Genevieve, her head on one side, as if her thick hair were too heavy for her pale forehead, was watching the smiling shopman, and in her look there was a suspicion, a wish to see whether Columban, stricken with remorse, would not blush at all this praise. But, like a fellow up to every trick of the old trade, he preserved his quiet manner, his good-natured and cunning look. However, Baudu still went on, louder than ever, condemning the people opposite, calling them a pack of savages, murdering each other in their struggle for existence, destroying all family ties and he mentioned some country neighbours, the Lombs, mother, father, and a son, all employed in the infernal shop, people without any home life, always out, leading a comfortless, savage existence, never dining at home except on Sunday, feeding all the week at restaurants, hotels, anywhere. Certainly his dining-room wasn't too large, nor too well lighted, but it was part of their home, and the family had grown up affectionately about the domestic hearth. While speaking, his eyes wandered about the room, and he shuddered at the unavowed idea that the savages might one day, if they succeeded in ruining his trade, turn him out of this house, where he was so comfortable with his wife and child. Notwithstanding the assurance with which he predicted the utter downfall of his rivals, he was really terrified, feeling that the neighbourhood was being gradually invaded and devoured. "'I don't want to disgust you,' resumed he, trying to calm himself. If you think it to your interest to go there, I shall be the first to say, go. I am sure of that, uncle, murmured Denise, bewildered, all this excitement rendering her more and more desirous of entering the lady's paradise. He had put his elbows on the table, and was staring at her so hard that she felt uneasy. 
"'But look here,' resumed he. "'You who know the business, do you think it right that a simple draper's shop should sell everything? Formerly, when trade was trade, drapers sold nothing but drapery. Now they are doing their best to snap up every branch and ruin their neighbours. The whole neighbourhood complains of it, for every small tradesman is beginning to suffer terribly. This Mouret is ruining them. Bedore and his sister, who keep the hoistery shop in the Rue Gaillon, has already lost half their customers. Mademoiselle Tati, at the under-linen warehouse in the Passage Chouiseul, has been obliged to lower her prices, to be able to sell at all. And the effect of this scourge, this pest, are felt as far as the Rue Nouveau de Petit Chance, where I hear that Fanpuil brothers, the furriers, cannot hold up much longer. Drapers selling fur goods, what a farce! Another of Moret's ideas. And gloves, added Madame Baudu. Isn't it monstrous? He has even dared to add a glove department. Yesterday, as I was going along, the Rue Neveu Saint Augustine, I saw Quinette, the glover, at his door, looking so downcast that I hadn't the heart to ask him how business was going. And umbrellas, resumed Baudu. That's the climax. Bourras feels sure that Moret simply wants to ruin him. For, in short, where's the rhyme between umbrellas and drapery? But Bourras is firm on his legs, and won't allow himself to be beggared. We shall see some fun one of these days. He spoke of other tradesmen, passing the whole neighbourhood in review. Now and again he let slip a confession. If Vincar wanted to sell, it was time for the rest to pack up, for Vincar was like the rat to leave a house when it threatens to fall in. Then, immediately after, he contradicted himself alluded to an alliance, an understanding between the small tradesmen in order to fight the colossus. He hesitated an instant before speaking of himself, his hands shaking and his mouth twitching in a nervous manner. At last he made up his mind. "'As for myself, I can't complain as yet. Of course he has done me harm, the scoundrel. But up to the present he only keeps ladies' cloths, light stuffs for dresses and heavier goods for mantles. People still come to me for men's goods.' velvets for shooting suits clots for liveries without speaking of flannels and serges of which i defy him to show as good an assortment but he thinks to annoy me by planting his cloth department right in front of my door you've seen his display haven't you he always places his finest made-up goods there surrounded by a framework of various clots a cheap jack parade to tempt the women upon my word i should be ashamed to use such means the old el bouf has been known for nearly a hundred years and has no need for such at its door. As long as I live, it shall remain as I took it, with a few samples on each side, and nothing more. The whole family was affected. Genevieve ventured to make a remark after a silence. You know, papa, our customers know and like us. We mustn't lose heart. Madame de Forge and Madame de Bouves have been today, and I am expecting Madame Marty for some flannel. I, declared Columban, I took an order from Madame Bourdelais yesterday. It is true she spoke of an English chevillon, marked up opposite ten sous cheaper than ours, and the same stuff, it appears. Fancy, murmured Madame Baudu in her weak voice. We knew that house when it was scarcely larger than a handkerchief. Yes, my dear Denise, when a Deleuze started it, it had only one window in the Rue Neveu Saint Augustine, and such a tiny one in which there was barely room for a couple of pieces of print and two or three pieces of calico. There was no room to turn round in the shop, it was so small. At that time, the old El Bouf, after sixty years' trading, was as you see it now. Ah! All that has greatly changed. She shook her head. The drama of her whole life was expressed in these few words. Born in the old house, she loved every part of it, living only for it and by it, and— Formerly proud of this house, the finest, the best patronised in the neighbourhood, she had had a daily grief of seeing the rival establishment gradually growing in importance, at first disdained, then equal to theirs, and finally towering above it and threatening all the rest. This was for her a continual open sore. She was slowly dying from sheer grief at seeing the old El Bouf humiliated, though still living, as if by the force of impulse, like a machine wound up but she felt that the death of the shop would be hers as well, and that she would never survive the closing of it. There was a painful silence. Baudu was softly beating a tattoo with his fingers on the American cloth on the table. 
he experienced a sort of lassitude, almost a regret at having relieved his feelings once more in this way. In fact, the whole family felt the effects of his despondency, and could not help ruminating on the bitter story. They never had had any luck. The children had been educated and started in the world, fortune was beginning to smile on them, when suddenly this competition sprang up and ruined their hopes. There was, also, the house of Rambouillet, that country house to which she had been dreaming of retiring for the last ten years. A bargain, he thought, but it had turned out to be an old building always wanting repairs, and which he had let to people who never paid any rent. His last profits were swallowed up by the place. The only folly he had committed in his honest, upright career as a tradesman, obstinately attached to the old ways. "'Come, come,' said he, suddenly. "'We must make room for the others. Enough of this useless talk.' It was like an awakening. The gas hissed in the dead and stifling air of the small room. They all jumped up, breaking the melancholy silence. However, Pepe was sleeping so soundly that they laid him on some bales of cloth. Sean had already returned to the street door, yawning. "'In short,' repeated Baudu to his niece, "'you can do as you like. We have explained the matter to you, that's all. You know your own business best.' He looked at her sharply, waiting for a decisive answer. Denise, whom these stories had inspired with a still greater longing to enter the lady's paradise, instead of turning her from it, preserved her quiet gentle demeanour with a Norman obstinacy. She simply replied, "'We shall see, uncle,' and she spoke of going to bed early with the children, for they were all three very tired. But it had only just struck six, so she decided to stay in the shop a little longer. Night had come on, and she found the street quite dark enveloped in a fine close rain, which had been falling since sunset. She was surprised. A few minutes had sufficed to fill the street with small pools, a stream of dirty water was running along the gutters, the pavement was thick with a sticky black mud, and through the beating rain she saw nothing but a confused stream of umbrellas, pushing, swinging along in the gloom like great black wings. She started back at first, feeling very cold, oppressed at heart by the badly lighted shop, very dismal at this hour of the day. A damp breeze, the breath of the old quarter, came in from the street. It seemed that the rain, streaming from the umbrellas, was running right into the shop, that the pavement with its mud and its puddles extended all over the place, putting the finishing touches to the mouldiness of the old shop front, white with saltpetre. It was quite a vision of old Paris, damp and uncomfortable, which made her shiver, astonished and heartbroken to find the great city so cold and so ugly but opposite the gas lamps were being lighted all along the frontage of the ladies paradise she moved nearer again attracted and as it were warmed by this wealth of illumination the machine was still roaring active as ever hissing forth its last clouds of steam whilst the salesmen were folding up the stuffs and the cashiers counting up the receipts it was as seen through the hazy windows a vague swarming of lights, a confused factory-like interior. Behind the curtain of falling rain, this apparition, distant and confused, assumed the appearance of a giant furnace-house, where the black shadows of the firemen could be seen passing by the red glare of the furnaces. The displays in the windows became indistinct also. One could only distinguish the snowy lace, heightened in its whiteness, by the ground-glass globes of a row of gas-jets, and against this chapel-like background the ready-made goods stood out vigorously. The velvet mantle trimmed with silver fox threw into relief the curved profile of a headless woman running through the rain to some entertainment in the unknown of the shade of the Paris night. Denise, yielding to the seduction, had gone to the door, heedless of the raindrops falling on her. At this hour the lady's paradise, with its furnace-like brilliancy, entirely conquered her. In the great metropolis, black and silent, beneath the rain, in this Paris, to which she was a stranger, it shone out like a lighthouse, and seemed to be of itself the life and light of the city. She dreamed of her future there, working hard to bring up the children, and of other things besides, she hardly knew what, far-off things, the desire and the fear of which made her tremble. The idea of this woman who had met her death amidst the foundations came back to her. She felt afraid, she thought she saw the lights bleeding. Then, the whiteness of the lace quieting her, a vague hope sprang up in her heart, quite a certainty of happiness, whilst the fine rain blowing on her, 
cooled her hands, and calmed her after the excitement of a journey. "'It's Boras,' said a voice behind her. She leant forward, and perceived the umbrella-maker, motionless before the window containing the ingenious display of umbrellas and walking-sticks. The old man had slipped up there in the dark, to feast his eyes on the triumphant show, and so great was his grief that he was unconscious of the rain which was beating on his bare head, and trickling off his white hair. "'How stupid he is! He'll make himself ill!' resumed the voice. Turning round, Denise found the Baudus behind her again. Though they thought Bourras so stupid, they were obliged, against their will, to return to this spectacle which was breaking their hearts. Genevieve, very pale, had noticed that Columban was watching the shadows of the saleswoman pass to and fro on the first floor opposite, and, whilst Baudu was choking with suppressed rancour, Madame Baudu was silently weeping. "'You'll go and see to-morrow, won't you, Denise?' asked the draper, tormented with uncertainty, but feeling that his niece was conquered like the rest. She hesitated, then gently replied, "'Yes, uncle, unless it pains you too much.' End of chapter 1, part 2The next morning, at half-past seven, Denise was outside the Ladies' Paradise, wishing to call there before taking Jean to his new place, which was a long way off, at the top of the Fabord de Temple. But, accustomed to early hours, she had arrived too soon. The shop was hardly opened, and, afraid of looking ridiculous, full of timidity, she walked up and down the Place Gaillon for a moment. The cold wind that blew had already dried the pavement. Shopmen were hurrying, turning out of every street in the neighbourhood, their coat collars turned up, and their hands in their pockets, taken unawares by this first chill of winter. Most of them hurried along alone, and disappeared in the depths of the warehouse, without addressing a word or look to their colleagues marching along by their side. Others were walking in twos and threes, talking fast, and taking up the whole of the pavement, while they all threw away with a similar gesture their cigarette or cigar before crossing the threshold. Denise noticed that several of these gentlemen took stock of her in passing. This increased her timidity. She felt quite unable to follow them, and resolved to wait till they had all entered before going in, blushing at the idea of being elbowed at a door by all these men. But the stream continued, so to escape their look, she took a walk round. When she returned to the principal entrance, she found a tall young man, pale and awkward, who appeared to be waiting as she was. "'I beg your pardon, mademoiselle,' he finished by stammering out. "'But perhaps you belong to the establishment?' She was so troubled at hearing a stranger address her in this way that she did not reply at first. "'The fact is,' he continued, getting more confused than ever, "'I thought of asking them to engage me, and you might have given me a little information.' He was as timid as she was, and had probably risked speaking to her because she felt she was trembling like himself. "'I would with pleasure, sir,' replied she at last. "'But I'm no better off than you are. I'm just going to apply myself.' "'Ah, very good,' said he, quite out of countenance. And they blushed violently, their two timidities remaining face to face for a moment, affected by the similarity of their positions, not daring, however, to wish each other success openly. Then, as they said nothing further, and became more and more uncomfortable, they separated awkwardly, and recommenced their waiting, one on either side, a few steps apart. The shopmen continued to arrive, and Denise could now hear them joking as they passed, casting side glances towards her. Her confusion increased at finding herself exposed to this unpleasant ordeal, and she had decided to take half an hour's walk in the neighbourhood, when the sight of a young man coming rapidly through the Rue Porte Mahon detained her for a moment. He was evidently the manager of a department, she thought, for the others raised their hats to him. He was tall, with a clear skin and carefully trimmed beard, and he had eyes the colour of old gold, of a velvety softness, which he fixed on her for a moment as he crossed the street. 
He already entered the shop, indifferent that she remained motionless, quite upset by his look, filled with a singular emotion, in which there was more uneasiness than pleasure. She began to feel really afraid, and, to give herself time to collect her courage somewhat, she walked slowly down the Rue Gaillon, and then along the Rue saint roche It was better than the manager of a department. It was Octave Moray in person. He had not been to bed, for after having spent the evening at a stockbroker's, he had gone to supper with a friend and two women, picked up behind the scenes of a small theatre. His tightly buttoned overcoat concealed a dress suit and white tie. He quickly ran upstairs, performed his toilet, changed, and entered his office, quite ready for work, with beaming eyes and complexion as fresh as if he had had ten hours' sleep. The spacious office, furnished in old oak and hung with green rep, had for sole ornament the portrait of that Madame Hedouin, who was still the talk of the neighbourhood. Since her death, Octave thought of her with a tender regret, showing himself grateful to the memory of her, who, by marrying him, had made his fortune and before commencing to sign the drafts laid on his desk, he bestowed the contented smile of a happy man on the portrait. Was it not always before her that he returned to work, after his young widower's escapades, every time he issued from the alcoves, where his craving for amusement attracted him? There was a knock, and without waiting a young man entered, a tall thin fellow, with thin lips and a sharp nose, very gentlemanly and correct in his appearance with his smooth hair already showing signs of turning grey. Moret raised his eyes, then continued to sign, said, "'I hope you slept well, Bourdoncle.' "'Very well, thanks,' replied the young man, walking about as if quite at home. Bourdoncle, the son of a poor farmer near Limoges, had started the Ladies' Paradise at the same time as Moret, when it only occupied the corner of the Place Gaillon. Very intelligent, very active, it seemed as if he ought to have easily supplanted his comrade, who was not so steady, and who had, besides various other faults, a careless manner and too many intrigues with women. But he lacked that touch of genius possessed by the impassioned southerner, and had not his audacity, his winning grace. Besides, by a wise instinct he had always, from the first, bowed before him, obedient and without a struggle and when Moret advised his people to put all their money into their business, Bourdoncle was one of the first to respond, even investing the proceeds of an unexpected legacy left him by an aunt, and little by little, after passing through the various grades, salesman, second, and then first hand in the silk department, he had become one of the governor's most cherished and influential lieutenants, one of the six persons who assisted Moret to govern the ladies' paradise something like a privy council under an absolute king. Each one watched over a department. Bourdoncle exercised a general control. "'And you?' resumed he, familiarly. "'Have you slept well?' When Moret replied he had not been to bed, he shook his head, murmuring, "'Bad habits.' "'Why?' replied the other one gaily. "'I'm not so tired as you are, my dear fellow. You are half asleep now. You lead too quiet a life.' Take a little amusement. That'll wake you up a bit. This was their constant friendly dispute. Bourdoncle had, at the commencement, beaten his mistress, because, said he, they prevented him sleeping. Now he professed to hate women, having, no doubt, chance love affairs of which he said nothing, so small was the place they occupied in his life. He contented himself with encouraging the extravagance of his lady customers, feeling the greatest disdain for their frivolity, which led them to ruin themselves in stupid gee-jaws. Mouret, on the contrary, attempted to worship them, remained before them delighted and cajoling, continually carried away by fresh love affairs, and this served as an advertisement for his business. One would have said that he enveloped all the women in the same caress, the better to bewilder them and keep them at his mercy. "'I saw Madame de Fauche last night,' said he. "'She was looking delicious at the ball.' "'But it wasn't with her that you went to supper, was it?' asked the other. Moret protested. "'Oh, no. She is very virtuous, my dear fellow. I went to supper with little Heloise, of the folly. Stupid as a donkey, but so comical.' He took another bundle of drafts and went on signing. Bourdoncle continued to walk about. He went and took a look through the lofty plate-glass windows into the Rue Nevo saint augustine then returned, saying— you know they'll have their revenge. 
Who? said Moret, who had lost the thread of the conversation. Why, the women. At this, Moret became Maria still, displaying, beneath his sensual, adorative manner, his really brutal character. With a shrug of the shoulders he seemed to declare he would throw them all over, like so many empty sacks, when they had finished helping him to make his fortune. Bourdoncle obstinately repeated, in his cold way, they will have their revenge. There will be one who will avenge all the others. It's bound to be. No fair, cried Moret, exaggerating his southern accent. That one isn't born yet, my boy. And if she comes, you know... He had raised his penholder, brandishing it and pointing it in the air, as if he would have liked to stab some invisible heart with a knife. Bourdoncle resumed walking, bowing as usual before the superiority of the governor, whose genius, though faulty, had always got the better of him. He, so clear-headed, logical and passionless, incapable of falling, had yet to learn the feminine character of success, Paris yielding herself with a kiss to the boldest. A silence reigned, broken only by Moret's pen. Then, in reply to his brief question, Bourdoncle gave him the particulars of the great sale of winter novelties, which was to commence the following Monday. This was an important affair, and the house was risking its fortune in it, for the rumour had some foundation. Moret was throwing himself into speculation like a poet, with such ostentation, such a determination to attain the colossal, that everything seemed bound to give way under him. It was quite a new style of doing business, an apparent commercial recklessness, which had formerly made Madame Hedouine anxious, and which even now, notwithstanding the first successes, quite dismayed those who had capital in the business. They blamed the governor in secret for going too quick, accused him of having enlarged the establishment to a dangerous extent, before making sure of a sufficient increase of custom. Above all, they trembled on seeing him put all the capital into the venture, filling the place with a pile of goods without leaving a sou in the reserve fund. Thus, for this sale, after the heavy sums paid to the builders, the whole capital was out, and it was once more a question of victory or death. And he, in the midst of all this excitement, preserved a triumphant gaiety, a certainty of gaining millions, like a man worshipped by the women, and who cannot be betrayed. When Bourdoncle ventured to express certain fears with reference to the too great development given to several not very productive departments, he broke out into a laugh full of confidence, and exclaimed, "'No fear, my dear fellow! The place is too small!' The other appeared dumbfounded, seized with a fear he no longer attempted to conceal. The house too small. A draper's shop having nineteen departments, and four hundred and three employees. Of course, resumed Moret, we shall be obliged to enlarge our premises before another eighteen months. I am seriously thinking about a matter. Last night, Madame de Forge promised to introduce me to someone. In short, we'll talk it over when the idea is ripe and having signed his drafts, he got up, and tapped his lieutenant on the shoulder in a friendly manner. But the latter could not get over his astonishment. The fright felt by the prudent people around him amused Moret. In one of his fits of brisk frankness, with which he sometimes overwhelmed his familiars, he declared he was at heart a bigger Jew than all the Jews in the world. He took after his father, whom he resembled physically and morally, a fellow who knew the value of money and, if his mother had given him that particle of nervous fantasy, why it was, perhaps, the principal element of his luck, for he felt the invincible force of his daring, reckless grace. "'You know very well that we stand by you to the last,' Bourdoncle finished by saying. Before going down into the various departments, to give their usual look round, they settled certain other details. They examined the specimen of a little book of account forms, which Moray had just invented for use at the counters. Having remarked that the old-fashioned goods, the dead stock, went off all the more rapidly when the commission given to the employees was high, he had based on this observation a new system. In future he intended to interest his people in the sale of all goods, giving them a commission on the smallest piece of stuff, the slightest article sold, a system which had caused a revolution in the drapery trade, creating between the salespeople a struggle for existence, of which the proprietor reaped the benefit. This struggle formed his favourite method, the principle of organisation he constantly applied. He excited his employees' passions, pitted one against the other, allowed the strongest to swallow up the weakest, fattening on this interested struggle. The specimen book was approved of, 
at the top of the two forms, the one retained and the other torn off, were the particulars of the department and the salesman number. Then there were columns on both of the measurement, description of the article sold, and the price. The salesman simply signed the bill before handing it to the cashier. In this way an easy account was kept. It sufficed to compare the bills delivered by the cashier's department to the clearing-house with the salesman's counterfoils. Every week the latter would receive their commission, and that without the least possibility of an error. "'We shan't be robbed so much,' remarked Bordoncle with satisfaction. "'A very good idea of yours.' "'And I thought of something else last night,' explained Moret. "'Yes, my dear fellow, at supper. I should like to give the clearing-house clerks a trifle for every error found in checking. You can understand that we shall then be certain they won't pass any, for they would rather invent some.' He began to laugh, whilst the other looked at him in admiration. This new application of the struggle for existence delighted Moret. He had a real genius for administrative business, and dreamed of organising the house so as to play upon the selfish instincts of his employees, for the complete and quiet satisfaction of his own appetites. He often said that to make people do their best, and even to keep them fairly honest, it was necessary to excite their selfish desires first. "'Well, let's go downstairs,' resumed Moret. "'We must look after this sale. "'The silk arrived yesterday, I believe, "'and Boutemont must be getting it in now.' Bourdoncle followed him. "'The receiving office was on the pavement floor "'in the Rue Neuve Saint-Augustine. "'There, on a level with the pavement, "'was a kind of glazed cage, "'where the vans discharged the goods. "'They were weighed, and then slipped down a rapid slide, "'its oak and ironwork shining, "'brightened by the chafing of goods and cases.' Everything entered by this yawning trap. It was a continual swallowing up, a fall of goods, causing a roaring like that of a cataract. At the approach of big sale times especially, the slide carried down a perpetual stream of Lyon silk, English woollens, Flemish linens, Alsatian calicoes, and ruined printed goods, and the vans were sometimes obliged to wait their turn along the street. The bales running down produced a peculiar noise made by a stone thrown into deep water. Moret stopped a moment before the slide, which was in full activity. Rows of cases were going down of themselves, falling like rain from some upper stream. Then some huge bales appeared, toppling over in their descent like so many pebbles. Moret looked on, without saying a word. But this wealth of goods, rushing in at the rate of thousands of francs a minute, made his eyes glisten. He had never before had such a clear, definite idea of the struggle he was engaged in. Here was this mountain of goods that he had to launch to the four corners of Paris. He did not open his mouth, continuing his inspection. By the grey light penetrating the air-holes, a squad of men were receiving the goods, whilst others were undoing and opening the cases and bales in presence of the managers of different departments. A dockyard agitation filled this cellar, this basement, where wrought iron pillars supported the arches, and the bare walls of which were cemented. "'Have you got all there, Boutemont? asked Moret, going up to a broad-shouldered young fellow who was checking the contents of a case. "'Yes, everything seems all right,' replied he. "'But the counting will take me all the morning.' The manager was glancing at the invoice every now and then, standing up before a large counter on which one of his salesmen was laying, one by one, the pieces of silk he was taking from the case. Behind them ran other counters also encumbered with goods that a small army of shopmen were examining. It was a general unpacking, an apparent confusion of stuffs, examined, turned over and marked, amidst a buzz of voices. Boutemont, a celebrity in the trade, had a round jolly face, a cold black beard, and fine hazel eyes. Born at Montpellier, noisy, too fond of company, he was not much good for the sales, but for buying he had not his equal. Sent to Paris by his father, who kept a draper's shop in his native town, he had absolutely refused to return when the old fellow thought he ought to know enough to succeed him in his business, and from that moment a rivalry sprung up between father and son, the former, all for his little country business, shocked to see a simple shopman earning three times as much as he did himself, the latter joking at the old man's routine, clinking his money, and throwing the whole house into confusion at every flying visit he paid. Like the other managers, Boutemont drew, besides his three thousand francs regular pay, a commission on the sales. Montpellier, 
surprised and respectful, whispered that young Boutemont had made fifteen thousand francs the year before, and that that was only a beginning. People prophesied to the exasperated father that this figure would certainly increase. Bourdoncle had taken up one of the pieces of silk, and was examining the grain with the eye of a connoisseur. It was a faille with a blue and silver selvage, the famous Paris paradise, with which Moray hoped to strike a decisive blow. "'It is really very good,' observed Bourdoncle. "'And the effect it produces is better than its real quality,' said Boutemont. Dumontel is the only one capable of manufacturing such stuff. Last journey, when I fell out with Gorgon, the latter was willing to set a hundred looms to work on this pattern, but he asked five sous a yard more. Nearly every month, Boutemont went to Lyon, staying there days together, living at the best hotels, with orders to treat the manufacturers with open purse. He enjoyed, moreover, a perfect liberty, and bought what he liked, provided that he increased the yearly business of his department in a certain proportion, settled beforehand, and it was on this proportion that his commission was based. In short, his position at the Ladies' Paradise, like that of all the managers, was that of a special tradesman, in a grouping of various businesses, a sort of vast trading city. So, resumed he, it's decided we market five francs twelve sous. It's barely the cost price, you know. Yes, yes, five francs twelve sous, said Mouret, quickly, and if I were alone, I'd sell it at a loss. The manager laughed heartily. Oh, I don't mind. That will just suit me. It will treble the sale, and as my only interest is to attain heavy receipts. But Bordoncle remained very grave, biting his lips. He drew his commission on the total profits, and it did not suit him to lower the prices. Part of his business was to exercise a control over the prices fixed upon, to prevent Boutemont selling at too small a profit in order to increase the sales. Moreover, his former anxiety reappeared in the presence of these advertising combinations, which he did not understand. He ventured to show his repugnance by saying, "'If we sell it at five francs twelve sous, it will be like selling it at a loss, as we must allow for our expenses, which are considerable. It would fetch seven francs anywhere.' At this Mouret got angry. He struck the silk with his open hand, crying out excitedly, "'I know that! That's why I want to give it to our customers. Really, my dear fellow, you'll never understand women's ways. Don't you see they'll be crazy after this silk? No doubt, interrupted the other, obstinately, and the more they buy, the more we shall lose. We shall lose a few sous on the stuff, very likely. What matters if in return we attract all the women here, and keep them at our mercy, excited by the sight of our goods, emptying their purses without thinking? The principal thing, my dear fellow, is to inflame them, and for that you must have one article which flatters them, which causes a sensation. Afterwards you can sell the other articles as dear as anywhere else. They'll still think yours is the cheapest. For instance, our golden grain, that taffeta at seven francs and a half, sold everywhere at that price, will go down as an extraordinary bargain, and suffice to make up for the loss of the Paris paradise. You'll see, you'll see. He became quite eloquent. Don't you understand? In a week's time from today, I want the Paris paradise to make a revolution in the market. It's our master stroke, which will save us and get our name up. Nothing else will be talked of. The blue and silver selvage will be known from one end of France to the other, and you'll hear the furious complaints of our competitors. The small traders will lose another wing by it. They'll be done for, all those rheumatic old brokers shivering in their cellars. The shopmen checking the goods round about were listening and smiling. He liked to talk in this way without contradiction. Bourdoncle yielded once more. However, the case was empty. Two men were opening another. "'It's the manufacturers who are not exactly pleased,' said Boutemont. "'At Lyon they are all furious with you. They pretend that your cheap trading is ruining them. You are aware that Gorgon has positively declared war against me? Yes, he has sworn to give the little houses longer credit, rather than accept my prices.' Moret shrugged his shoulders. "'If Gachon doesn't look sharp,' replied he, "'Gachon will be floored. What do they complain of? We pay ready money, and we take all they can make. It's strange if they can't work cheaper at that rate. Besides, the public gets the benefit, and that's everything.' The shopman was emptying the second case, whilst Boutemont was checking the pieces by the invoice. Another shopman, 
at the end of the counter, was marking them in plain figures, and the checking finished, the invoice, signed by the manager, had to be sent to the chief cashier's office. Moret continued looking at this work for a moment, at all this activity round this unpacking of goods, which threatened to drown the basement. Then, without adding a word, with the air of a captain satisfied with his troops, he went away, followed by Bordoncle. They slowly crossed the basement floor. The air-holes placed at intervals admitted a pale light, while in the dark corners and along the narrow corridors gas was constantly burning. In these corridors were situated the reserves, large vaults closed with iron railings, containing the surplus goods of each department. Mouret glanced in passing at the heating apparatus, to be lighted on the Monday for the first time, and at the post of firemen guarding a giant gas-meter enclosed in an iron cage. The kitchen and dining-rooms, old cellars turned into habitable apartments, were on the left at the corner of the Place Gaillon. At last he arrived at the delivery department, right at the other end of the basement floor. The parcels not taken away by the customers were sent down there, sorted on tables, placed in compartments each representing a district of Paris, then sent up by a large staircase opening just opposite the old El Bouffe, to the vans standing alongside the pavement. In the mechanical working of the Ladies' Paradise, this staircase in the Rue de la Michaudière disgorged without ceasing the goods swallowed up by the slide in the Rue Nouveau saint augustine after they had passed through the mechanism of the counters up above. "'Campion,' said Mouret to the delivery manager, a retired sergeant with a thin face. "'Why weren't six pairs of sheets, bought by a lady yesterday about two o'clock, delivered in the evening?' "'Where does the lady live?' asked the employee. "'In the Rue de Rivoli, at the corner of the Rue d'Alger, Madame de Fauche. At this early hour the sorting-tables were bare, the compartment only contained a few parcels left overnight. Whilst Campion was searching amongst these packages, after having consulted a list, Bourdoncle was looking at Moret, thinking that this wonderful fellow knew everything, thought of everything, even when at the supper-tables of restaurants or in the alcoves of his mistresses. At last Campion discovered the error. The cashier's department had given a wrong number, and the parcel had come back. "'What is the number of the pay-desk that debited that?' asked Moret. "'Number ten, you say?' And turning towards his lieutenant, he added, "'Number ten, that's Albert, isn't it? We'll just say two words to him.' But before starting on their tour round the shops, he wanted to go up to the postal order department, which occupied several rooms on the second floor. It was there that all the provincial and foreign orders arrived, and he went up every morning to see the correspondence. For two years this correspondence had been increasing daily. At first occupying only about ten clerks, it now required more than thirty. Some opened the letters, others read them, seated at both sides of the same table. Others again classed them, giving each one a running number, which was repeated on the pigeonhole. Then, when the letters had been distributed to the different departments, and the latter had delivered the articles, these articles were put in the pigeonholes as they arrived, according to the running numbers. There was then nothing to do but to check and tie them up, which was done in a neighbouring room by a squad of workmen, who were nailing and tying up from morning to night. Moret put his usual question. "'How many letters this morning, Le Five hundred and thirty-five, sir,' replied the chief clerk. After the commencement of Monday's tale, I'm afraid we shan't have enough hands. Yesterday we were driven very hard. Bourdoncle expressed his satisfaction with a nod of the head. He had not reckoned on five hundred and thirty-four letters on a Tuesday. Round the table, the clerks continued opening and reading the letters amidst the noise of rustling paper, whilst the going and coming of the various articles commenced before the pigeonholes. It was one of the most complicated and important departments of the establishment, one in which there was a continual rush, for, strictly speaking, all the orders received in the morning ought to be sent off the same evening. "'You shall have more hands if you want them,' replied Moret, who had seen at a glance that the work was well done. "'You know that when there's work to be done we never refuse the men.' Up above, under the roof, were the small bedrooms for the saleswomen. But he went downstairs again and entered the chief cashier's office, which was near his own. It was a room with a glazed wicket, and containing an enormous safe, fixed in the wall. Two cashiers there centralized the receipts which Lom, the chief cashier at the counters, brought in every evening. They also settled the current expenses, paid the manufacturers, the staff, 
all the crowd of people who live by the house. The cashier's office communicated with another, full of green cardboard boxes, where ten clerks checked the invoices. Then came another office, the clearing house, six young men bending over black desks, having behind them quite a collection of registers, were getting up the discount accounts of the salesmen, by checking the debit notes. This work, which was new to them, did not get on very well. Moret and Bourdoncle had crossed the cashier's office and the invoice room. When they passed through the other office, the young men, who were laughing and joking, started up in surprise. Moret, without reprimanding them, explained the system of the little bonus he thought of giving them for each error discovered in the debit notes, and when he went out the clerks left off laughing, as if they had been whipped, and commenced working in earnest, looking up the errors. On the ground floor, occupied by the shops, Mouret went straight to the pay-desk number 10, where Albert Lhomme was cleaning his nails, waiting for customers. People regularly spoke of the Lhomme dynasty, since Madame Aurélie, first hand at the dress department, after having helped her husband on to the post of chief cashier, had managed to get a pay-desk for her son, a tall fellow, pale and vicious, who couldn't stop anywhere, and who caused her an immense deal of anxiety. But on reaching the young man, Moret kept in the background, not wishing to render himself unpopular by performing a policeman's duty, and retaining from policy and taste his part of amiable guard. He nudged Bourdoncle gently with his elbow. Bourdoncle, the infallible man, that muddle of exactitude, whom he generally charged with the work of reprimanding. Monsieur Albert, said the latter, severely, you have taken another address wrong. The parcel has come back. It's unbearable. The cashier, thinking it his duty to defend himself, called as a witness the messenger who had tied up the packet. This messenger, named Joseph, also belonging to the Lom dynasty, for he was Albert's foster brother, and owed his place to Madame Aurélie's influence. As the young man wanted to make him say it was the customer's mistake, Joseph stuttered, twisted the shaggy beard that ornamented his scarred face, struggling between his old soldier's conscience and gratitude towards his protectors. "'Let Joseph alone,' Bourdoncle exclaimed at last. "'And don't say any more. Ah, it's a lucky thing for you that we are mindful of your mother's good services.' But at this moment Lom came running up. From his office near the door he could see his son's pay-desk, which was in the glove department. Quite white-haired already, deadened by his sedentary life, he had a flabby, colourless face, as if worn out by the reflection of the money he was continually handling. His amputated arm did not at all incommode him in this work, and it was quite a curiosity to see him verify the receipts, so rapidly did the notes and coins slip through his left one, the only one he had. Son of a tax collector at Chablis, he had come to Paris as a clerk in the office of a merchant of the Pont aux Vents. Then, whilst lodging in the Rue Cuvière, he married the daughter of his doorkeeper, a small tailor, an Alsatian, and from that day he had bowed submissively before his wife. His commercial ability filled him with respect. She earned more than twelve thousand francs a year in the dress department, whilst he only drew a fixed salary of five thousand francs. And the deference he felt for a woman bringing such sums into the home was extended to the son, who also belonged to her. "'What is the matter?' murmured he. "'Is Albert in fault?' Then, according to his custom, Moret appeared on the scene, to play the part of a good-natured prince. When Bourdoncle had made himself fed, he looked after his own popularity. "'Nothing of consequence,' murmured he. "'My dear Lum, your son Albert is a careless fellow, who should take an example from you.' Then, changing the subject, showing himself more amiable than ever, he continued. "'And that concert the other day, did you get a good seat?' A blush overspread the white cheeks of the old cashier. Music was his only vice, a vice which he indulged in solitarily, frequenting the theatres, the concerts, the rehearsals. Notwithstanding the loss of his arm, he played on the French horn, thanks to an ingenious system of keys. And as Madame Lhomme detested noise, he wrapped up his instrument in cloth in the evening, delighted all the same, in the highest degree, with the strangely dull sounds he drew from it. In the forced irregularity of their domestic life, he had made himself an oasis of this music. That and the cash-box, he knew of nothing else, beyond the admiration he felt for his wife. "'A very good seat,' replied he with sparkling eyes. "'You are really too kind, sir.' Moret, 
who enjoyed a personal pleasure in satisfying other people's passions, sometimes gave Lom the tickets forced on him by the lady patronesses of such entertainments, and he completed the old man's delight by saying, "'Ah, Beethoven! Ah, Mozart! What music!' And without waiting for a reply, he went off, rejoining Bourdoncle, already on his tour of inspection through the departments. End of chapter 2, part 1Section 4 of The Ladies' Paradise by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter 2, Part 2. In the central hall, an inner courtyard with a glass roof formed the silk department. Both went along the Rue Nouveau Saint Augustine, occupied by the linen department, from one end to the other nothing unusual striking them, they passed on through the crowd of respectful assistants. They then turned into the cotton and hosiery departments, where the same order reigned. But in the department devoted to woollens, occupying the gallery which ran through the Rue de la Michaudière, Bourdoncle resumed the character of executioner, on observing a young man, seated on the counter, looking knocked up after a night passed without sleep. And this young man, named Leonard, son of a rich angus draper bowed his head beneath the reprimand fearing nothing in his idle careless life of pleasure except to be recalled by his father the reprimands now began to shower down and the gallery of the rue de la michaudière received the full force of the storm in the drapery department a salesman a fresh hand who slept in the house had come in after eleven o'clock in the haberdashery department the second counterman had just allowed himself to be caught downstairs smoking a cigarette. But the tempest burst with especial violence in the glove department, on the head of one of the rare Parisians in the house, handsome Mignon, as they called him, the illegitimate son of a music mistress. His crime was having caused a scandal in the dining room by complaining of the food. As there were three tables, one at half past nine, one at half past ten, and another at half past eleven, he wished to explain that belonging to the third table, he always had the leavings, the worst of everything. "'What? The food not good?' asked Moret, naively, opening his mouth at last. He only gave the head cook, a terrible overnat, a franc and a half a head per day, out of which this man still managed to make a good profit, and the food was really execrable. But Bourdoncle shrugged his shoulders. A cook who had four hundred luncheons and four hundred dinners to serve, even in three series, had no time to waste on the refinements of his art. "'Never mind,' said the governor good-naturedly. "'I wish all our employees to have good, abundant food. I'll speak to the cook.' And Mignon's complaint was shelled. Then returning to their point of departure, standing up near the door, amidst the umbrellas and neckties, Mouret and Bourdoncle received the report of one of the four inspectors, charged with the superintendents of the establishment. Old Jove, a retired captain, decorated at Constantine, a fine-looking man still, with his big sensual nose and majestic boldness, having drawn their attention to a salesman, who, in reply to a simple remonstrance on his part, had called him an old humbug. The salesman was immediately discharged. However, the shop was still without customers, except a few housewives of the neighbourhood, who were going through the almost deserted galleries. At the door the timekeeper had just closed his book, and was making out a separate list of the latecomers. The salesmen were taking possession of their departments, which had been swept and brushed by the messengers before their arrival. Each young man hung up his hat and great coat as he arrived, stifling a yawn, still half asleep. Some exchanged a few words, gazed about the shop, and seemed to be pulling themselves together ready for another day's work. Others were leisurely removing the green base in which they had covered the goods overnight, having folded them up, and the piles of stuff appeared symmetrically arranged. The whole shop was in a clean and orderly state, brilliant in the morning gaiety, waiting for the rush of business to come and obstruct it, and, as it were, narrowing it by the unpacking and display of linen, cloth, silk, and lace. In the bright light of the central hall, two young men were talking in a low voice at the silk counter. One, short and charming, well set, 
and with a pink skin, was endeavouring to blend the colours of some silks for indoor show. His name was Hutin, his father kept a café at Uveton, and he had managed after eighteen months' service to become one of the principal salesmen, thanks to a natural flexibility of character, a continual flow of caressing flattery, under which was concealed a furious rage for business, grasping everything, devouring everybody, even without hunger, just for the pleasure of the thing. "'Look here, Favier, I should have struck him if I had been in your place. On a bright!' said he to the other, a tall, bilious fellow with a dry and yellow skin, who was born at Besancon of a family of weavers, and who, without the least grace, concealed under a cold exterior a disquieting will. "'It does no good to strike people,' murmured he, phlegmatically. "'Better wait.' They were both speaking of Robineau, who was looking after the shopman during the manager's absence downstairs. Houtin was secretly undermining Robineau, whose place he coveted. He had already, to wound him and make him leave, introduced Boutemont to fill the vacancy of manager which had been promised to Robineau. However, the latter stood firm, and it was now an hourly battle. Houtin dreamed of setting the whole department against him, to hound him out by means of ill-will and vexations. At the same time he went to work craftily, exciting Favier especially, who stood next to him as salesman, and who appeared to allow himself to be led on but with certain brisk reserves, in which could be felt quite a private campaign carried on in silence. "'Hush! Seventeen! said he, quickly to his colleague, to warn him by this peculiar cry of the approach of Moret and Bourdoncle. The latter were continuing their inspection by traversing the hall. They stopped to ask Robineau for an explanation with regard to a stock of velvets, of which the boxes were encumbering a table. And as the latter replied that there wasn't enough room— "'I told you so, Bordoncle,' cried out Moret, smiling. "'The place is already too small. "'We shall soon have to knock down the halls as far as the Rue de Chaussel. "'You'll see what a crush there'll be next Monday.' "'And respecting the coming sale, for which they were preparing at every counter, "'he asked Robineau further questions, and gave him various orders. "'But for several minutes, and without having stopped talking, "'he had been watching Houtan, who was contrasting the silks, blue, grey, and yellow, drawing back to judge the harmony of the tones. Suddenly he interfered. "'But why are you endeavouring to please the eyes? Don't be afraid. Blind them. Look! Red, green, yellow!' He had taken the pieces, throwing them together, crushing them, producing an excessively fast effect. Everyone allowed the governor to be the best displayer in Paris, of a regular revolutionary stamp, who had founded the brutal and colossal school in the science of displaying. He delighted in a tumbling of stuffs, as if they had fallen from the crowded shelves by chance, making them glow with the most ardent colours, lighting each other up by the contrast, declaring that the customers ought to have sore eyes on going out of the shop. Houtin, who belonged, on the contrary, to the classic school, in which symmetry and harmony of colour were cherished, looked at him lighting up this fire of stuff on a table, not venturing on the least criticism, but biting his lip with the pout of an artist, whose convictions are wounded by such a debauch. "'There!' exclaimed Moret when he had finished. "'Leave it. You'll see if it doesn't fetch the women on Monday.' Just as he rejoined Bourdoncle and Robineau, there arrived a woman, who remained stocked still, suffocated before this show. It was Denise, who, having waited for nearly an hour in the street, the prey to a violent attack of timidity, had at last decided to go in but she was so beside herself with bashfulness that she mistook the clearest directions, and the shopman, of whom she had stutteringly asked for Madame Aurélie, directed her in vain to the lower staircase. She thanked them, and turned to the left if they told her to turn to the right, so that for the last ten minutes she had been wandering about the ground floor, going from department to department, amidst the ill-natured curiosity and ill-tempered indifference of the salesman. She longed to run away, and was at the same time retained by a wish to stop and admire. She felt herself lost, she, so little, in this monster place, and this machine at rest, trembling for fear she should be caught in the movement with which the walls already began to shake. And the thought of the old Elbeuf, black and narrow, increased the immensity of this vast establishment, presenting it to her as bathed in light, like a city with its monuments, squares, and streets, in which it seemed impossible that she should ever find her way. However, she had not dared to risk herself in the silk hall, the high glass roof, luxurious counters, and cathedral-like air of which frightened her. 
Then, when she did venture in, to escape the shopmen in the linen department, who were grinning, she had stumbled right on Mouret's display, and, notwithstanding her fright, the woman was aroused within her. Her cheeks suddenly became red, and she forgot everything in looking at the glow of these silks. Hello, said Hutin in Favier's ear. There's a girl we saw in the Place Gaillon. Moret, whilst affecting to listen to Bordoncle and Robinot, was at heart flattered by the startled look of this poor girl, as a marchioness might be by the brutal desire of a passing drayman. But Denise had raised her eyes, and her confusion increased at the sight of this young man, whom she took for a manager. She thought he was looking at her severely. Then, not knowing how to get away, quite lost, she applied to the nearest shopman, who happened to be Favier. "'Madame Aurélie, please.' But Favier, who was disagreeable, contented himself with replying sharply, First floor. And Denise, longing to escape the looks of all these men, thanked him, and had again turned her back to the stairs she ought to have mounted, when Houtin, yielding naturally to his instinct of gallantry, stopped her with his most amiable salesman smile. No, this way, mademoiselle, if you don't mind. And he even went with her a little way to the foot of the staircase on the left-hand side of the hall, under the gallery. There he bowed, smiled tenderly, as he smiled at all women. "'When you get upstairs, turn to the left. The dress department is straight in front.' The caressing politeness affected Denise deeply. It was like a brotherly hand extended to her. She raised her eyes and looked at Hutin, and everything in him touched her. His handsome face, his looks which dissolved her fears, and his voice which seemed to her of a consoling softness. Her heart swelled with gratitude, and she bestowed her friendship in the few disjointed words her emotion allowed her to utter. "'Really, sir, you are too kind. Pray don't trouble to come any further. Thank you very much.' Hutin had already rejoined Favier, to whom he coarsely whispered, "'What a bag of bones, eh?' Upstairs the young girl suddenly found herself in the midst of the dress department. It was a vast room with high carved oak cupboards all round, and clear glass windows looking on to the Rue de la Michaudière. Five or six women in silk dresses, looking very coquettish with their frizzled chignons and crinolines drawn back, were moving about, talking. One, tall and thin, with a long head, having a runaway horse appearance, was leaning against the cupboard, as if already knocked up with fatigue. "'Madame Aurélie,' inquired Denise, the saleswoman looked at her without replying, with an air of disdain for her shabby dress, then turning to one of her friends, a short girl with a sickly white skin, and an innocent and disgusted appearance, she asked, Mademoiselle Jadon, do you know where Madame Aurélie is? The young girl, who was arranging some mantles according to their sizes, did not even take the trouble to raise her head. No, Mademoiselle Prunaire, I don't know at all, replied she in a mincing tone. A silence ensued. Denise stood still, and no one took any further notice of her. However, after waiting a moment, she ventured to put another question. "'Do you think Madame Aurélie will be back soon?' The second hand, a thin, ugly woman, whom she had not noticed before, a widow with a projecting jawbone and coarse hair, cried out from a cupboard, where she was checking some tickets. "'You'd better wait if you want to speak to Madame Aurélie herself.' And, addressing another saleswoman, she added— "'Isn't she downstairs?' "'No, Madame Frédéric, I don't think so,' replied the young lady. "'She said nothing before going, so she can't be far off.' Denise, thus instructed, remained standing. There were several chairs for the customers, but as they had not told her to sit down, she did not dare to take one, although she felt ready to drop with fatigue. All these ladies had evidently put her down as an applicant for the vacancy, and they were taking stock of her pulling her to pieces ill-naturedly, with the secret hostility of people at table, who do not like to close up to make room for hungry outsiders. Her confusion increased. She crossed the room quietly and looked out of the window into the street, just for something to do. Opposite, the older Elbeuf, with its rusty front and lifeless windows, appeared to her so ugly, so miserable, seen thus from amidst the luxury and life of her present standpoint, that a sort of remorse filled her already swollen heart with grief. "'I say,' whispered tall Prunet to little Vadon, "'have you seen her boots?' "'And her dress,' murmured the other. With her eyes still towards the street, Denise felt herself being devoured. But she was not angry, 
she did not think them handsome neither the tall one with her carroty chignon falling over her horse-like neck nor the little one with her sour milk complexion which gave her flat and as it were boneless face a flabby appearance clara Prunaire, daughter of a clog-maker in the forest of villers debauched by the footman at the chateau de moreuil where the countess engaged her as a needlewoman had come later on from a shop at langres and was avenging herself in paris on the men for the kicks with which her father had regaled her when at home marguerite vadon born at Grenoble, where her parents kept a linen shop had been obliged to come to the ladies paradise to conceal an accident she had met with a brat which had made its appearance one day she was a well-conducted girl and intended to return to grenoble to take charge of her parents shop and marry a cousin who was waiting for her well resumed clara in a low voice there's a girl who won't do much good here but they stopped talking a woman of about forty-five came in it was madame aurelie very stout tightly laced in her black silk dress the body of which strained over her massive shoulders and full bust shone like a piece of armour she had under very dark folds of hair great fixed eyes a severe mouth and large and rather drooping cheeks and in the majesty of her position as first hand her face assumed the bombast of a puffy mask of caesar mademoiselle vardon said she in an irritated voice you didn't return the pattern of that mantle to the workroom yesterday it seems there was an alteration to make madame replied the saleswoman so madame frederic kept it the second hand then took the pattern out of the cupboard and the explanation continued every one gave way to madame aurelie when she thought it necessary to assert her authority very vain even going so far as not to wish to be called by her real name lom which annoyed her and to deny her father's humble position always referring to him as a regular established tailor she was only gracious towards those young ladies who showed themselves flexible and caressing bowing down in admiration before her some time previously while she was trying to establish herself in a shop of her own her temper had become sour continually thwarted by the worst of luck exasperated to feel herself born to fortune and to encounter nothing but a series of catastrophes and now even after her success at the ladies paradise where she earned twelve thousand francs a year it seemed that she still nourished a secret spite against every one and she was very hard with beginners as life had shown itself hard for her at first that will do said she sharply you are no more reasonable than the others madame frederic let the alteration be made immediately during this explanation denise had ceased to look into the street she had no doubt this was madame aurelie but frightened at her sharp voice she remained standing still waiting the two saleswomen delighted to have set their two superiors at variance had returned to their work with an air of profound indifference a few minutes elapsed nobody being charitable enough to draw the young girl from her uncomfortable position at last madame aurelie herself perceived her and astonished to see her standing there without moving asked her what she wanted madame aurelie please i am madame aurelie denise's mouth became dry and parched and her hands cold she felt some such fear as when she was a child and trembled at the thought of being whipped she stammered out her request but was obliged to repeat it to make herself understood madame aurelie looked at her with her great fixed eyes not a line of her imperial mask deigning to relax how old are you twenty madame what twenty years old you don't look sixteen the saleswomen again raised their heads denise hastened to add oh i am very strong madame aurelie shrugged her broad shoulders then coldly declared well i don't mind entering your name we enter the names of all those who apply mademoiselle Proner, give me the book but the book could not be found jove the inspector had probably got it as tall clara was going to fetch it moret arrived still followed by bourdoncle they had made a tour of the other departments the lace the shawls the furs the furniture the underlinen and were winding up with the dresses madame aurelie left denise a moment to speak to them about an order for some cloaks she thought of giving to one of the large paris houses as a rule she bought direct and on her own responsibility but for important purchases she preferred consulting the chiefs of the house bourdoncle then related her son albert's latest act of carelessness which seemed to fill her with despair that boy would kill her 
His father, although not a man of talent, was at least well conducted, careful and honest. All this dynasty of Loms, of which she was the acknowledged head, very often caused her a great deal of trouble. However, Mouret, surprised to see Denise again, bent down to ask Madame Aurélie what the young lady was doing there. And, when the first hand replied that she was applying for a saleswoman's situation, Bourdoncle, with his disdain for women, seemed suffocated at this pretension. "'You don't mean it,' murmured he. "'It must be a joke. She's too ugly.' "'The fact is, there's nothing handsome about her,' said Mouret, not daring to defend her, although still moved by the rapture she had displayed downstairs before his arrangement of silks. But the book having been brought in, Madame Aurélie returned to Denise, who had certainly not made a favourable impression. She looked very clean in her thin black woollen dress. The question of shabbiness was of no importance, as the house furnished a uniform, the regulation silk dress. But she appeared rather weak and puny, and had a melancholy face. Without insisting on handsome girls, one liked them to be of agreeable appearance for the sale-rooms. And beneath the gaze of all these ladies and gentlemen who were studying her, weighing her like farmers with a horse at a fair, Denise completely lost countenance. "'Your name?' asked Madame Aurélie, at the end of a counter, pen in hand, ready to write. "'Denise Baudou, madame.' "'Your age?' Twenty years and four months.' And she repeated, risking a glance at Mouret, at this supposed manager, whom she met everywhere and whose presence troubled her so. "'I don't look like it, but I am really very strong.' They smiled. Bourdoncle showed evident signs of impatience. Her remark fell, moreover, amidst the most discouraging silence. "'What house have you been in, in Paris?' resumed Madame Aurélie. "'I've just arrived from Valence. This was a fresh disaster. As a rule, the ladies' paradise only took saleswomen with a year's experience in one of the small houses in Paris. Denise thought all was lost, and, had it not been for the children, had she not been obliged to work for them, she would have closed this useless interview and left the place. "'Where were you, at Valence?' "'At Corneille's.' "'I know him. Good house,' remarked Mouret. It was very rarely that he interfered in the engagement of the employees, the manager of each department being responsible for his staff. But with his delicate appreciation of women, he divined in this young girl a hidden charm, a wealth of grace and tenderness of which she herself was ignorant. The good name enjoyed by the house in which the candidate had started was of great importance, often deciding the question in his or her favour. Madame Aurélie continued, in a kinder tone. "'And why did you leave Corneille's?' "'For family reasons,' replied Denise, turning scarlet. "'We have lost our parents. I have been obliged to follow my brothers. Here is a certificate.' It was excellent. Her hopes were reviving, when another question troubled her. "'Have you any other references in Paris? Where do you live?' "'At my uncle's,' murmured she, hesitating about naming him, fearing they would never take the niece of a competitor. "'At my uncle Baudou's, opposite.' At this, Moray interfered a second time. "'What? Are you Baudou's niece? Is it Baudou who sent you here?' "'Oh, no, sir,' and she could not help laughing. The idea appeared to her so singular. It was a transfiguration. She became quite rosy, and the smile round her rather large mouth lighted up her whole face. Her grey eyes sparkled with a tender flame, her cheeks filled with delicious dimples, and even her light hair seemed to partake of the frank and courageous gaiety that pervaded her whole being. "'Why, she's really pretty,' whispered Moret to Bordoncle. The partner refused to admit it, with a gesture of annoyance. Clara bit her lips, and Marguerite turned away. But Madame Aurélie seemed won over, and encouraged Moret with a nod when he resumed. "'Your uncle was wrong not to bring you. His recommendation sufficed. They say he has a grudge against us. We are people of more liberal minds, and if he can't find employment for his niece in his house, why we will show him that she has only to knock on our door to be received. Just tell him I still like him very much, and that he must blame, not me, but the new style of business.' Tell him, too, that he will ruin himself if he insists on keeping to his ridiculous old-fashioned ways. Denise turned quite white again. It was Moret. No one had mentioned his name, but he had revealed himself, and now she guessed who it was. She understood why this young man had caused her such emotion in the street, in the silk department, and again now. 
this emotion which he could not analyse pressed on her heart more and more like a too heavy weight all the stories related by her uncle came back to her increasing mouret's importance surrounding him with a sort of halo making of him the master of the terrible machine by whose wheels she had felt herself being seized all the morning and behind his handsome face well-trimmed beard and eyes of the colour of old gold she beheld the dead woman that madame hedouin whose blood had helped to cement the stones of the house the shiver she had felt the previous night again seized her and she thought she was merely afraid of him meanwhile madame oralie had closed the book she only wanted one saleswoman and she already had ten applications but she was too anxious to please the governor to hesitate for a moment however the application would follow its course jove the inspector would go and make inquiries send in his report and then she would come to a decision very good mademoiselle said she majestically to preserve her authority we will write to you denise stood there unable to move for a moment hardly knowing how to take her leave in the midst of all these people at last she thanked madame oralie and on passing by moret and bourdoncle she bowed these gentlemen occupied in examining the pattern of a mantle with madame frederic did not take the slightest notice clara looked in a vexed way towards marguerite as if to predict that a newcomer would not have a very pleasant time of it in the place denise doubtless felt this indifference and rancour behind her for she went downstairs with the same troubled feeling she had on going up asking herself whether she ought to be sorry or glad to have come could she count on having the situation she did not even know that her uncomfortable state having prevented her understanding clearly of all her sensations two remained and gradually effaced all the others the emotion almost the fear inspired in her by mouret and hutin's amiability the only pleasure she had enjoyed the whole morning a souvenir of charming sweetness which filled her with gratitude when she crossed the shop to go out she looked for the young man happy at the idea of thanking him again with her eyes and she was very sorry not to see him well mademoiselle have you succeeded asked the timid voice as she at last stood on the pavement outside she turned round and recognised a tall awkward young fellow who had spoken to her in the morning he also had just come out of the ladies paradise appearing more frightened than she did still bewildered with the examination he had just passed through i really don't know yet sir replied she you're like me then what a way of looking at and talking to you they have in there hey eh? i'm applying for a place in the lace department i was at creveseurs in the rue de Mal. they were once more standing facing each other and not knowing how to take leave they commenced to blush then the young man just for something to say in the excess of his timidity ventured to ask in his good-natured awkward way what is your name mademoiselle denise baudu my name is henri de loche now they smiled and yielding to the fraternity of their positions shook each other by the hand good luck yes good luck end of chapter two part two Section five of the Ladies Paradise by Emile Sola Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli This Librivox recording is in the public domain read by Christine G Chapter three Part one Every Saturday, between four and six, Madame de Fauche offered a cup of tea and a few cakes to those friends who were kind enough to visit her. She occupied the third floor of a house at the corner of the Rue de Rivoli and the Rue d'Algere the windows of both drawing-rooms overlooked the tuileries gardens this saturday just as the footman was about to introduce him into the principal drawing-room moret perceived from the anteroom through an open door madame de fauche who was crossing the little drawing-room she stopped on seeing him and he went in that way bowing to her with a ceremonious air but when the footman had closed the door he quickly seized the young woman's hand and tenderly kissed it take care i have company she said in a low voice glancing towards the door of the larger room i've just been to fetch this fan to show them and she playfully tapped him on the face with the tip of the fan she was dark rather stout with big jealous eyes but he still held her hand and asked will he come certainly replied she i have his promise both of them referred to baron Artemont 
director of the Crédit Immobilier. Madame de Fauche, daughter of a councillor of state, was the widow of a stockbroker, who had left her a fortune, denied by some, exaggerated by others. Even during her husband's lifetime, people said she had shown herself grateful towards Baron Artemont, whose financial tips had proved very useful to them, and later on, after her husband's death, the acquaintance had probably continued, but always discreetly, without imprudence or display, for she never courted notoriety in any way, and was received everywhere in the upper middle classes amongst whom she was born. Even at this time, when the passion of the banker, a sceptical, crafty man, had subsided into a simple paternal affection, if she permitted herself certain lovers whom he tolerated, she displayed in these treasons of the heart such a delicate reserve and tact, a knowledge of the world so adroitly applied, and no one would have ventured to openly express any doubt as to her conduct. Having met Moret at the mutual friends, she had at first detested him, but she had yielded to him later on, as if carried away by the violent love with which he attacked her, and since he had commenced to approach Baron Artemont through her, she had gradually got to love him with a real profound tenderness, adoring him with the violence of a woman already thirty-five, although only acknowledging twenty-nine, and in despair at feeling him younger than herself, trembling lest she should lose him. "'Does he know about it?' "'No, you'll explain the affair to him yourself,' she replied. She looked at him, thinking that he couldn't know anything, or he would not employ her in this way with the baron, affecting to consider him simply as an old friend of hers. But he still held her hand. He called her his good Henriette, and she felt her heart melting. Silently she presented her lips, pressed them to his, then whispered, "'Oh, they are waiting for me. Come in behind me.' They could hear voices issuing from the principal drawing-room, deadened by the heavy curtains. She pushed the door, leaving it two folds open, and handed the fan to one of the four ladies who were seated in the middle of the room. "'There it is,' said she. "'I didn't know exactly where it was. My maid would never have found it.' And she added in her cheerful way, "'Come in, Monsieur Moret. Come through the little drawing-room. It will be less solemn.' Moret bowed to the ladies whom he knew. The drawing-room— with its flowered brocatel Louis the Sixteenth furniture, gilded bronzes and large green plants, had a tender feminine air, notwithstanding the height of the ceiling, and through the two windows could be seen the chestnut trees in the Tuileries gardens, their leaves blowing about in the October wind. "'But it isn't at all bad, this Chantilly!' exclaimed Madame Bourdelais, who had taken the fan. She was a short, fair woman of thirty, with a delicate nose and sparkling eyes, an old schoolfellow of Henriette, and who had married a chief clerk in the treasury. Of an old middle-class family, she managed her household and three children with a rare activity and good grace, and an exquisite knowledge of practical life. "'And you paid twenty-five francs for it,' resumed she, examining each mesh of the lace. "'At look, I think you said, to a countrywoman. No, it isn't there.' "'But you had to get it mounted, hadn't you?' "'Of course,' replied Madame de Fauche. "'The mounting cost me two hundred francs.' Madame Bourdelais began to laugh. "'And that was what Henriette called a bargain. Two hundred francs for a plain ivory mount, with a monogram. "'And that for a simple piece of chantilly, over which she had saved five francs, perhaps.' Similar fans could be had ready mounted for a hundred and twenty francs, and she named a shop in the Rue Poissonnier. However, the fan was handed round to all the ladies. Madame Gubal barely glanced at it. She was a tall, thin woman, with red hair and a face full of indifference, in which her grey eyes, occasionally penetrating her unconcerned air, cast a terrible gleams of selfishness. She was never seen out with her husband, a barrister well known as the Palais de Justice, who led, it was said, a pretty free life, dividing himself between his law business and his pleasures. "'Oh,' murmured she, passing the fan to Madame de Bove, "'I've scarcely bought one in my life. One always receives too many of such things.' The countess replied with a delicate malice. "'You are fortunate, my dear, in having a gallant husband.' And bending over to her daughter, a tall girl of twenty, she added— 
Just look at a monogram, Blanche. What pretty work. It's the monogram that must have increased the price like that. Madame de Bove had just turned forty. She was a superb woman, with the neck of a goddess, a large regular face, and a big sleepy eyes whom her husband, Inspector General of the Stade, had married for her beauty. She appeared quite moved by the delicacy of the monogram, as if seized with a desire the emotion of which made her turn pale, and turning round suddenly she continued, "'Give us your opinion, Monsieur Moret. Is it too dear? Two hundred francs for this mount?' Moret had remained standing in the midst of the five women, smiling, taking an interest in what interested them. He picked up the fan, examined it, and was about to give his opinion, when the footman opened the door and announced, "'Madame Mortu!' And there entered a thin, ugly woman, ravaged with the smallpox, dressed with a complicated elegance. She was of uncertain age, her thirty-five years appearing sometimes equally to thirty, and sometimes to forty according to the intensity of the nervous fever which agitated her. A red leather bag, which she had not let go, hung from her right hand. "'Dear madame,' said she to Henriette, "'excuse me bringing my bag. As I was coming along, I went into the paradise, and as I have again been very extravagant, I did not like to leave it in my cab for fear of being robbed.' But having perceived Moret, she resumed laughingly, "'Ah!' sir i didn't mean to give you an advertisement for i didn't know you were here but you really have some extraordinary fine lace just now this turned the attention from the fan which the young man laid on the table the ladies were all anxious to see what madame marty had bought she was known to be very extravagant totally unable to resist temptation strict in her conduct and incapable of yielding to a lover but weak and cowardly easily conquered before the least bit of finery daughter of a city clerk she was ruining her husband a master at the lycée bonaparte who was obliged to double his salary of six thousand francs a year by giving private lessons in order to meet the constantly increasing household expenses she did not open her bag but held it tight in her lap and commenced to talk about her daughter valentine fourteen years old one of her dearest coquetries for she dressed her like herself with all the fashionable novelties of which she submitted to the irresistible seduction. "'You know,' she said, "'they are making dresses trimmed with a narrow lace for young girls this winter, so when I saw a very pretty Valenciennes, And she at last decided to open her bag. The ladies were stretching out their necks, when, in the midst of the silence, the doorbell was heard. "'It's my husband,' stammered Madame Marty very confused he promised to fetch me on leaving the liaison bonaparte she quickly shut the bag again and put it under her chair with an instinctive movement all the ladies set up a laugh this made her blush for her precipitation and she put the bag on her knees again explaining that men never understood and that they need not know monsieur de boeuf monsieur de volonjosque announced the footman it was quite a surprise. Madame de Boeuf herself did not expect her husband. The latter, a fine man, wearing a moustache and an imperial with the military correctness so much liked at the Tuileries, kissed the hand of Madame de Fauche, whom he had known as a young girl at her father's. And he made way to allow his companion, a tall pale fellow of an aristocratic poverty of blood, to make his bow to the lady of the house but the conversation had hardly recommenced when two exclamations were heard why is that you paul why octave moret and valangeusque then shook hands much to madame de fauche's surprise they knew each other then of course they had grown up side by side at the college at plasson and it was quite by chance they had not met at our house before however with their hands still united they went into the little drawing-room, just as the servant brought in the tea, a china service on a silver waiter, which he placed near Madame de Fauche, on a small round table with a light copper mounting. The ladies drew up and began talking louder, producing a cross-fire of short disjointed sentences, whilst Monsieur de Bove, standing up behind them, put in an occasional word, with the gallantry of a handsome functionary. The vast room, 
so prettily and cheerfully furnished, became merrier still with these gossiping voices and the frequent laughter. "'Ah, Paul, old boy!' repeated Moret. He was seated near Valangeosque on a sofa, and alone in the little drawing-room, very coquettish with its pretty silk hangings, out of hearing of the ladies, and not even seeing them, except through the open door, the two old friends commenced grinning, examining each other's looks, exchanging slaps on the knees. Their whole youthful career was recalled, the old college at Plaçon, with its two courtyards, its damp classrooms, and the dining-room in which they had consumed so much codfish, and the dormitories, where the pillows used to fly from bed to bed as soon as the monitor began to snore. Paul, belonging to an old parliamentary family, noble, poor, and proud, was a good scholar, always at the top of his class, continually held up as an example by the master, who prophesied for him a brilliant future, whilst Octave remained at the bottom, stuck amongst the dancers, fat and jolly, indulging in all sorts of pleasures outside. Notwithstanding the difference in their characters, a fast friendship had rendered them inseparable, until their final examinations, which they passed, the one with honours, the other in a passable manner after two vexatious trials. Then they went out into the world, and had now met again, after ten years, already changed and looking older. "'Well,' said Moret, "'what's become of you?' "'Nothing at all,' replied the other. Valangeosque, in the joy of their meeting, retained his tired and disenchanted air, and as his friend, astonished, insisted, saying, "'But you must do something. What do you do?' "'Nothing,' replied he. Octave commenced to laugh. "'Nothing? That wasn't enough?' Little by little he succeeded in drawing Paul out to tell his story. It was the usual story of penniless younger sons, who think themselves obliged by their birth to choose a liberal profession, burying themselves in a sort of vain mediocrity, happy to escape starvation, notwithstanding their numerous degrees. He had studied law by a sort of family tradition, and had since remained a burden on his widowed mother, who even then hardly knew how to dispose of her two daughters. Having at last got quite ashamed, he left the three women to vegetate on the remains of their fortune, and accepted an appointment in the Ministry of the Interior, where he buried himself like a mole in its hole. "'What do you get there?' resumed Moret. Three thousand francs.' "'But that's a pitiful pay. Ah, old man, I'm really sorry for you. What, a clever fellow like you, who floored all of us?' and they only give you three thousand francs a year, after having already ground you down for five years. No, it isn't right, he interrupted himself and returned to his own doings. As for me, I made him a humble bow. You know what I am doing? Yes, said Valangeosque. I heard you were in business. You've got that big place in the Place Gaillon, haven't you? That's it. Counter jumper, my boy. Moret raised his head again slapped him on the knee, and repeated, with the solid gaiety of a fellow who did not blush for the trade by which he was making his fortune. Counter-jumper, and no mistake! You remember, no doubt. I didn't bite much at their machines, although at heart I never thought myself duller than the others. When I took my degree, just to please my family, I could have become a barrister or a doctor quite as easily as any of my schoolfellows, but those trades frightened me. I saw so many who were starving at them that I just threw them over without the least regret, and pitched head first into business. Valangeosque smiled with an awkward air, and ultimately said, "'It is very certain your degree can't be much good to you for selling calico.' "'Well,' replied Moret joyously, "'all I ask is that it shall not stand in my way, and you know, when one has been stupid enough to burden oneself with it, it is difficult to get rid of it.' One goes at a tortoise's pace through life, whilst those who are barefooted run like madmen. Then, noticing that his friend seemed troubled, he took his hand in his, and continued, "'Come, come, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but confess that your degrees have not satisfied any of your wants. Do you know that my manager in the silk department will draw more than twelve thousand francs this year? Just so, a fellow of very clear intelligence, whose knowledge is confined to spelling.' and the first four rules. The ordinary salesmen in my place make from three to four thousand francs a year, more than you can earn yourself. 
and their education was not as expensive as yours, nor were they launched into the world with a written promise to conquer it. Of course, it is not everything to make money, but between the poor devils possessed of a smattering of science who now block up the liberal professions, without earning enough to keep themselves from starving, and the practical fellows armed for life's struggle, knowing every branch of their trade by Jove. I don't hesitate a moment. I am for the latter against the former. I think they thoroughly understand the age they live in. His voice had become impassioned. Andreette, who was pouring out the tea, turned her head. When he caught her smile at the further end of the large drawing-room, and saw the other ladies were listening, he was the first to make marry over his own big phrases. In short, old man, every counter-jumper who commences has, at the present day, a chance of becoming a millionaire. Valangeosque threw himself back on the sofa indolently, half closing his eyes in a fatigued and disdainful attitude, in which a suspicion of affectation was added to his real hereditary exhaustion. Bah! murmured he. Life is worth all that trouble. There is nothing worth living for. And as Moray, shocked, looked at him with an air of surprise, he added, Everything happens and nothing happens. One may as well stay with one's arms folded. He then explained his pessimism, the mediocrities and the abortions of existence. For a time he had thought of literature, but his intercourse with certain poets had filled him with universal despair. He always arrived at the conclusion that effort was useless, every hour equally weary and empty, and the world incurably stupid and dull. All enjoyment was a failure, and there was no pleasure in wrongdoing even. "'Just tell me, do you enjoy life yourself?' asked he at last. Moray was now in a state of astonished indignation, and exclaimed, "'What? Do I enjoy myself? What are you talking about? Why, of course I do, my boy, and even when things give away, for then I am furious at hearing them cracking, I am a passionate fellow myself, and don't take life quietly. That's what interests me in it, perhaps.' He glanced towards the drawing-room and lowered his voice. "'Oh, there are some women who have bothered me awfully, I must confess, but when I've got hold of one, I keep her. She doesn't always escape me, and then I take my share, I assure you. But it is not so much the women, for to speak truly, I don't care a hang for them. It's the wish to act, to create, in short. You have an idea, you fight for it, you hammer it into people's head, and you see it grow and triumph. Ah, yes, my boy, I enjoy life. All the joy of action, all the gaiety of existence, resounded in these words. He repeated that he went with the times. Really, a man must be badly constituted, have his brain and limbs out of order, to refuse to work in an age of such vast undertakings, when the entire century was pressing forward with giant strides. And he laughed at the despairing ones, the disgusted ones, the pessimists, all those weak, sickly members of our budding sciences, who assumed the weeping airs of poets, or the mincing ways of sceptics, amidst the immense activity of the present day. A fine part to play, proper and intelligent, that of yawning before other people's labour. "'That's my only pleasure, yawning in others' faces,' said Valangeosque, smiling with his cold look. At this Moray's passion subsided, and he became affectionate again. "'Ah, Paul, you're not changed, just as paradoxical as ever. However, we have not met a quarrel. Each one has his own ideas, fortunately. But you must come and see my machine at work. You'll see it isn't a bad idea. Come, what news?' Your mother and sister are quite well, I hope. And weren't you supposed to get married at Plasson about six months ago? A sudden movement made by Valangeosque stopped him, and as the former was looking round the drawing-room with an anxious expression, Moray also turned round, and noticed that Mademoiselle de Beauve was closely watching them. Blanche, tall and stout, resembled her mother, but her face was already puffed out, her large, coarse features swollen with unhealthy fat. Paul, in reply to a discreet question, intimated that nothing was yet settled. Perhaps nothing would be settled. He had made the young person's acquaintance at Madame de Forges, where he had visited a good deal last winter, but where he very rarely came now, which explained why he had not met Octave there sooner. 
In their turn, the de Boves invited him, and he was especially fond of the father, a very amiable man, formerly well known about town, who had retired into his present position. On the other hand, no money. Madame de Boves, having brought her husband nothing but her Juno-like beauty as a marriage portion, the family were living poorly on the last mortgaged farm, to which modest revenue was added, fortunately, the nine thousand francs a year drawn by the Count as Inspector-General of the Stade. And the ladies, mother and daughter, kept very short of money by him, impoverished by tender escapades outside, were sometimes reduced to turning their dresses themselves. "'In that case, why marry?' was Moray's simple question. "'Well, I can't go on like this for ever.' said Valangeosque, with a weary movement of the eyelids. "'Besides, there are certain expectations. We are waiting the death of an aunt.' However, Moray still kept his eye on Monsieur de Bove, who, seated next to Madame Guibal, was most attentive and laughing tenderly, like a man on an amorous campaign. He turned to his friend with such significant twinkle of the eye that the latter added, "'Not that one, at least not yet.' The misfortune is that his duty calls him to the four corners of France, to the breeding depots, so that he has continual pretext for absenting himself. Last month, whilst his wife supposed him to be at Perpignan, he was living at a hotel, in an out-of-the-way neighbourhood, with a music mistress. There ensued a pause. Then the young man, who was also watching the Count's gallantries towards Madame Guibal, resumed in a low tone, "'Really, I think you are right.' The more so, as the dear lady is not exactly a saint, if all they say is true. There's a very amusing story about her and an officer. But just look at him. Isn't he comical? Magnetizing her with his eyes. The old-fashioned gallantry, my dear fellow. I adore that man, and if I marry his daughter, you can safely say it's for his sake. Moret laughed, greatly amused. He questioned Valangeosque again, and when he found that the first idea of marriage between him and Blanche came from Madame de Forges, he thought the story better still, that good Andriette took a widow's delight in marrying people, so much so that when she had provided for the girls, she sometimes allowed their fathers to choose friends from her company, but also naturally, with such a good grace, that no one ever found any food for scandal. And Moret, who loved her with the love of an active, busy man, accustomed to reducing his tenderness to figures, forgot all his calculations of captivation, and felt for her a comrade's friendship. At that moment she appeared at the door of the little drawing-room, followed by a gentleman, about sixty years old, whose entry had not been observed by the two friends. Occasionally the ladies' voices became sharper, accompanied by the tinkling of the small spoons in the china cups, and there was heard, from time to time, in the interval of a short silence, the noise of a saucer laid down too roughly on the marble table. A sudden gleam of the setting sun, which had just emerged from behind a thick cloud, gilded the top of the chestnut trees in the gardens, and streamed through the windows in a red golden flame, the fire over which lighted up the brocatelle and brasswork of the furniture. "'This way, my dear Baron,' said Madame de Fauche, "'allow me to introduce Monsieur Octave Moret, who is longing to express the admiration he feels for you.' and turning round towards Octave, she added, Baron Artemont. A smile played on the old man's lips. He was a short, vigorous man, with a large Alsatian head and a heavy face, which lighted up with a gleam of intelligence at the slightest curl of his mouth, the slightest movement of his eyelids. For the last fortnight he had resisted Henriette's wish that he should consent to this interview. Not that he felt any immoderate jealousy, excepting, like a man of the world, his position of father, but because it was the third friend Andriette had introduced to him, and he was afraid of becoming ridiculous at last. So that, on approaching Octave, he put on the discreet smile of a rich protector, who, if good enough to show himself charming, does not consent to be a dupe. "'Oh, sir!' said Moret, with his southern enthusiasm. "'The Crédit Immobilier's last operation was really astonishing.' You cannot think how happy and proud I am to know you. Too kind, sir, too kind, repeated the baron, still smiling. Andriette looked at them with her clear eyes without any awkwardness, standing between the two, lifting her head, going from one to the other, and, in her lace dress, which revealed her delicate neck and wrists, 
she appeared delighted to see them so friendly together. "'Gentlemen,' said she at last, "'I leave you to your conversation.' Then, turning towards Paul, who had got up, she resumed, "'Will you accept a cup of tea, Monsieur de Valangeusque? "'With pleasure, madame.' And they both returned to the drawing-room. Moray resumed his place on the sofa, when Baron Hartmont had sat down. The young man then broke out in praise of the Crédit Immobilier's operations. From that he went on to the subject so near his heart, speaking of the new thoroughfare, of the lengthening of the Rue Romand, of which they were going to open a section under the name of the Rue de Décembre, between the Place de la Bourse and the Place de l'Opéra. It had been declared a work of public utility eighteen months previously. The expropriation jury had just been appointed. The whole neighbourhood was excited about this new opening, anxiously awaiting the commencement of the work, taking an interest in the condemned houses. Moret had been waiting three years for this work, first in the expectation of an increase of business, secondly, with certain schemes of enlargement which he dared not openly avow, so extensive were his ideas. As the Rue de Dix Décembre was to cut through the Rue de Joselle and the Rue de la Mijodière, he saw the ladies' paradise invading the whole block, surrounded by this street and the Rue Nouveau Saint Augustine. He already imagined it with the princely frontage in the new thoroughfare, lord and master of the conquered city. Hence his strong desire to make Baron Hartmann's acquaintance, when he learnt that the Crédit Immobilier had made a contract with the authorities to open and build the Rue de Dix Décembre, on condition that they receive the frontage ground on each side of the street. Really, repeated he, trying to assume a naive look, you'll hand over the street ready-made, with sewers, pavements, and gas lamps, and the frontage ground will suffice to compensate you. Oh, it's curious, very curious. End of chapter 3, part 1section six of the ladies paradise by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain read by christine g chapter three part two at last he came to the delicate point he was aware that the credit immobilier was buying up the houses which surrounded the ladies paradise not only those which were to fall under the demolisher's hand but the others as well those which were to remain standing, and he suspected the projectment of some future establishment. He was very anxious about the enlargements of which he continued to extend the dream, seized with fear at the idea of a one day clashing with a powerful company owning property which they certainly would not part with. It was precisely this fear which had decided him to establish a connection immediately between himself and the baron, the amiable connection of a woman so powerful between men of a gallant nature no doubt he would have seen the financier in his office and talked over the affair in question at his ease but he felt himself stronger in henriette's house he knew how much the mutual possession of a mistress serves to render men pliable and tender to be both near her within the beloved perfume of her presence to have her ready to convince them with a smile seemed to him a certainty of success "'Haven't you bought the old Hôtel du Villard, that old building next to mine?' he asked suddenly. The baron hesitated a moment, and then denied it. But Moray looked in his face and smiled, playing from that moment the part of a good young man, open-hearted, simple, and straightforward in business. "'Look here, baron,' said he, "'as I have the unexpected honour of meeting you, I must make a confession. Oh, I don't ask you any of your secrets.' but I am going to entrust you with mine, certain that I couldn't place them in wiser hands. Besides, I want your advice. I have long wished to call and see you, but dared not do so. He did make his confession. He related his start, not even concealing the financial crisis through which he was passing in the midst of his triumph. Everything was brought up, the successive enlargements, the profits continually put back into the business, the sums brought by his employees, the house risking its existence at every fresh sale, in which the entire capital was staked, as it were, on a single throw of the dice. However, it was not money he wanted, for he had a fanatic's faith in his customers. His ambition ran higher. He proposed to the baron a partnership, 
into which the Crédit Immobilier should bring the colossal palace he saw in his dreams, whilst he, for his part, would give his genius and the business already created. The estate could be valued, nothing appeared to him easier to realise. "'What are you going to do with your land and buildings?' asked he persistently. "'You have a plan, no doubt, but I am quite certain your idea is not so good as mine. Think of that. We build a gallery on the ground, we pull down or rearrange the houses, and we open the most extensive establishment in Paris, a bazaar which will bring in millions.' And he let slip the fervent, heartfelt exclamation. "'Ah! Uh, if I could only do without you! But you get hold of everything now.' Besides, I shall never have the necessary capital. Come, we must come to an understanding. It would be a crime not to do so. How you go ahead, my dear sir, Baron Artemons contented himself with replying. What an imagination! He shook his head, and continued to smile, determined not to return confidence for confidence. The intention of the Crédit Immobilier was to create in the Rue de Dix Décembre a rival to the Grand Hôtel a luxurious establishment, the central position of which would attract foreigners. At the same time, as the hotel was only to occupy a certain frontage, the baron could also have entertained Moray's idea, and treated for the rest of the block of houses, occupying a vast surface. But he had already advanced funds to two of Henriette's friends, and he was getting tired of his position as complacent protector. Besides, notwithstanding his passion for activity, which prompted him to open his purse to every fellow of intelligence and courage, Moray's commercial genius astonished more than captivated him. Was it not a fanciful, imprudent operation, this gigantic shop? Would he not risk a certain failure in thus enlarging out of all bounds the drapery trade? In short, he didn't believe in it. He refused. No doubt the idea is attractive, but it's a poet's idea. Where would you find the customers to fill such a cathedral? Moray looked at him for a moment silently, as if stupefied at his refusal. Was it possible? A man of such foresight, who smelt money at no matter what depth? And suddenly, with an extremely eloquent gesture, he pointed to the ladies in the drawing-room and exclaimed, "'There are my customers!' The sun was going down, the golden-red flame was now but a pale light, dying away in a farewell gleam on the silk of the hangings and the panels of the furniture. At this approach of twilight, an intimacy bathed the large room in a sweet softness. While Monsieur de Bove and Paul de Valangeusk were talking near one of the windows, their eyes wandering far away into the gardens, the ladies had closed up, forming in the middle of the room a narrow circle of petticoats, from which issued sounds of laughter, whispered words, ardent questions and replies, all the passion felt by women for expenditure and finery. They were talking about dress— and Madame de Beauve was describing a costume she had seen at a ball. First of all, a mauve silk skirt, then over that, flounces of old Alonzon lace, twelve inches deep. Oh, is it possible? exclaimed Madame Marty. Some women are fortunate. Baron Hortemont, who had followed Moray's gesture, was looking at the ladies through the door, which was wide open. He was listening to them with one ear whilst the young man, inflamed by the desire to convince him, went deeper into the question, explaining the mechanism of the new style of drapery business. This branch of commerce was now based on a rapid and continual turning over of the capital, which it was necessary to turn into goods as often as possible in the same year. Thus, that year his capital, which only amounted to five hundred thousand francs, had been turned over four times, and had thus produced business to the amount of two millions. But this was a mere trifle, which could be increased tenfold, for later on he certainly hoped to turn over the capital fifteen or twenty times in certain departments. "'You will understand, Baron, that the whole system lies in this. It is very simple, but it had to be found out. We don't want a very large working capital. Our sole effort is to get rid as quickly as possible of our stock, to replace it by another, which will give our capital as many times its interest.' In this way we can content ourselves with a very small profit, as our general expenses amount to the enormous figure of sixteen per cent, and as we seldom make more than twenty per cent on our goods, it is only a net profit of four per cent at most, but this will finish by bringing in millions when we can operate on considerable quantities of goods incessantly renewed, 
You follow me, don't you? Nothing can be clearer. The baron shook his head again. He who had entertained the boldest combinations, of whom people still quoted the daring flights at the time of the introduction of gas, still remained uneasy and obstinate. "'I quite understand,' said he. "'You sell cheap to sell a quantity, and you sell a quantity to sell cheap. But you must sell. And I repeat my former question. Whom will you sell to? How do you hope to keep up such a colossal sale?' The sudden burst of a voice, coming from the drawing-room, cut short Moray's explanation. It was Madame Guibal, who was saying she would have preferred the flounces of all Alençon down the front only. "'But, my dear,' said Madame de Bove, "'the front was covered with it as well. I never saw anything richer.' "'Ah, that's a good idea,' resumed Madame de Fauche. "'I've got several yards of Alençon somewhere. I must look them up for a trimming.' and the voices fell again, becoming nothing but a murmur. Prices were quoted, quite a traffic stirred up in their desires. The ladies were buying lace by the mile. "'Why,' said Moray, when he could speak, "'we can sell what we like when we know how to sell. There lies our triumph.' And with his southern spirit, he showed the new business at work in warm, glowing phrases which evoked whole pictures. First came the wonderful power of the piling up of the goods— all accumulated at one point, sustaining and pushing each other, never any standstill, the article of the season always on hand, and from counter to counter the customer found herself seized, buying here the material, further on the cotton, elsewhere the mantle, everything necessary to complete her dress, in fact, then falling into unforeseen purchases, yielding to her longing for the useless and the pretty. He then went on to sing the praises of the plain figure system, the great revolution in the business sprung from this fortunate inspiration. If the old-fashioned small shops were dying out, it was because they could not struggle against the low prices guaranteed by the tickets. The competition was now going on under the very eyes of the public. A look into the windows enabled them to contrast the prices. Every shop was lowering its rate, contenting itself with the smallest possible profit. No cheating, no stroke of fortune prepared long beforehand on an article sold at double its value, but current operations, a regular percentage on all goods, success depending solely on the orderly working of a sale, all the larger from the fact of its being carried on in broad daylight. Was it not an astonishing creation? It was causing a revolution in the market, transforming Paris, for it was made of women's flesh and blood. "'I have the women. I don't care a hang for the rest,' said Moray, in a brutal confession which passion snatched from him. At this cry, Baron Hortemont appeared moved. His smile lost its touch of irony. He looked at the young man, won over gradually by his confidence, feeling a growing tenderness for him. "'Hush!' murmured he paternally. "'They will hear you.' But the ladies were now all speaking at once, so excited that they weren't even listening to each other. Madame de Bove was finishing the description of a dinner-dress, a mauve silk tunic, draped and caught up by bows of lace, the bodice cut very low, with more bows of lace on the shoulders. "'You'll see,' said she, "'I'm having a bodice made like it, with some satin.' "'I,' interrupted Madame Bordelais, "'I wanted some velvet. Oh, such a bargain!' Madame Marty asked. "'How much for the silk?' And off they started again, all together. Madame Guibal, Henriette, and Blanche were measuring, cutting out and making up. It was a pillage of material, a ransacking of all the shops, an appetite for luxury which expended itself in toilets longed for and dreamed of, such a happiness to find themselves in an atmosphere of finery, that they lived buried in it, as in the warm air necessary to their existence. Moret, however, had glanced towards the other drawing-room, and in a few phrases whispered into the baron's air, as if he were confiding to him one of those amorous secrets that men sometimes risk among themselves he finished explaining the mechanism of modern commerce. And, above the fact already given, right at the summit, appear the exploitation of a woman. Everything depended on that, the capital incessantly renewed, the system of piling up goods, the cheapness which attracts, the marking in plain figures which tranquillizes. It was for woman that all the establishments were struggling in wild competition. It was for woman that they were continually catching in the snare of their bargains, after bewildering her with their displays. They had awakened new desires in her flesh. 
they were an immense temptation, before which she succumbed fatally, yielding at first to reasonable purchases of useful articles for the household, then tempted by their coquetry, then devoured. In increasing their business tenfold, in popularizing luxury, they became a terrible spending agency, ravaging the households, working up the fashionable folly of the hour, always dearer. And if woman reigned in their shops like a queen, cajoled, flattered, overwhelmed with attentions, she was an amorous one, on whom her subjects traffic, and who pays with a drop of her blood each fresh caprice. Through the very gracefulness of his gallantry, Moret thus allowed to appear the brutality of a few, selling woman by the pound. He raised a temple to her, had her covered with incense by a legion of shopmen, created the rite of a new religion, thinking of nothing but her, continually seeking to imagine more powerful seductions. And, behind her back, when he had emptied her purse and shattered her nerves, he was full of the secret scorn of a man to whom a woman had just been stupid enough to yield herself. "'Once you have the women on your side,' whispered he to the baron, and laughing boldly, "'you could sell the very world.' Now the baron understood. A few sentences had sufficed. He guessed the rest, and such a gallant exploitation inflamed him, stirring up in him the memory of his past life of pleasure. His eyes twinkled in a knowing way, and he ended by looking with an air of admiration at the inventor of this machine for devouring the women. It was really clever. He made the same remark as Bordoncle, suggested to him by his long experience. "'You know they'll make you suffer for it.' But Moray shrugged his shoulders in a movement of overwhelming disdain. They all belonged to him, were his property, and he belonged to none of them. After having drawn from them his fortune and his pleasure, he intended to throw them all over for those who might still find their account in them. It was the rational, cold disdain of a southerner and a speculator. "'Well, my dear Baron,' asked he in conclusion, "'will you join me? Does this affair appear possible to you?' The Baron— Half conquered did not wish, however, to engage himself yet. A doubt remained beneath the charm which was gradually operating on him. He was going to reply in an evasive manner, when a pressing call from the lady spared him the trouble. Voices were repeating amid silvery laughter, "'Monsieur Moret! Monsieur Moret!' And as the latter, annoyed at being interrupted, pretended not to hear, Madame de Beauve, who had just got up, came as far as the door of the little drawing-room. "'You are wanted, Monsieur Moret. "'It isn't very gallant of you to bury yourself in a corner to talk of a business.' "'He then decided to go, with an apparent good grace, "'an air of rapture which astonished the Baron. "'Both rose up and passed into the other drawing-room. "'But I am quite at your service, ladies,' said he on entering, a smile on his lips. "'He was greeted with a burst of triumph. "'He was obliged to go further forward. "'The ladies made room for him in their midst.' The sun had just gone down behind the trees in the gardens. The day was departing. A fine shadow was gradually invading the vast apartment. It was the tender hour of twilight, that minute of discreet voluptuousness in the Parisian houses, between the dying brightness of the street and the lighting of the lamps downstairs. Monsieur de Beauve and Valangeusk, still standing up before a window, threw a shadow on the carpet, whilst, motionless in the last gleam of light which came in by the other window, Monsieur Marty, who had quietly entered, and whom the conversation of these ladies about dress had completely confused, placed his poor profile, a frock-coat, scanty but clean, his face pale and wan from teaching. "'Is your sale fixed for next Monday?' Madame Marty was just asking. "'Certainly, madame,' replied Moret, in a soft, sweet voice, an actor's voice, which he assumed when speaking to women. Henriette then intervened. "'We are all going, you know. They say you are preparing wonders.' "'Oh, wonders,' murmured he, with an air of modest fatuity. "'I simply tried to deserve your patronage.' But they pressed him with questions. Madame Bourdelais, Madame Guibal, Blanche even wanted to know. "'Come, give us some details,' repeated Madame de Beauve persistently. "'You are making us die of curiosity.' and they were surrounding him when Henriette observed that he had not even taken a cup of tea. It was distressing. Four of them set about serving him, but on condition that he would answer them afterwards. Henriette poured it out, Madame Marty held the cup, whilst Madame de Beauve and Madame Bordelais contended for the honour of sweetening it. Then, when he had declined to sit down, and commenced to drink his tea slowly, 
standing up in the midst of them they all approached imprisoning him in the narrow circle of their skirts and with their heads raised their eyes sparkling they sat there smiling at him your silk your paris paradise that all the papers are talking about resumed madame marty impatiently oh replied he an extraordinary article coarse-grained supple and strong you'll see it ladies and you'll see it nowhere else for we have bought the exclusive right of it really a fine silk at five francs twelve sous said madame bordelais enthusiastic one cannot credit it ever since the advertisement had appeared this silk had occupied a considerable place in their daily life they talked of it promising themselves some of it worked up with desire and doubt and beneath the gossiping curiosity with which they overwhelmed the young man there appeared their various temperaments as buyers madame marty carried away by her rage for spending took everything at the ladies paradise without choosing just as the articles appeared madame gibal walked about the shop for hours without ever buying anything happy and satisfied to simply feast her eyes madame de Beauve, short of money always tortured by some immoderate wish nourished a feeling of rancour against the goods she could not carry away madame bordelais with the sharp eye of a careful practical housewife made straight for the bargains using the big establishments with such a clever housewife's skill that she saved a heap of money and lastly henriette who very elegant only procured certain articles there such as gloves hoisery and her coarse linen we have other stuffs of astonishing cheapness and richness continued moret with his musical voice for instance i recommend you our golden grain a taffeta of incomparable brilliancy in the fancy silks there are some charming lines designs chosen from among thousands by our buyer and in velvet you will find an exceedingly rich collection of shades i warn you that cloth will be greatly worn this year you will see our checks and our chevions they had ceased to interrupt him and narrowed the circle their mouths half open with a vague smile their eager faces close to his as in a sudden rush of their whole being towards the tempter their eyes grew dim a slight shudder ran through them all this time he retained his calm conquering air amidst the intoxicating perfumes which their hair exhaled and between each sentence he continued to sip a little of his tea the aroma of which cooled those sharper odours in which there was a particle of the savage before a captivating grace so thoroughly master of itself strong enough to play with woman in this way without being overcome by the intoxication which she exhales baron Artemont, who had not ceased to look at him felt this admiration increasing so cloth will be worn resumed madame marty whose ravished face sparkled with coquettish passion madame bordelais who kept a cool lookout said in her turn your sale of remnants takes place on thursday doesn't it i shall wait i have all my little ones to clothe and turning her delicate blonde head towards the mistress of the house sauveur is still your dressmaker i suppose yes replied henriette sauveur is very dear but she is the only one in paris who knows how to make a bodice besides monsieur moret may say what he likes she has the prettiest designs designs that are not seen anywhere else i can't bear to see my dresses on every woman's back moret smiled discreetly at first then he intimated that madame sauveur bought her material at his shop no doubt she went to the manufacturers direct for certain designs of which she acquired the sole right of sale but for all black silks for instance she watched for the paradise bargains laying in a considerable stock which she disposed of at a double and treble the price she gave thus i am quite sure her buyers will snap up all of our paris paradise why should she go to the manufacturers and pay dearer for this silk than she would at my place on my word of honour we shall sell it at a loss this was a decisive blow for the ladies the idea of getting goods below cost price awoke in them all the greed felt by women whose enjoyment as buyers is doubled when they think they are robbing the tradesmen he knew them to be incapable of resisting anything cheap but we sell everything for nothing exclaimed he gaily taking up madame de forge's fan which was behind him on the table for instance here's this fan i don't know what it cost the chantilly lace was twenty-five francs and the mounting cost two hundred said henriette well the chantilly isn't there however we have the same at eighteen francs 
"'As for the mount, my dear madame, it's a shameful robbery. I should not dare sell one like it for more than ninety francs.' "'Just what I said!' exclaimed madame Bordelais. Ninety francs!' murmured madame de Beauf. "'One must be very poor indeed to go without one at that price.' She had taken up the fan, and was again examining it with her daughter Blanche, and, on her large regular face, in her big sleepy eyes, there arose an expression of the suppressed and despairing longing of a caprice, in which she could not indulge. The fan once more went the round of the ladies, amidst various remarks and exclamations. Monsieur de Beauve and Valangosque, however, had left the window, whilst the former had returned to his place behind Madame Gibal, the charms of whose bust he was admiring, with its correct and superior air, the young man was leaning over Blanche, endeavouring to find something agreeable to say. "'Don't you think it rather gloomy, mademoiselle, this white mount and black lace?' "'Oh,' replied she gravely, not a blush colouring her inflated cheeks, "'I once saw one made of mother-of-pearl and white lace, something truly virginal.' Monsieur de Beauve, who had doubtless observed the heart-broken, longing looks with which his wife was following the fan, at last added his word to the conversation. "'These flimsy things don't last long. They soon break.' "'Of course they do,' declared Madame Gibal, with an air of indifference. "'I'm tired of having mine mended.' For several minutes Madame Marty, excited by the conversation, was feverishly turning her red leather bag about on her lap, for she had not yet been able to show her purchases. She was burning to display them, with a sort of sensual desire, and— Suddenly forgetting her husband's presence, she took out a few yards of narrow lace wound on a piece of cardboard. "'It's the Valenciennes for my daughter,' said she. "'It's an inch and a half wide. Isn't it delicious? One franc, eighteen sous.' The lace was passed from hand to hand. The ladies were astonished. Moret assured them he sold these little trimmings at cost price. However, Madame Marty had closed the bag, as if to conceal certain things she could not show but after the success obtained by the Valenciennes, she was unable to resist the temptation of taking out a handkerchief. "'There was this handkerchief as well. Real Brussels, my dear. Oh, a bargain. Twenty francs!' And after that the bag became inexhaustible. She blushed with pleasure. A modesty like that of a woman undressing herself made her appear more charming and embarrassed at each fresh article she took out. There was a Spanish blonde lace cravat. Thirty francs. She didn't want it, but the shopman had sworn it was the last, and that in future the price would be raised. Next came a Chantilly veil, rather dear, fifty francs. If she didn't wear it, she could make it do for her daughter. "'Really, lace is so pretty,' repeated she with her nervous laugh. "'Once I'm inside, I could buy everything.' "'And this?' asked Madame de Beauve, taking up and examining a remnant of Maltese lace. "'That?' replied she, is for an insertion. There are twenty-six yards, a franc for the yard. Just fancy. But, said Madame Bordelais, surprised, what are you going to do with it? I suppose I don't know, but it was such a funny pattern. At this moment she raised her eyes and perceived her terrified husband in front of her. He had turned paler than usual. His whole person expressed the patient, resigned anguish of a man assisting, powerless at the reckless expenditure of his salary, so dearly earned. Every fresh bit of lace was for him a disaster. Bitter days of teaching swallowed up, long journeys to pupils through the mud devoured, the continued effort of his life resulting in a secret misery, the hell of a necessitous household. Before the increasing wildness of his look, she wanted to catch up the veil, the cravat, and the handkerchief, moving her feverish hands about, repeating with a forced laughter, You'll get me a scolding from my husband. I assure you, my dear, I've been very reasonable, for there was a fine piece of point at five hundred francs. Oh, a marvel! Why didn't you buy it? asked Madame Gibal, calmly. Monsieur Marty is the most gallant of men. The poor professor was obliged to bow and say his wife was perfectly welcome. But the idea of this point at five hundred francs was like a lump of ice dripping down his back and as Moret was just at that moment affirming that the new shops increased the comfort of the middle-class households, he glared at him with a terrible expression, the flash of hatred of a timid man who would have throttled him had he dared. But the ladies had still kept hold of the bits of lace, fascinated, intoxicated, 
the pieces were unrolled, passed from one to the other, drawing the admirers closer still, holding them in the delicate meshes. On their laps there was a continual caress of this tissue, so miraculously fine, and amidst which their culpable fingers fondly lingered. They still kept Moray a close prisoner, overwhelming him with fresh questions. As the day continued to decline, he was now and again obliged to bend his head, grazing their hair with his beard, to examine a stitch, or indicate a design. But in this soft voluptuousness of twilight, in the midst of this warm feminine atmosphere, Moray still remained their master beneath the rapture he affected. He seemed to be a woman himself. They felt themselves penetrated and overcome by this delicate sense of their secret that he possessed, and they abandoned themselves, captivated, whilst he, certain from that moment to have them at his mercy, appeared, brutally triumphing over them, the despotic monarch of dress. "'Oh, Monsieur Moray! stammered they, in low hysterical voices, in the gloom of the drawing-room. The last rays of the setting sun were dying away on the brass work of the furniture. The laces alone retained a snowy reflex on the dark dresses of the ladies, of which the confused group seemed to surround the young man with a vague appearance of kneeling, worshipping women. A light still shone on the side of the silver teapot, a short flame like that of a night-light, burning in an alcove warmed by the perfume of the tea. But suddenly the servant entered with two lamps, and the charm was destroyed. The drawing-room became light and cheerful. Madame Marty was putting her lace in her little bag. Madame de Beauve was eating a sponge-cake, whilst Henriette, who had got up, was talking in a half-whisper to the baron, near one of the windows. "'He's a charming fellow,' said the baron. "'Isn't he?' exclaimed she, with the involuntary cry of a woman in love. He smiled, and looked at her with a paternal indulgence. This was the first time he had seen her so completely conquered, and— too proud to suffer from it, he experienced nothing but a feeling of compassion on seeing her in the hands of this handsome fellow, so tender and yet so cold-hearted. He thought he ought to warn her, and murmured in a joking tone, "'Take care, my dear, or he'll eat you all up.' A flash of jealousy lighted up on Henrietta's eyes. Perhaps she understood Moray had simply made use of her to get at the baron, and she determined to render him mad with passion." he whose hurried style of making love had the easy charm of a song thrown to the four winds of heaven. "'Oh,' said she, affecting to joke in her turn, "'the lamb always finishes up by eating the wolf.' The baron, greatly amused, encouraged her with a nod. Could she be the woman who was to avenge all the others? When Moray, after having reminded Valangosque that he wanted to show him his machine at work, came up to take his leave, the baron retained him near the window opposite the gardens, now buried in darkness. He yielded at last to the seduction. His confidence had come on seeing him in the midst of these ladies. Both conversed for a moment in a low tone. Then the banker said, "'Well, I'll look into the affair. It's settled if your Monday sale proves as important as you expect.' They shook hands, and Moray, delighted, took his leave, for he did not enjoy his dinner unless he went and gave a look at the day's receipts at the ladies' paradise." End of chapter 3, part 2The following Monday, the 10th of October, a clear victorious sun pierced the grey clouds which had darkened Paris during the previous week. It had drizzled all the previous night, a sort of watery mist, the humidity of which dirtied the streets. But in the early morning, thanks to the sharp wind which was driving the clouds away, the pavement had become drier, and the blue sky had a limpid spring-like gaiety. Thus the ladies' paradise, after eight o'clock, blazed forth beneath the clear rays of the sun, in all the glory of its great sale of winter novelties. Flags were flying at the door, and the pieces of woollens were flapping about in the fresh morning air, animating the Place Gaillon with the bustle of a country fair. Whilst in both streets the windows developed symphonies of displays, the clearness of the glass showing up still further the brilliant tones. It was like a debauch of colour, a street pleasure which burst forth there, 
a wealth of goods publicly displayed, where everybody could go and feast their eyes. But at this hour very few people entered, only a few rare customers, housewives of the neighbourhood, women desirous of avoiding the afternoon crush. Behind the stuffs which decorated it, one could feel the shop to be empty, under arms and waiting for customers, with its waxen floors and counters overflowing with goods. The busy morning crowd barely glanced at the windows, without lingering a moment. In the Rue Nouveau Saint-Augustin and the Place Gaillon, where the carriages were to take their stand, there were only two cabs at nine o'clock. The inhabitants of the district, especially the small traders, stirred up by such a show of streamers and decorations, formed little groups in the doorways, at the corners of the streets, gazing at the shop, making bitter remarks. What most filled them with indignation was the sight of one of the four delivery vans just introduced by Moret, which was standing in the Rue de la Michaudière, in front of the delivery office. They were green, picked out with yellow and red, their brilliant varnished panels sparkling in the sun with the brightness of purple and gold. This van, with its brand-new medley of colours, the name of the house painted on each side, and surmounted with an advertisement of the day sale, finished by going off at a trot, drawn by a splendid horse, after being filled up with the previous night's parcels, and Baudu, who was standing on the threshold of the old El Buff, watched it as far as the boulevard, where it disappeared, to spread all over Paris in a starry radiance the hated name of the Ladies' Paradise. However, a few cabs were arriving and forming a line. Every time a customer entered, there was a movement amongst the shop messengers, who were drawn up under the lofty doorway, dressed in livery consisting of a light green coat and trousers, and striped red and yellow waistcoat. Job, the inspector and retired captain, was also there, in a frock coat and white tie, wearing his decoration like a sign of respectability and probity, receiving the ladies with a gravely polite air, bending over them to point out the departments. Then they disappeared into the vestibule, which was transformed into an oriental saloon. From the very threshold it was a marvel, a surprise, which enchanted all of them. It was Moret who had been struck with this idea. He was the first to buy, in the Levant, at very advantageous rates, a collection of old and new carpets, articles which up to the present had only been sold at curiosity shops at high prices, and he intended to flood the market with these goods, selling them at a little over-cost price simply drawing from them a splendid decoration destined to attract the best class of art customers to his establishment. From the centre of the Place Gaillon could be seen this oriental saloon, composed solely of carpets and door curtains, which had been hung under his orders. The ceiling was covered with a quantity of Smyrna carpets, the complicated designs of which stood out boldly on a red ground. Then from each side there hung Syrian and Carmanian door curtains, speckled with green, yellow, and vermilion. The Arbekir door-curtains of a commoner type, rough to the touch, like shepherd's cloaks. Besides these, there were carpets which could be used as door-curtains and hangings. Long Ispahan, Teheran, and Karmancha rugs, the larger Shumaka and Madras carpets, a strange fluorescence of peonies and palms, the fancy let loose in a garden of dreams. On the floor were more carpets, a heap of grease fleeces, in the centre was an agra carpet, an extraordinary article with a white ground and a broad, delicate blue border, through which ran violet-coloured ornaments of exquisite design. Everywhere there was an immense display of marvellous fabrics. Mecca carpets with a velvety reflection, prayer carpets from Dagestan with a symbolic point, Kurdistan carpets covered with blossoming flowers, and finally, piled up in a corner, a heap of girdies, Koula and kercher rugs from fifteen francs apiece. This sumptuous pasha's tent was furnished with divans and armchairs, made with camel sacks, some ornamented with many-coloured lozenges, others with primitive roses. Turkey, Arabia, and the Indies were all there. They had emptied the palaces, plundered the mosques and bazaars. A barbarous gold tone prevailed in the weft of the old carpets, the faded tints of which still preserved a sombre warmth as of an extinguished furnace, a beautiful burnt hue suggestive of the old masters. Visions of the East floated beneath the luxury of this barbarous art, amid the strong odour which the old wolves had retained of the country of vermin and of the rising sun. 
In the morning at eight o'clock, when Denise, who was to commence on that very Monday, had crossed the Oriental Saloon, she stood there, lost in astonishment, unable to recognize the shop entrance, entirely overcome by this harem-like decoration planted at the door. A messenger having shown her to the top of the house, and handed her over to Madame Cabine, who cleaned and looked after the rooms, this person installed her in number seven, where her box had already been put. It was a narrow cell, opening on the roof by a skylight, furnished with a small bed, a walnut-wood wardrobe, a toilet-table, and two chairs. Twenty similar rooms ran along the convent-like corridor, painted yellow, and, out of the thirty-five young ladies in the house, the twenty who had no friends in Paris slept there, whilst the remaining fifteen lodged outside, a few with borrowed aunts and cousins. Denise at once took off her shabby woolen dress, worn thin by brushing and mended at the sleeves, the only one she had brought from Valence. She then put on the uniform of her department, a black silk dress, which had been altered for her and which she found ready on the bed. This dress was still too large, too wide across the shoulders, but she was so hurried in her emotion that she paid no heed to these details of coquetry. She had never worn silk before. When she went downstairs again, dressed up, uncomfortable, she looked at the shining skirt, feeling ashamed of the noisy rustling of the silk. Down below, as she was entering her department, a quarrel burst out. She heard Clara say in a shrill voice, "'Madame, I came in before her.' "'It isn't true,' replied Marguerite. She pushed past me at the door, but I had already one foot in the room. It was for the inscription of the list of turns, which regulated the sales. The saleswoman wrote their names on a slate in the order of their arrival, and whenever one of them had served a customer, she rewrote her name beneath the others. Madame Aurélie finished by deciding in Marguerite's favour. "'Always some injustice here,' muttered Clara furiously. But Denise's entry reconciled these young ladies. They looked at her, then smiled to each other. How could a person truss herself up in that way? The young girl went and awkwardly wrote her name on the list, where she found herself last. Meanwhile, Madame Aurélie was examining her with an anxious face. She could not help saying, "'My dear, too like you could get into your dress. You must have it taken in. Besides, you don't know how to dress yourself. Come here and let me arrange you a bit.' and she placed herself before one of the tall glasses alternating with the doors of the cupboards containing the dresses. The vast apartment, surrounded by these glasses and the woodwork in carved oak, the floor covered with red Wilton carpet of a large pattern, resembled the commonplace drawing-room of an hotel, traversed by a continual stream of travellers. The young ladies completed the resemblance, dressed in the regulation silk, promenading their commercial charms about, without ever sitting down on the dozen chairs reserved for the customers. All wore between two buttonholes of the body of their dresses, as if stuck in their bosoms. A long pencil, with its point in the air, and half out of their pockets, could be seen the white cover of the book of debit notes. Several risked wearing jewellery, rings, brooches, chains, but their great coquetry, the luxury they all struggled for in the forced uniformity of their dress, was their bare hair quantities of it, augmented by plaits and chignons when their own did not suffice, combed, curled, and decked out in every way. "'Pull the waist down in front,' said Madame Aurélie. "'There, you have now no hump on your back. And your hair, how can you massacre it like that? It would be superb if you only took a little trouble.' This was, in fact, Denise's only beauty. Of a beautiful flaxen hue, it fell down to her ankles, and when she did it up, it was so troublesome that she simply rolled it in a knot, keeping it together under the strong teeth of a bone comb. Clara, greatly annoyed by this head of hair, affected to laugh at it, so strange did it look, twisted up anyhow in its savage grace. She made a sign to a saleswoman in the underlinen department, a girl with a large face and agreeable manner. The two departments, which were close together, were in continual hostility, but the young ladies sometimes joined together in laughing at other people. "'Mademoiselle Cunot, just look at that mane,' said Clara, whom Marguerite was nudging, feigning also to be on the point of bursting out laughing. But Mademoiselle Cunot was not in the humour for joking. She had been looking at Denise for a moment, and she remembered what she had suffered herself during the first few months of her arrival in the establishment. "'Well, what?' said she. "'Everybody hasn't got a mane like that.' and she returned to her place, 
leaving the two others very crestfallen. Denise, who had heard all, followed her with a look of thanks, while Madame Aurélie gave our heroine a book of debit notes with her name on it, saying, "'Tomorrow you'll get yourself up better. And, now, try and pick up the ways of the house. Wait your turn for selling. Today's work will be very hard. We shall be able to judge of your capabilities.' However, the department still remained deserted. Very few customers came up at this early hour. The young ladies reserved themselves, prudently preparing for the fatigues of the afternoon. Denise, intimidated by the thought that they were watching her, sharpened her pencil for the sake of something to do. Then, imitating the others, she stuck it into her bosom, between two buttonholes, and summoned up all her courage, determined to conquer a position. The previous evening they had told her she entered as a probationer, that is to say, without any fixed salary. She would simply have the commission and a certain allowance on everything she sold. But she fully hoped to earn twelve hundred francs a year in this way, knowing that the good saleswoman earned as much as two thousand when they liked to take the trouble. Her expenses were regulated. A hundred francs a month would enable her to pay Pepe's board and lodging, assist Jean, who did not earn a sou, and procure some clothes and linen for herself. But, in order to attain this large sum, she would have to show herself industrious and pushing, taking no notice of the ill-will displayed by those around her, fighting for her share, even snatching it from her comrades if necessary. As she was thus working herself up for the struggle, a tall young man, passing the department, smiled at her, and when she saw it was the Lange, who had been engaged in the lace department the previous day, she returned his smile, happy at the friendship which thus presented itself accepting this smile as a good omen. At half-past nine a bell rang for the first luncheon, then a fresh peal announced a second, and still no customers appeared. The second hand, Madame Frédéric, who, in her disagreeable widow's harshness, delighted in prophesying disasters, declared in short sentences that the day was lost, that they would not see a soul, that they might close the cupboards and go away, predictions which darkened Marguerite's flat face she being a girl who looked sharp after her profits, whilst Clara, with her runaway horse appearance, was already dreaming of an excursion to de Verrières woods, if the house failed. As for Madame Morali, she was there, silent and serious, promenading her Caesar-like mask about the empty department, like a general who has a certain responsibility in victory and in defeat. About eleven o'clock a few ladies appeared. Denise's turn for serving had arrived. Just at that moment a customer came up. A fat old girl from the country, murmured Marguerite. It was a woman of forty-five, who occasionally journeyed to Paris from the depths of some out-of-the-way place. There she saved up for months. Then, hardly out of the train, she made straight for the ladies' paradise, and spent all her savings. She very rarely ordered anything by letter. She liked to see and handle the goods, and laid in a stock of everything, even down to needles— which she said were excessively dear in her small town. The whole staff knew her, that her name was Boutarel, and that she lived in Albi, but troubled no further about her, neither about her position nor her mode of life. "'How do you do, madam?' graciously asked Madame Aurélie, who had come forward. "'And what can we show you? You shall be attended to at once.' Then, turning round, "'Now, young ladies!' Denise approached, but Clara had sprung forward. As a rule, she was very careless and idle, not caring about the money she earned in the shop, as she could get plenty outside without trouble. But the idea of doing the newcomer out of a good customer spurred her on. "'I beg your pardon. It's my turn,' said Denise indignantly. Madame Aurélie set her aside with a severe look, saying, "'There are no turns. I alone am mistress here. Wait till you know before serving our regular customers.' The young girl retired and as the tears were coming in her eyes, and she wished to conceal this excess of sensibility, she turned her back, standing up before the window, pretending to be looking into the street. Were they going to prevent her selling? Would they all arrange together to deprive her of the important sales like that? A fear for the future seized her, she felt herself crushed between so many interests let loose. Yielding to the bitterness of her abandonment, her forehead against the cold glass, she gazed at the old Elbaf opposite, thinking she ought to have implored her uncle to keep her. Perhaps he himself regretted his decision, for he seemed to her greatly affected the previous evening. Now she was quite alone in this vast house, where no one liked her, 
where she found herself hurt, lost. Pepe and Sean, who had never left her side, were living with strangers. It was a cruel separation, and the big tears which she kept back made the street dance in a sort of fog. All this time the hum of voices continued behind her. "'This one makes me look a fright,' Madame Boutarel was saying. "'You really make a mistake, madame,' said Clara. "'The shoulders fit perfectly, but perhaps you would prefer a pelisse to a mantle.' But Denise started. A hand was laid on her arm. Madame Moralie addressed her severely. "'Well, you're doing nothing now, eh? Only looking at the people passing. Things can't go on this way, you know.' "'But they prevent me selling, madame.' "'Oh, there's other work for you, mademoiselle. Begin at the beginning. Do the folding up.' In order to please the few customers who had called, they had been obliged to ransack all the cupboards, and on the two long oaken tables, to the right and to the left, were heaps of mantles, pelisses, and capes, garments of all sizes and all materials. Without replying, Denise set about sorting them, folding them carefully and arranging them again in the cupboards. This was the lowest work, generally performed by beginners. She ceased to protest, knowing that they required the strictest obedience, waiting till the first hand should be good enough to let her sell, as she seemed at first to have the intention of doing. She was still folding when Moret appeared on the scene. This was a violent shock for her. She blushed without knowing why. She felt as invaded by a strange fear, thinking he was going to speak to her. But he did not even see her. He no longer remembered this little girl, whom the charming impression of an instant had induced him to support. "'Madame Moralie,' called he in a brief voice. He was rather pale, but his eyes were clear and resolute. In making the tour of the departments he had found them empty, and the possibility of a defeat had suddenly presented itself in the midst of his obstinate faith in fortune. True, it was only eleven o'clock. He knew by experience that the crowd never arrived much before the afternoon but certain symptoms troubled him. At the previous sales, a general movement had taken place from the morning even. Besides, he did not see any of those bareheaded women, customers living in the neighbourhood, who usually dropped into his shop as into a neighbour's. Like all great captains, he felt at the moment of giving battle a superstitious weakness, notwithstanding his habitually resolute attitude. Things would not go on well, he was lost, and he could not have explained why. He thought he could read his defeat on the faces of the passing ladies, even. Just at that moment, Madame Boutarel, she who always bought something, was going away, saying, "'No, you have nothing that pleases me. I'll see. I'll decide later on.' Moret watched her depart. Then, as Madame Moralie ran up at his call, he took her aside, and they exchanged a few rapid words. She wore a despairing air, and was evidently admitting that things were looking bad. For a moment they remained face to face, seized with one of those doubts which generals conceal from their soldiers. Ultimately he said out loud in his brave way, "'If you want assistance, understand, take a girl from the workroom. She'll be a little help to you.' He continued his inspection in despair. He had avoided Bordoncle all the morning, for his anxious doubts irritated him. On leaving the underlinen department, where business was still worse, he dropped right on to him, and was obliged to submit to the expression of his fears. He did not hesitate to send him to the devil, with the brutality that even his principal employees came in for when things were looking bad. "'Get out of my way,' said he. "'Everything is going on all right. I shall end by pitching out the tremblers.' Moret planted himself alone on the landing of the hall staircase. From there he commanded the whole shop, around him the departments on the first floor, beneath those on the ground floor, above— the emptiness seemed heartbreaking. In the lace department, an old woman was having everything turned over and buying nothing, whilst three good-for-nothing minxes in the underlinen department were slowly choosing some colours at eighteen sous. Down below, under the covered galleries, in the ray of light which came in from the street, he noticed that the customers were commencing to get more numerous. It was a slow, broken procession, a promenade before the counters. In the mercery and the haberdashery departments, some women of the commoner class were pushing about, but there was hardly a customer in the linen or in the woollen departments. The shop messengers, in their green coats, the buttons of which shone brilliantly, were waiting for customers, their hands dangling about. 
Now and again there passed an inspector with a ceremonious air, very stiff in his white necktie. Moret was especially grieved by the mortal silence which reigned in the hall, where the light fell from above from a ground-glass window, showing a white dust, diffuse and suspended, as it were, under which the silk department seemed to be sleeping, amid a shivering religious silence. A shopman's footstep, a few whispered words, the rustling of a passing skirt, were the only noises heard, and they were almost stifled by the hot air of the heating apparatus. However, carriages began to arrive, the sudden pulling up of the horses was heard, and immediately after the banging of the carriage doors. Outside, a distant tumult was commencing to make itself heard. Groups of idlers were pushing in front of the windows. Cabs were taking up their positions in the Place Gaillon. There were all the appearances of an approaching crowd. But on seeing the idle cashiers leaning back on their chairs behind their wickets, and observing that the parcel tables with their boxes of string and reams of blue packing paper remained unoccupied, Moret, though indignant with himself for being afraid, thought he felt his immense machine stop and turn cold beneath him. "'I say, Favier, murmured Houtin, "'look at the governor up there. He doesn't seem to be enjoying himself.' "'This is a rotten shop,' replied Favier. "'Just fancy, I have not sold a thing yet.' Both of them, waiting for customers, whispered such short remarks from time to time without looking at each other. The other salesmen of the department were occupied in arranging large bales of the Paris Paradise, under Robineau's orders, whilst Boutemont, in full consultation with a thin young woman, seemed to be taking an important order. Around them, on frail and elegant shelves, the silks, folded in long pieces of creamy paper, were heaped up like pamphlets of an unusual size, and, encumbering the counters, were fancy silks, moire, satins, velvets, presenting the appearance of mown flowers, quite a harvest of delicate precious tissues. This was the most elegant of all the departments, a veritable drawing-room, where the goods, so light and airy, were nothing but a luxurious furnishing. "'I must have a hundred francs by Sunday,' said Houtin. "'If I don't make an average of twelve francs a day, I'm lost. I'd reckon on this sale.' "'By Jove! A hundred francs, that's rather stiff,' said Favier. "'I only want fifty or sixty. You must go in for swell women, then.' "'Oh, no, my dear fellow!' It's a stupid affair, I made a bet and lost, so I have to stand a dinner for five persons, two fellows and three girls. Hang me. The first one that passes I let her in for twenty yards of Paris Paradise. They continued talking for several minutes, relating what they had done the previous day, and what they intended to do the next week. Favier did a little betting, Houtard did a little boating, and kept music-hall singers. But they were both possessed by the same desire for money, struggling for it all the week and spending it all on sunday it was their sole preoccupation in the shop an hourly and pitiless struggle and that cunning boutemont had just managed to get hold of madame souvent's messenger the skinny woman with whom he was talking good business three or four dozen pieces at least for the celebrated dressmaker always gave good orders at that moment robineau took it into his head to do favier out of a customer Oh. "'As for that fellow, we must settle up with him,' said Houtin, who took advantage of the slightest thing in order to stir up the salesman against the man whose place he covered it. "'Ought the first and second hands to sell? My word of honour! My dear fellow, if ever I become second, you'll see how well I shall act with the others.' And all his little Norman person, so fat and jolly, played the good-natured man energetically. Favier could not help casting a side-glance towards him, but he preserved his phlegmatical air contenting himself with replying yes i know i should be only too pleased then as a lady came up he added in a lower tone look out here's one for you it was a lady with a blotchy face a yellow bonnet and a red dress hutar immediately recognized in her a woman who would buy nothing he quickly stooped behind the counter pretending to be doing up his bootlace and thus concealed he murmured no fear, let some one else take care. I don't want to lose my turn. However, Robineau called out, Whose turn, gentlemen? Monsieur Hortense. Where is Monsieur Hortense? And as this gentleman still gave no reply, it was the next salesman who served the lady with the blotches. Hortense was right. She simply wanted some samples with the prices, and she kept the salesman more than ten minutes, overwhelming him with questions. However, Robineau had seen Hortense get up from behind the counter, 
so that when another customer arrived he interfered with a stern air, stopping the young man who was rushing forward. "'Your turn is past. I called you, and as you were there behind—' "'But I didn't hear you, sir.' "'That'll do. Write your name at the bottom. Now, Monsieur Favier, it's your turn.' Favier, greatly amused at heart at this adventure, threw a glance at his friend, as if to excuse himself. Hutin, with pale lips, had turned his head away. What enraged him was that he knew the customer very well, an adorable blonde who often came to their department, of whom the salesmen called amongst themselves, the pretty lady, knowing nothing of her, not even her name. She bought a great deal, had her purchases taken to a carriage, and immediately disappeared. Tall, elegant, dressed with exquisite taste, she appeared to be very rich, and to belong to the best society. "'Well, and your courtesan?' asked Hutin of Favier, when the latter returned from the pay-desk where he had accompanied the lady. "'Oh, a courtesan,' replied the other. "'I fancy she looks too ladylike for that. She must be the wife of a stockbroker, or a doctor, or something of that sort.' "'Don't tell me. It's a courtesan. With their grand lady airs, it's impossible to tell nowadays.' Favier looked at his book of debit notes. "'I don't care,' said he. "'I've stuck her for two hundred and ninety-three francs. That makes nearly three francs for me.' Hutard bit his lips, and vented his spleen on the debit notebooks. Another invention for cramming their pockets. There was a secret rivalry between these two. Favier, as a rule, pretended to sing small, to recognise Hutard's superiority, but in reality devouring him all the while behind his back.' Thus Hutin was wild at the thought of the three francs pocketed so easily by a salesman whom he considered to be his inferior in business. A fine day's work! If it went on like this he would not earn enough to pay for the seltzer water for his guests. And in the midst of the battle, which was now becoming fiercer, he walked along the counters with hungry eyes, eager for his share, jealous even of his superior, who was just showing the thin young woman out and saying to her, "'Very well. It understood?' Tell her I'll do my very best to obtain this favour from Monsieur Moret. End of chapter 4, part 1Suddenly he reappeared on the landing of the principal staircase which communicated with the ground floor, and from there he commanded a view of the whole establishment. His face had regained its colour, his faith was restored and increasing before the crowd which was gradually filling the place. It was the expected rush at last, the afternoon crush, which he had for a moment despaired of. All the shopmen were at their posts, a last ring of the bell had announced the end of the third lunch. The disastrous morning, due no doubt to a shower which fell about nine o'clock, could still be repaired, for the blue sky of early morn had resumed its victorious gaiety. Now that the first-floor departments were becoming animated, he was obliged to stand back, to make way for the women who were going up to the underclothing and dress departments, whilst, behind him, in the lace and the shawl departments, he heard large sums banded about. But the sight of the galleries on the ground floor especially reassured him. There was a crowd at the haberdashery department, and even the linen and woollen departments were invaded. The procession of buyers closed up, nearly all of a higher class at present, with a few lingering housewives. Under the pale light of the silk hall, ladies had taken off their gloves to feel the Paris paradise, talking in half whispers. And there was no longer any mistaking the noises arriving from outside, rolling of cabs, banging of carriage doors, an increasing tumult in the crowd. He felt the machine commencing to work under him, getting up steam and reviving, from the pay-desks where the money was jingling, and the tables where the messengers were hurriedly packing up the goods, down to the basement, in the delivery room, which was quickly filling up with the parcels sent down, and the underground rumbling of which seemed to shake the whole house. In the midst of the crowd was the inspector, Jove, walking about gravely, watching for thieves. "'Hello, is that you?' said Moret all at once, recognising Paul de Valangeusque, whom a messenger had conducted to him. "'No, no, you are not in my way. Besides, you've only to follow me if you want to see everything, for today I stay at the breach.' He still felt anxious. 
No doubt there were plenty of people, but would the sale prove to be the triumph he hoped for? However, he laughed with Paul, carrying him off gaily. "'It seems to be picking up a bit,' said Hutin to Favier. "'But somehow I've no luck. There are some days that are precious bad, my word. I've just made another mess. That old frump hasn't bought anything.' and he glanced towards a lady who was walking off, casting looks of disgust at all the goods. He was not likely to get fat on his thousand francs a year unless he sold something. As a rule, he made seven or eight francs a day commission, which gave him with his regular pay an average of ten francs a day. Favier never made much more than eight, and there was this animal taking the bread out of his mouth, for he had just sold another dress, a cold-natured fellow who had never known how to amuse a customer. It was exasperating. "'Those chaps over there seem to be doing very well,' remarked Favier, speaking of the salesmen in the hoisery and haberdashery departments. But Hutin, who was looking all round the place, suddenly asked, "'Do you know Madame de Fauche, the governor's sweetheart? Look, that dark woman in the glove department, who is having some gloves tried on by Mignon.' He stopped, then resumed in a low tone, as if speaking to Mignon, on whom he continued to keep his eyes. Oh, go on, old man. You may pull her fingers about as much as you like. That won't do you any good. We know your conquests. There was a rivalry between himself and the glove man, the rivalry of two handsome fellows, who both affected to flirt with the lady customers. As a matter of fact, they had neither had any real conquests to boast about. Mignon lived on the legend of a police superintendent's wife, who had fallen in love with him, while Soutar had really conquered a lace-maker, who had got tired of wandering about in the doubtful hotels in the neighbourhood. But they invented a lot of mysterious adventures, leading people to believe in all sorts of appointments made by titled ladies between two purchases. "'You should get a hold of her,' said Favier, in his sly, artful way. "'That's a good idea,' exclaimed Titan. "'If she comes here, I'll let her in for something extensive. I want a five-franc piece.' In the glove department, quite a row of ladies were seated before the narrow counter covered with green velvet and edged with nickel silver, and the smiling shopmen were heaping up before them the flat boxes of a bright red, taken out of the counter itself, and resembling the ticketed drawers of a secretaire. Mignon especially was bending his pretty doll-like face over his customer, his thick Parisian voice full of tender inflections. He had already sold Madame de Fauche a dozen pairs of kid gloves, the paradise gloves, one of the specialities of the house. She then took three pairs of Swedish, and was now trying on some Saxon gloves, for fair the size should not be exact. "'Oh, quite perfect, madame,' repeated Mignon. Six and a quarter would be too large for a hand like yours.' Half lying on the counter, he was holding her hand, taking the fingers one by one, slipping the glove on with a long, renewed, and persistently caressing air looking at her as if he expected to see in her face the signs of voluptuous joy. But she, with her elbow on the velvet counter, her wrist raised, gave him her fingers with the unconcerned air with which she gave her foot to her maid to allow her to button her boot. For her he was not a man. She employed him for such private work with the familiar disdain she showed for the people in her service, without looking at him even. "'I don't hurt you, madam,' she replied. "'No.' with a shake of the head. The smell of the Saxon gloves, that savage smell as of sugared musk, troubled her as a rule, and she sometimes laughed about it, confessing her taste for this equivocal perfume, in which there is a suspicion of the wild beast fallen into some girl's power-box. But seated at this commonplace counter, she did not notice the smell of the gloves. It raised no sensual feeling between her and this salesman doing his work. "'And what's next, madam?' "'Nothing, thanks. Be good enough to carry the parcel to the pay-desk number ten for Madame de Fauche. Being a constant costumer, she gave her name at a pay-desk, and had each purchase sent there without wanting a shopman to follow her. When she had gone away, Mignot turned towards his neighbour and winked, and would have liked him to believe that wonderful things had just taken place. "'By Jove! I'd like to dress her all over,' said he, coarsely. Meanwhile, Madame de Fauche continued her purchases. She turned to the left, stopping in the linen department to procure some dusters. Then she walked round the shop, going as far as the woollen department at the further end of the gallery. 
as she was satisfied with her cook, she wanted to make her a present of a dress. The woollen department overflowed with a compact crowd, all the lower middle class women were there, feeling the stuff, absorbed in mute calculations, and she was obliged to sit down for a moment. The shelves were piled up with great rolls of stuff, which salesmen were taking down one by one, with a sudden pull. They were beginning to get confused with these encumbered counters, on which the stuffs were mixing up and tumbling over each other. It was a rising tide of neutral tints, heavy woollen tones, iron grace and blue grace, with here and there a scotch tartan, and a blood-red ground of flannel breaking out. And the white tickets on the pieces were like a shower of rare white flakes falling on a black December soil. Behind a pile of poplin, Leonard was joking with a tall girl without hat or bonnet, a work girl, sent by her mistress to match a merino. He detested these big sale days, which tired him to death, and he endeavoured to shirk his work, getting plenty of money from his father, not caring a fig about the business, doing just enough to avoid being dismissed. "'Listen to me, Mademoiselle Fanny,' he was saying. "'You are always in a hurry. Did the striped Vicugna do the other day? I shall come and see you and ask for my commission.' But the girl escaped, laughing, and Leonard found himself before Madame de Fauche, whom he could not help asking— "'What can I serve you with, madame?' She wanted a dress, not too dear, but yet strong. Leonard, with a view of sparing his arms, which was his principal care, manoeuvred to make her take one of the stuffs already unfolded on the counter. There were cashmeres, serges, vicugnas, and he declared that there was nothing better to be had, than never wore out. But none of these seemed to satisfy her. On one of the shelves she had observed a blue serge, which she wished to see. He made up his mind at last, and took down the roll, but she thought it too rough. Then he showed her a chevillon, some diagonal, some grace, every sort of woollens, which she felt out of curiosity, for the pleasure of doing so, decided at heart to take no matter what. The young man was thus obliged to empty the highest shelves. His shoulders cracked, the counter had disappeared under the silky grains of the cashmeres and poplins, the rough nap of the chevillon, and the tufty down of the vicugna. There were samples of every material and every tint. Though she had not the least wish to buy any, she asked to see some grenadine, and some chambery gauze. Then, when she had seen enough, she said, "'Oh, after all, the first is the best. It's for my cook. Yes, the serge, the one or two francs.' And when Leonard had measured it, pale with suppressed anger, she added, "'Have the goodness to carry that to pay-desk number ten, for Madame de Forges.' Just as she was going away, she recognised Madame Marty close to her, accompanied by her daughter Valentine, a tall girl of fourteen, thin and bold, who was already casting a woman's covetous looks on the goods. "'Ah, it's you, dear madame.' "'Yes, dear madame. What a crowd, eh?' "'Oh, don't speak of it. It's stifling. And such a success. Have you seen the Oriental Saloon?' "'Superb! Wonderful!' and amidst the pushing and crushing of the growing crowd of modest purses, eagerly seeking the cheap linens in the woollen goods, they went into ecstasies over the exhibition of carpets. Then Madame Marty explained she was looking for some material for a mantle, but she was not quite decided. She wanted to see some check patterns. "'Look, Mamma," murmured Valentine, "'it's too common.' "'Come to the silk department,' said Madame de Fauche, you must see their famous Paris paradise. Madame Marty hesitated for a moment. It would be very dear, and she had faithfully promised her husband to be careful. She had been buying for an hour, quite a pile of articles were following her already, a muff and some cuffs and collars for herself, some stockings for her daughter. She finished by saying to the shopman who was showing her the cheques, Well, no, I am going to the silk department. You've nothing to suit me. The shopman took the articles and walked before the ladies. In the silk department there was also a crowd, the principal crush being opposite the inside display, arranged by Hutin, and to which Moret had given the finishing touches. It was at the further end of the hall, around one of the small wrought iron columns, which supported a glass roof, a veritable torrent of stuffs, a puffy sheet falling from above and spreading out down to the floor. At first stood out the light satins and tender silks, the satins a la reine and the renaissance, with the pearly tones of spring water. 
light silks transparent as crystals nile green indian azure may rose and danube blue then came the stronger fabrics marvellous satins duchess silks warm tints rolling in great waves and right at the bottom as in a fountain basin reposed the heavy stuffs the figured silks the damasks brocades and lovely silvered silks in the midst of a deep bed of velvet of every sort black white and coloured skilfully disposed on silk and satin grounds hollowing out with their medley of colours a still lake in which the reflex of the sky seemed to be dancing the women pale with desire bent over as if to look at themselves and before this fallen cataract they had all remained standing with the secret fear of being carried away by the eruption of such luxury and with the irresistible desire to jump in amidst it and be lost here you are then said madame de forges on finding madame bordelais installed before a counter ah good morning replied the latter shaking hands with the ladies yes i have come to have a look what a prodigious exhibition it's like a dream and the oriental saloon have you seen the oriental saloon yes yes extraordinary but beneath this enthusiasm which was to be decidedly the fashionable note of the day madame bordelais retained her practical housekeeper's coolness she was carefully examining a piece of paris paradise for she had come on purpose to take advantage of the exceptional cheapness of this silk if she found it really advantageous she was doubtless satisfied with it for she took twenty-five yards hoping it would be sufficient to make a dress for herself and a cloak for her little girl what you are going already resumed madame de forges take a walk round with us no thanks they are waiting for me at home i didn't like to risk bringing the children into this crowd and she went away preceded by the salesman carrying the twenty-five yards of silk and who led her to pay-desk number ten where young albert was getting confused with all the demands for bills with which he was besieged when the salesman was able to approach after having inscribed his sale on the debit note he called out the item which the cashier entered in a register then it was checked over and the leaf torn off the salesman's book of debit notes was stuck on a file near the recepting stamp one hundred and forty francs said albert madame bordelais paid and gave her address for having come on foot she did not wish to be troubled with the parcel joseph had already got the silk behind the pay-desk and was tying it up and the parcel thrown into a basket on wheels was sent down to the delivery department where all the goods in the shop seemed to be swallowed up with a sluice-like noise meanwhile the block was becoming so great in the silk department that madame de forges and madame marty could not at first find the salesman disengaged they remained standing mingling with a crowd of ladies who were looking at the silks and feeling them staying there hours without making up their minds but the paris paradise was a great success around it pressed one of those crowds which decides the fortune of a fashion in a day a host of shopmen were engaged in measuring off this silk one could see above the customers heads the pale glimmer of the unfolded pieces in the continual coming and going of the fingers along the oak yard meshes hanging from brass rods one could hear the noise of the scissors cutting the silk without ceasing as the sale went on as if there were not enough shopmen to suffice for all the greedy outstretched hands of the customers it really isn't bad for five francs twelve sous said madame de forges who had succeeded in getting hold of a piece at the edge of the table madame marty and her daughter experienced a disappointment the newspaper had said so much about it that they had expected something stronger and more brilliant but boutemont had just recognized madame de forges and in order to get in the good graces of such a handsome lady who was supposed to be all-powerful with the governor he came up with his rather coarse amiability what no one was serving her it was unpardonable he begged her to be indulgent for really they did not know which way to turn and he went to look for some chairs among the neighbouring skirts laughing with his good-natured laugh full of a brutal love for the sex which did not seem to displease henriette i say murmured favier on going to take some velvet from a shelf behind hutin there's boudemont making up to your mash Hutard had forgotten Madame de Forge, beside himself with rage with an old lady, who, after having kept him a quarter of an hour, had finished by buying a yard of black satin for a pair of stays. In the busy moments they took no notice of the turns, each salesman served the customers as they arrived. 
and he was answering Madame Boutarel, who was finishing her afternoon at the Ladies' Paradise, where she had already spent three hours in the morning, when Favier's warning made him start. Was he going to miss the governor's friend, from whom he had sworn to draw a five-franc piece? That would be the height of ill-luck, for he hadn't made three francs as yet, with all those other chignons who were mooning about the place. Boutemont was just then calling out loudly, "'Come, gentlemen, some one this way!' Hutin passed Madame Boutarel over to Robinon, who was doing nothing. "'Here is the second hand, madame. He will answer you better than I can.' And he rushed off to take Madame Marty's purchases from the woollen salesman who had accompanied the ladies. That day a nervous excitement must have troubled his delicate scent. As a rule, the first glance told him if a customer would buy, and how much. Then he domineered over the customer, he hastened to serve her to pass on to another, imposing his choice on her, persuading her that he knew best what material she wanted. "'What sort of silk, madame?' asked he in his most gallant manner. Madame de Fourche had no sooner opened her mouth than he added, "'I know, I've got just what you want.' When the piece of Paris Paradise was unfolded on a narrow corner of the counter, between heaps of other silks, Madame Marty and her daughter approached. Hutin, rather anxious, understood that it was at first a question of serving these two. Whispered words were exchanged. Madame de Fourche was advising her friend. "'Oh, certainly,' murmured she. "'A silk at five francs twelve sous will never be equal to one at fifteen, or even ten. "'It is very light,' repeated Madame Marty. "'I'm afraid that it has not sufficient body for a mantle.' This remark induced the salesman to intervene. He smiled with the exaggerated politeness of a man who cannot make a mistake. "'But, madame, flexibility is the chief quality of this silk. It will not crumple. It's exactly what you want.' Impressed by such an assurance, the ladies said no more. They had taken the silk up, and were examining it again, when they felt a touch on their shoulders. It was Madame Guibal, who had been slowly walking about the shop for an hour past, feasting her eyes on the heaped-up riches, without buying even a yard of calico and there was another explosion of gossip. "'What? Is that you?' "'Yes, it is me. Rather knocked about, though.' "'What a crowd, eh? One can't get about. And the Oriental Saloon? Ravishing! Good heavens! What a success! Stay a moment. We will go upstairs together.' "'No, thanks. I've just come down.' Hutar was waiting, concealing his impatience with a smile that did not quit his lips." Were they going to keep in there long? Really, the women took things very coolly. It was like taking his money out of his pocket. At last, Madame Guibal went away, and continued her stroll, turning round the splendid display of silks with an enraptured air. "'If I were you, I should buy the mantle ready-made,' said Madame de Fauche, suddenly returning to the Paris Paradise. "'It won't cost you so much.' "'It's true that the trimmings and making up,' murmured Madame Marty. "'Besides,' one has more choice. All three had risen. Madame de Fauche turned to Hutin, saying, Have the goodness to show us to the ready-made department. He remained dumbfounded, not being used to such defeats. What? The dark lady bought nothing. Had he then made a mistake? He abandoned Madame Marty and attacked Madame de Fauche, trying his powerful abilities as salesman on her. "'And you, madame, would you not like to see our satins, our velvets? We have some extraordinary bargains.' "'Thanks. Another time,' replied she coolly, not looking at him any more than she had at Mignon. Hutin had to take up Madame Marty's purchases, and walk before the ladies to show them to the ready-made department. But he had also the grief of seeing that Robineau was selling Madame Bourtarel a good quantity of silk. Decidedly his scent was playing him false. He wouldn't make four sous. Beneath the amiable correctness of his manners, there was the rage of a man being robbed and swallowed up by the others. "'On the first floor, ladies,' said he, without ceasing to smile. It was not easy to get to the staircase. A compact crowd of heads was surging under the galleries, expanding like an overflowing river into the middle of the hall. Quite a battle of business was going on. The salesmen had this population of women at their mercy, passing them from one to the other with feverish haste. The moment of the formidable afternoon rush had arrived, when the overheated machine led the dance of customers, drawing the money from their very flesh. In the silk department especially, 
a breath of folly seemed to pervade all the paris paradise collected such a crowd that for several minutes hutin could not advance a step and henriette half suffocated having raised her eyes beheld moret at the top of the stairs his favourite position from which she could see the victory she smiled hoping that he would come down and extricate her but he did not even recognise her in the crowd he was still with valangeosk showing him the house his face beaming with triumph end of chapter 4 part 2section 9 of the lady's paradise by emile sola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain read by christine g chapter 4 part 3 the trepidation within was now stifling all outside noise one no longer heard the rumbling of the vehicles nor the banging of the carriage doors nothing remained above the vast murmur of business but the sentiment of this enormous paris of such immensity that it would always furnish buyers in the heavy still air in which the fumes of the heating apparatus warned the odour of the stuffs the hubbub increased made up of all sorts of noises of the continual walking about of the same phrases a hundred times repeated around the counters of the gold jingling of the brass of the pay desks besieged by a legion of purses and of the baskets on wheels loaded with parcels which were constantly disappearing into the gaping cellars and amidst the fine dust everything finished by getting mixed up it became impossible to recognize the divisions of the different departments the haberdashery department over there seemed drowned further on in the linen department a ray of sunshine entering by the window in the rue neuve saint augustine was like a golden dart in a heap of snow close by in the glove and woollen departments a dense mass of bonnets and chignons hid the background of the shop from view the toilettes were no longer visible the headdresses alone appeared decked with feathers and ribbons a few men's hats introduced here and there a black spot whilst the women's pale complexions assumed in the fatigue and heat the transparencies of the camellia. At last, Houtin, thanks to his vigorous elbows, was able to open a way for the ladies by keeping in front of them. But on ascending the stairs, Henriette could not find Moret, who had just plunged Valangeosque right into the crowd to complete his bewilderment, himself feeling the physical want of a dip into this bath of success. He lost his breath deliciously, he felt against his limbs a sort of caress from all his customers. "'To the left, ladies,' said Hutin, still attentive, notwithstanding his increasing exasperation. Up above there was the same block. It invaded even the furnishing department, usually the quietest. The shawl, the fur, and the underclothing departments swarmed with people. As the ladies were crossing the lace department, another meeting took place. Madame de Beauve was there with her daughter Blanche, both buried in the articles Deloche was showing them, and Hutin had to make another halt, bundle in hand. "'Good afternoon. I was just thinking of you. I've been looking for you myself, but how can you expect to find any one in this crowd? It's magnificent, isn't it? Dazzling, my dear. We can hardly stand. And you're buying? Oh, no, we're only looking round. It rests us a little to be seated.' As a fact, Madame de Beauve, scarcely possessing more than her cab fare in her purse, was having all sorts of laces handed down, simply for the pleasure of seeing and handling them. She had guessed Deloche to be a new salesman, slow and awkward, who dared not resist a customer's whims, and she took advantage of his bewildered good nature, and kept him there half an hour, still asking for fresh articles. The counter was covered, she dived her hands into this increasing mountain of lace, Malines, Valenciennes and Chantilly, her fingers trembling with desire, her face gradually warming with a sensual joy, whilst Blanche, close to her, agitated by the same passion, was very pale, her flesh inflated and soft. The conversation continued. Houtin, standing there waiting their good pleasure, could have slapped their faces. "'Ah!' said Madame Marty. "'You're looking at some cravats and handkerchiefs like those I showed you the other day.' It was true. Madame de Beauve, tormented by Madame Marty's lace since the previous Saturday, had been unable to resist the desire to at least handle some like it, as the allowance her husband made her did not permit her to carry any away. 
she blushed slightly, explaining that Blanche wanted to see the Spanish blonde cravats. Then she added, "'You're going to the ready-made department? Well, we'll see you again. Shall we say in the Oriental Saloon?' "'That's it, in the Oriental Saloon. Superb, isn't it?' And they separated enraptured, amidst the obstruction produced by the sale of the insertions and small trimmings at low prices. Deloche, glad to be occupied, recommenced emptying the boxes before the mother and daughter. And amidst the groups pressed along the counters, Jove, the inspector, was slowly walking about with his military air, displaying his decoration, watching over these fine and precious goods, so easy to conceal up a sleeve. When he passed behind Madame de Boeuf, surprised to see her with her arms plunged in such a heap of lace, he cast a quick glance at her feverish hands. "'To the right, ladies,' said Hutin, resuming his march. He was beside himself with rage. Was it not enough that he had missed a sail down below? Now they kept him waiting at each turning of the shop. And in his annoyance there was a strong feeling of the rancour existing between the textile departments and the ready-made departments, which were in continual hostility, fighting over the customers, stealing each other's percentage and commission. Those of the silk department were more enraged than those of the woollen, whenever they were obliged to show a lady to where the ready-made articles were kept, when she decided to take a mantle after looking at various sorts of silk. "'Mademoiselle Vadon,' said Hutin in an angry voice when he at last arrived in the department. But she passed by without listening, absorbed in the sale which she was conducting. The room was full, a stream of people were crossing it, coming in by the door of the lace department and going out by the door of the underclothing department, whilst to the right customers were trying on garments and posing before the glasses. The red carpet stifled the noise of the footsteps. The distant roar from the ground floor died away, giving place to a discreet murmur, a drawing-room warmth deadened by the crowd of women. "'Mademoiselle Prunet!' cried out Hutin. And as she took no notice either, he added between his teeth, so as not to be heard. "'A set of frights!' He certainly was not fond of them, tied to death as he was by climbing the stairs to bring them customers, furious at the profits which he accused them of taking out of his pocket. It was a secret war in which the young ladies themselves entered with equal fierceness, and in their mutual fatigue, always on foot, worked to death, all difference of sex disappeared, nothing remained but these contrary interests, irritated by the fever of business. "'So there is no one here to serve?' asked Hutin but he suddenly caught sight of Denise. They had kept her folding all the morning, only giving her a few doubtful customers to whom she had not sold anything. When he recognised her, occupied in clearing off the counter an enormous heap of garments, he ran up to her. "'Look here, mademoiselle. Serve these ladies who are waiting.' And he quickly slipped Madame Marty's purchases into her arms, tired of carrying them about the place." His smile returned, and in this smile there was the ill-natured expression of the experienced salesman, who shrewdly guessed into what an awkward position he had just thrown both the ladies and the young girl. The latter, however, remained quite troubled before this unhoped-for sale which suddenly presented itself. For the second time Hutin appeared to her like an unknown friend, fraternal and tender, always ready to spring out of darkness and save her. Her eyes glistened with gratitude. She followed him with a lingering look, whilst he was elbowing his way towards his department. "'I want a mantle,' said Madame Marty. Then Denise questioned her. What style of mantle? But the lady had no idea. She wished to see what the house had got. And the young girl, already very tired, bewildered by the crowd, lost her head. She had never served any but the rare customers who came to Canales at Valence. She didn't even know the number of the models, nor their places in the cupboards. She hardly knew how to reply to the ladies, who were beginning to lose patience, when Madame Aurélie perceived Madame de Fauche, of whose connection with Moray she was no doubt aware, for she hastened over and asked with a smile, "'Are these ladies being served?' "'Yes, that young person over there is attending to us,' replied Henriette. "'But she does not appear to be very well up to her work. She can't find anything.' At this, the first hand completely paralysed Denise by saying to her in a whisper, "'You see very well you know nothing. Don't interfere any more, please.' And turning round she called out, "'Mademoiselle Vadon, these ladies require a mantle.' She remained there whilst Marguerite showed the models. 
the girl assumed with the customers a dry polite voice the disagreeable attitude of a young person dressed up in silk with a sort of varnish of elegance of which she retained unknown to herself the jealousy and rancour when she heard madame marty say she did not wish to exceed two hundred francs she made a grimace of pity oh madame would give more it would be impossible to find anything respectable for two hundred francs and she threw some of the common mantles on a counter with a gesture which signified just see aren't they pitiful madame marty dared not think of them after that she bent over to murmur in madame de forge's air don't you prefer to be served by men one feels more comfortable at last marguerite brought a silk mantle trimmed with jet which she treated with more respect and madame oralie abruptly called denise come do something for your living just put that on your shoulders denise wounded to the heart despairing of ever succeeding in the house had remained motionless her hands hanging by her side no doubt she would be sent away and the children would be without food the tumult of the crowd burst in her head she felt herself tottering, her arms bruised by the handling of so many armfuls of garments, hard work which she had never done before. However, she was obliged to obey, and allow Marguerite to put the mantle on her, as on a dummy. "'Stand upright,' said Madame Moralie. But a moment after they forgot Denise. Moray had just come in with Valenchosque and Bourdoncle, and he bowed to the ladies, who complimented him on his magnificent exhibition of winter novelties." Of course they went into raptures over the oriental saloon. Valenchosk, who was finishing his walk round the countess, displayed more surprise than admiration. For, after all, thought he, in his pessimist supineness, it was nothing more than an immense collection of calico. Bourdoncle, forgetting that he belonged to the establishment, also congratulated the governor, to make him forget his anxious doubts and persecutions of the early part of the day. "'Yes, yes, things are going on very well. I am quite satisfied,' repeated Moray, radiant, replying with a smile to Madame de Fauche's tender looks. "'But I must not interrupt you, ladies.' Then all eyes were again fixed on Denise. She placed herself entirely in the hands of Marguerite, who was making her turn round slowly. "'What do you think of it, eh?' asked Madame Marty of Madame de Fauche. The latter gave her advice, like a supreme umpire of fashion." "'It isn't bad. The cut is original, but it doesn't seem to me very graceful about the figure.' "'Oh!' interrupted Madame Oralie. "'It must be seen on the lady herself. You can understand it does not look much on this young person, who is not very stout. Hold up your head, mademoiselle. Give it all its importance.' They smiled. Denise had turned very pale. She felt ashamed of being thus turned into a machine, which they were examining and joking about so freely. Madame de Fauche, yielding to the antipathy of a contrary nature, and annoyed by the young girl's sweet face, maliciously added, No doubt it would set better if the young person's dress were not so loose-fitting, and she cast at Moray the mocking look of a Parisian beauty, greatly amused by the absurd ridiculous dress of a country girl. He felt the amorous caress of this glance, the triumph of a woman proud of her beauty and of her art. Therefore, out of pure gratitude, the gratitude of a man who felt himself adored, he thought himself obliged to joke in his turn, notwithstanding his good will towards Denise, whose secret charm had conquered his gallant nature. "'Besides, her hair should be combed,' murmured he. This was the last straw. The director deigned to laugh. All the young ladies were bursting. Marguerite risked a slight chuckle, like a well-behaved girl who restrains herself. Clara had left a customer to enjoy the fun at her ease. Even the saleswomen from another department had come, attracted by the talking. As for the ladies, they took it more quietly, with an air of well-bred enjoyment. Madame Oralie was the only one who did not laugh, as if Denise's splendid wild-looking head of hair and elegant virginal shoulders had dishonoured her in the orderly well-kept department. The young girl had turned paler still, in the midst of all these people who were laughing at her. She felt herself violated, exposed to all their looks without a defence. What had she done that they should thus attack her thin figure and her too luxuriant hair? But she was especially wounded by Madame de Forges and Moray's laughter, instinctively divining their connection, her heart sinking with an unknown grief. This lady was very ill-natured to attack a poor girl who had said nothing, 
and as for Moray, he most decidedly froze her up with a sort of fear, before which all her other sentiments disappeared, without her being able to analyse them, and, totally abandoned, attacked in her most cherished womanly feelings of modesty, and shocked at their injustice, she was obliged to stifle the sobs which were rising in her throat. "'I should think so. Let her come her here to-morrow,' said the terrible Bordoncle to Madame Oralie. He had condemned Denise the first day she came, full of scorn for her small limbs. At last the first hand came and took the mantle of Denise's shoulders, saying to her in a low tone, "'Well, mademoiselle, here's a fine start. Really, if this is the way you show off your capabilities, impossible to be more stupid.' Denise, fearing the tears might gush from her, hastened back to the heap of garments, which she began to sort out on the counter. There at least she was lost in the crowd. Fatigue prevented her thinking, but she suddenly felt Pauline near her, a saleswoman in the underclothing department, who had already defended her that morning. The latter had followed the scene and murmured in Denise's ear, "'My poor child, don't be so sensitive. Keep that to yourself, or they'll go on worse and worse. I come from Chartres. "'Yes, exactly. Pauline Cugnot is my name, and my parents are Millis. "'Well, they would have devoured me the first few days if I had not stood up firm. "'Come, be brave. Give me your hand. We'll have a talk together whenever you like.' "'This hand held out redoubled to Denise's confusion. "'She shook it furtively, hastened to take up a load of cloaks, "'fearing to be doing wrong and to get a scolding if they knew she had a friend. "'However, Madame Oralie herself had just put a mantle on Madame Marty and they all exclaimed, "'Oh, how nice! Delightful!' It at once looked quite different. Madame de Fauche decided it would be impossible to improve on it. There was a good deal of bowing. Moray took his leave, whilst Wallangeosk, who had perceived Madame de Beauve and her daughter in the lace department, hastened to offer his arm to the mother. Marguerite, standing before one of the pay-desks, was already calling out the different purchases made by Madame Marty, who settled for them and ordered the parcel to be taken to her cab. Madame de Fauche had found her articles at pay-desk number ten. Then the ladies met once more in the Oriental saloon. They were leaving, but it was amidst a loquacious feeling of admiration. Even Madame Gibal became enthusiastic. "'Oh, delicious! Makes you think you are in the East, doesn't it?' "'A real harem, and not at all, dear!' And the Sminas, oh, the Sminas, what tones, what delicacy! And this courtesan, just look, a Delacroix. The crowd was slowly diminishing. The bell, at an hour's interval, had already announced the two first dinners. The third was about to be served, and in the departments there were now only a few lingering customers, whose fever for spending had made them forget the time. Outside, nothing was heard but the rolling of the last carriages amidst the husky voice of Paris, the snort of a satiated ogre digesting the linens and cloths, silk and lace, with which he had been gorged since the morning. Inside, beneath the flaming gas-jets, which, burning in the twilight, had lighted up the supreme efforts of the sale, everything appeared like a field of battle still warm with the massacre of the various goods. The salesmen, harassed and fatigued, camped amidst the contents of their shelves and counters, which appeared to have been thrown into the great confusion by the furious blast of a hurricane. It was with difficulty that one traversed the galleries on the ground floor, blocked up with a crowd of chairs, and in the glove department it was necessary to step over a pile of cases heaped up around Mignon. In the woollen department there was no means of passing it all. Leonard was dozing on a sea of bales, in which certain piles, still standing, though half destroyed, seemed to be houses that an overflowing river was carrying away. And, further on, the linen department was like a heavy fall of snow. One ran up against the icebergs of napkins, and walked on light flakes of handkerchiefs. The same disorder prevailed upstairs, in the departments of the first floor. The first was scattered over the flooring. The ready-made clothes were heaped up like the great coats of wounded soldiers, the lace and the underlinen, unfolded, crumpled, thrown about everywhere, made one think of an army of women who had disrobed there in the disorder of some sudden desire, whilst downstairs, at the other end of the house, the delivery department in full activity was still disgorging the parcels with which it was bursting, and which were carried off by the vans, last vibration of the overheated machine. 
but it was in the silk department especially that the customers had flung themselves with the greatest ardour. There they had been cleared off everything. There was plenty of room to pass. The hall was bare. The whole of the colossal stock of Paris Paradise had been cut up and carried away, as if by a swarm of devouring locusts. And in the midst of this emptiness, Houtin and Favier were running through the counterfoils of their debit notes, calculating their commission, still out of breath after the struggle. Favier had made fifteen francs, Houtin had only managed to make thirteen, thoroughly beaten that day, enraged at his bad luck. Their eyes sparkled with a passion for money. The whole shop around them was also adding up figures, glowing with the same fever, in the brutal gaiety of the evening of the battle. "'Well, Bourdoncle,' cried out Moret, "'are you trembling still?' He had returned to his favourite position at the top of the stairs of the first floor, against the balustrade, and, in the presence of the massacre of stuffs which was spread out under him, he indulged in a victorious laugh. His fears of the morning, that moment of unpardonable weakness, which nobody would ever know of, inspired him with a greater desire to triumph. The battle was definitely won, the small tradespeople of the neighbourhood were done for, and Baron Artemont was conquered, with his millions and his land. Whilst he was looking at the cashiers bending over their ledges, adding up long columns of figures, whilst he was listening to the sound of the gold falling from their fingers into the metal bowls, he already saw the ladies' paradise growing beyond all bounds, enlarging its hall, and prolonging its galleries as far as the Rue de Dix Décembre. "'And now are you convinced, Bourdoncle,' he resumed, "'that the house is really too small. We could have sold twice as much.' Bourdoncle humbled himself, enraptured, moreover, to find himself in the wrong. But a new spectacle rendered them grave. As was the custom every evening, Lhomme, the chief cashier, had just collected the receipts from each pay-desk. After having added them up, he usually posted up the total amount, after placing the paper on which it was written, on his file. He then took the receipts up to the chief cashier's office, in a leather case and in bags, according to the nature of the cash. On this occasion the gold and silver predominated, and he was slowly walking upstairs, carrying three enormous bags. Deprived of his right arm, cut off at the elbow, he clasped them in his left arm against his breast, holding one up with his chin to prevent it slipping. His heavy breathing could be heard at a distance. He passed along, staggering and superb amidst the respectful shopmen. "'How much, Lom? asked Moret. Eighty thousand seven hundred and forty-two francs, two sous,' replied the cashier. A joyous laugh stirred up the lady's paradise. The amount ran through the establishment. It was the highest figure ever attained in one day by a draper's shop. That evening, when Denise went up to bed, she was obliged to lean against the partition in the corridor under the sink roof. When in her room, and with the door closed, she fell down on the bed. Her feet pained her so much. For a long time she continued to look with a stupid air at the dressing-table, the wardrobe, and a hotel-like nudity. This, then, was where she was going to live, and her first day tormented her an abominable, endless day. She would never have the courage to go through another. Then she perceived she was dressed in silk, and this uniform depressed her. She was childish enough, before unpacking her box, to put on her old woollen dress, which hung on the back of a chair. But when she was once more dressed in this poor garment of hers, a painful emotion choked her. The sobs which she had kept back all day burst forth suddenly in a flood of hot tears. She fell back on the bed, weeping at the thought of the two children, and she wept on, without feeling to have the strength to take off her boots, completely overcome with fatigue and grief. End of chapter 4, part 3Chapter 5. The next day Denise had scarcely been downstairs half an hour, when Madame Aurélie said to her in her sharp voice, "'You are wanted at the directorate, mademoiselle.' The young girl found Moret alone, in the large office hung with green rep. He had suddenly remembered the unkempt girl, as Bordoncle called her, and he, who usually detested the part of fault-finder, had had the idea of sending for her and waking her up a bit, if she was still dressed in the style of a country-wench. 
the previous day notwithstanding his pleasantry he had experienced in madame de forge's presence a feeling of wounded vanity of seeing the elegance of one of his saleswomen discussed he felt a confused sentiment a mixture of sympathy and anger we have engaged you mademoiselle commenced he out of regard for your uncle and you must not put us under the sad necessity but he stopped opposite him on the other side of the desk stood a niece upright serious and pale her silk dress was no longer too big for her but fitted tight around her pretty figure displaying her pure lines of her virgin shoulders and if her hair knotted in thick tresses still appeared untidy she tried at least to keep it in order after having gone to sleep with her clothes on her eyes red with weeping the young girl had felt ashamed of this attack of nervous sensibility on waking up about four o'clock and she had immediately set about taking in her dress she had spent an hour before the small looking-glass combing her hair without being able to reduce it as she would have liked to ah thank heavens said moret you look better this morning but there's still that dreadful hair he rose from his seat and went up to her to try and smooth it down in the same familiar way madame Moralie had attempted to do it in the previous day there just tuck that in behind your ear the chignon is too high she did not speak but let him continue to arrange her hair notwithstanding her vow to be strong she had arrived at the office full of misgivings certain that she had been sent for to be informed of her dismissal and moret's evident kindliness did not reassure her she still felt afraid of him feeling when near him that uneasiness which she attributed to a natural anxiety in the presence of a powerful man on whom her fate depended when he saw her so trembling under his hands which were gracing her neck he was sorry for his movement of good nature for he feared above all to lose his authority in short mademoiselle resumed he once more placing the desk between himself and her try and look to your appearance you are no longer at valence study our parisian young ladies if your uncle's name has sufficed to gain your admittance to our house i feel sure you will carry out what your person seemed to promise me unfortunately everybody here is not of my opinion let this be a warning to you don't make me tell a falsehood he treated her like a child with more pity than kindness his curiosity in matters feminine simply awakened by the troubling womanly charm which he felt springing up in this poor and awkward child and she whilst he was lecturing her having suddenly perceived madame hedouin's portrait the handsome regular face smiling gravely in the gold frame felt herself shivering again notwithstanding the encouraging words he addressed to her this was the dead lady she whom people accused him of having killed in order to found the house with the blood of her body moret was still speaking now you may go said he at last sitting down and taking up his pen she went away heaving a deep sigh of relief from that day forward denise displayed her great courage beneath these rare attacks of sensitiveness a strong sense of reason was constantly working quite a feeling of bravery at finding herself weak and alone a cheerful determination to carry out her self-imposed task she made very little noise but went straight ahead to her goal with an invincible sweetness overcoming all obstacles and that simply and naturally for such was her real character at first she had to surmount the terrible fatigues of the department the parcels of garments tired her arms so much so that during the first six weeks she cried with pain when she turned over at night bent almost double her shoulders bruised but she suffered still more from her shoes thick shoes brought from valence want of money preventing her replacing them with light boots always on her feet trotting about from morning to night scolded if seen leaning for a moment against any support her feet became swollen little feet like those of a child which seemed ground up in these torturing blutches her heels throbbed with fever the soles were covered with blisters the skin of which chafed off and stuck to the stocking she felt her entire frame shattered her limbs and organs contracted by the lassitude of her legs the certain sudden weaknesses incident to her sex betraying themselves by the paleness of her flesh and she so thin so frail resisted courageously whilst a great many saleswomen around her were obliged to quit the business attacked with special maladies a good grace in suffering her valiant obstinacy maintained her smiling and upright when she felt ready to give way thoroughly worn out and exhausted by work to which men would have succumbed another torment was to have the whole department against her 
To the physical martyrdom there was added the secret persecution of her comrades. Two months of patience and gentleness had not disarmed them. She was constantly exposed to wounding remarks, cruel inventions, a series of slights which cut her to the heart, in her longing for affection. They had joked for a long time over her unfortunate first appearance, the words clogs and numbskull circulated. Those who missed a sale were sent to Valence. She passed, in short, for the fool of the place. Then, when she revealed herself later on as a remarkable saleswoman, well up in the mechanism of the house, the young ladies arranged together so as never to leave her a good customer. Marguerite and Clara pursued her with an instinctive hatred, closing up the ranks in order not to be swallowed up by this newcomer, whom they really feared in spite of their affectation of disdain. As for Madame Oralie, she was hurt by the proud reserve displayed by the young girl, who did not hover round her skirts with an air of caressing admiration. She therefore abandoned Denise to the rancour of her favourites, to the favoured ones of her court, who were always on their knees, engaged in feeding her with a continual flattery which her large authoritative person needed to make it blossom forth. For a while, the second hand, Madame Frédéric, appeared not to enter into the conspiracy, but this must have been by inadvertence, for she showed herself equally harsh the moment she saw to what annoyances her good nature was likely to expose her. Then the abandonment became complete. They all made a butt of their unkempt girl, who lived in an hourly struggle, only managing by the greatest courage to hold her own in the department. Such was her life now. She had to smile, look brave and gracious in a silk dress which did not belong to her, although dying with fatigue, badly fed, badly treated, under the continual menace of a brutal dismissal. Her room was her only refuge, the only place where she could abandon herself to the luxury of a cry, when she had suffered too much during the day. But a terrible coldness fell from the zinc roof, covered with the December snow. She was obliged to nestle in her iron bedstead, throw all her clothes over her, and weep under the counterpane to prevent the frost chapping her face. Moray never spoke to her now. When she caught Bordoncle's severe looks during business hours she trembled, for she felt in him a born enemy who would not forgive her the slightest fault. And amidst this general hostility, Jove the inspector's strange friendliness astonished her. If he met her in any out-of-the-way corner, he smiled at her, made some amiable remark. Twice he had saved her from being reprimanded without any show of gratitude on her part, for she was more troubled than touched by his protection. One evening after dinner, as the young ladies were settling the cupboards in order, Joseph came and informed the niece that a young man wanted her below. She went down, feeling very anxious. Hello, said Clara. The unkempt girl has got a man. He must be hard up for a sweetheart, declared Marguerite. Downstairs, at the door, Denise found her brother Sean. She had formally prohibited him from coming to the shop in this way, as it looked very bad. But she did not dare to scold him, so excited did he appear, bareheaded, out of breath, through running from the Faubourg de Temple. "'Have you got ten francs?' stammered he. "'Give me ten francs, or I am a lost man!' The young rascal looked so comical, with his flowing locks and handsome girlish face, launching out with this melodramatic phrase, that she could have smiled had it not been for the anguish which this demand for money caused her. "'What? Ten francs?' she murmured. "'Whatever's the matter?' He blushed, and explained that he had met a friend's sister. Then he stopped him, feeling embarrassed, not wishing to know any more about it. Twice already had he rushed in to obtain similar loans, but the first time it was only twenty-five sous, and the next thirty. He was always getting mixed up with women. "'I can't give you ten francs,' resumed she. "'Pepe's board isn't paid yet, and I've only just the money. I shall have hardly enough to buy a pair of boots, which I want badly.' You really are not reasonable, Jean. It's too bad of you. Well, I'm lost, repeated he with a tragical gesture. Just listen, little sister. She's a tall, dark girl. We went to the café with her brother. I never thought of drinks. She had to interrupt him again, and as tears were coming into his eyes, she took out her purse and slipped a ten-franc piece into his hand. He at once set up a laugh. I was sure, but my word of honour, never again. A fellow would have to be a regular scamp. And he ran off, after having kissed his sister, like a madman. The fellows in the shop seemed astonished. That night Denise did not sleep much. Since her entry in the ladies' paradise, money had been her cruel anxiety. She was still a probationer, without salary, 
The young ladies in the department frequently prevented her from selling, and she just managed to pay Pepper's board and lodging, thanks to the unimportant customers they were good enough to leave her. It was a time of black misery, misery in a silk dress. She was often obliged to spend the night repairing her small stack of clothes, darning her linen, mending her chemises as if they had been lace, without mentioning the patches she put in her boots, as cleverly as any bootmaker could have done. She even risked washing things in her hand basin. But her old woolen dress was an especial cause of anxiety to her. She had no other, and was forced to put it on every evening when she quitted the uniform silk, and this wore it terribly. A spot on it gave her fever, the last tear was a catastrophe, and she had nothing, not a sou, not even enough to buy the trifling articles which a woman always wants. She had been obliged to wait a fortnight to renew her stock of needles and cotton. Thus it was a real disaster when Sean, with his love affairs, dropped down all at once and pillaged her purse. A franc piece taken away caused a gulf which she did not know how to fill up. As for finding ten francs on the morrow, it was not to be thought of for a moment. The whole night she slept an uncomfortable sleep, haunted by the nightmare in which she saw Pepe thrown into the street, whilst she was turning over the flagstones with her bruised fingers to see if there were not some money underneath. It happened that the next day she had to play the part of the well-dressed girl. Some well-known customer came in, and Madame Oralie called her several times in order that she should show off the new styles. And whilst she was posing there, with the stiff graces of a fashion-plate, she was thinking of Pepe's board and lodging, which she had promised to pay that evening. She could very well do without boots for another month, but even then adding the thirty francs she had left to the four francs, which she had saved sou by sou, that would never make more than thirty-four francs, and where was she to find six francs to complete the sum? It was an anguish in which her heart failed her. "'You will notice the shoulders are free,' Madame Morali was saying. "'It's very fashionable and very convenient. The young person can fold her arms.' "'Oh, easily,' replied Denise, who continued to smile amiably. "'One can't feel it. I am sure you will like it, Madame.' She now blamed herself for having gone to fetch Pepe from Madame Grasse's the previous Sunday to take him for a walk in the Champs-Élysées. The poor child so seldom went out with her, but she had had to buy some gingerbread and a little spade, and then take him to see Punch and Judy, and that had mounted at once to twenty-nine sous. Really, Sean could not think much about the little one, or he would not be so foolish. Afterwards, everything fell upon her shoulders. "'Of course, if it does not suit you, Madame,' resumed the first hand, just put this cloak on, mademoiselle, so that the lady may judge. And Denise walked slowly round, with the cloak on, saying, This is warmer. It's this year's fashion. And she continued to torture herself, behind her professional good graces, until the evening, to know where she was to find this money. The young ladies, who were very busy, had left her an important sale, but it was only Tuesday, and she had four days to wait before drawing any money. After dinner she decided to postpone her visit to Madame Gras till the next day. She would excuse herself, say she had been detained, and before then she would have the six francs, perhaps. As Denise avoided the slightest expense, she went to bed early. What could she do in the streets, with her unsociableness still frightened by the big city, in which she only knew the streets near the shop? After having ventured as far as the Palais Royal to get a little fresh air, she would quickly return lock herself in her room, and set about sewing or washing. It was, along the corridor of the bedrooms, a barrack-like promiscuity. Girls, who were often not very tidy, gossiping over dirty water and dirty linen, quite a disagreeable feeling, which manifested itself in frequent quarrels and continual reconciliations. They were, moreover, prohibited from going up to their rooms in the daytime. They did not live there, but merely slept there at night, not going up till the last minute, leaving again in the morning still half asleep, hardly awakened by a rapid wash, and this gust of wind which was continually sweeping through the corridor, the fatigue of the thirteen hours' work, which threw them on their beds thoroughly worn out, changed this upper part of the house into an inn traversed by the tired ill-temper of a host of travellers. Denise had no friends. Of all the young ladies, one alone, Pauline Cugnot, showed her a certain tenderness, and the ready-made and underclothing departments being close to one another, and in open war, the sympathy between the two saleswomen had hitherto been confined to a few rare words hastily exchanged. 
Pauline occupied a neighbouring room, to the right of Denise's, but as she disappeared immediately after dinner and only returned at eleven o'clock, the latter only heard her get into bed, without ever meeting her after business hours. That evening Denise had made up her mind to play the part of bootmaker once more. She was holding her shoes, turning them about, wondering how she could make them last another month. At last she decided to take a strong needle and sew on the soles, which were threatening to leave the uppers. During this time a collar and a pair of cuffs were soaking in the basin full of soap suds. Every evening she heard the same noises, the young ladies coming in one by one, short whispered conversations, laughing, and sometimes a dispute, which they stifled as much as possible. Then the beds creaked, the tired occupants yawned, and fell into a heavy slumber. Denise's left-hand neighbour often talked in her sleep, which frightened her very much at first. Perhaps others, like herself, stopped up to mend their things, in spite of the rules. But if so, they probably took the same precautions as she did herself, keeping very quiet, avoiding the least shock, for a shivering silence reigned in all the rooms. It had struck eleven about ten minutes before, when a sound of footsteps made her raise her head. Another young lady late! and she recognised it to be Pauline, by hearing the latter open the door next to hers. But she was astonished when Pauline returned quietly and knocked at her door. "'Make haste! It's me!' The saleswoman not being allowed to visit each other in their rooms, so that her neighbour should not be caught by Madame Cabine, who was supposed to see this rule strictly carried out. "'Was she there?' asked Denise, closing the door. "'Who? Madame Cabine?' replied Pauline. "'Oh, I'm not afraid of her. She's easily settled with a five-franc piece.' Then she added, "'I've wanted to have a talk with you for a long time past, but it's impossible to do so downstairs. Besides, you looked so downhearted to-night at table.' Denise thanked her and invited her to sit down, touched by her good-natured air. But in the trouble caused by the sudden visit, she had not laid down the shoe she was mending, and Pauline's eyes fell on it at once. She shook her head, looked round, and perceived the collar and cuffs in the basin. "'My poor child, I thought as much,' resumed she. "'Ah, I know what it is. "'When I first came up from Chatret, and old Cugnon did not send me a sou, "'I many a time washed my own chemises. "'Yes, yes, even my chemises. "'I had two, and there was always one in soak. "'She sat down, still out of breath from running. "'Her large face, with small bright eyes and big tender mouth, "'had a certain grace, notwithstanding the rather coarse features.' and, without transition, all of a sudden she related her history. Her childhood at the mill, all Cugnon ruined by a lawsuit, her being sent to Paris to make her fortune with twenty francs in her pocket, then her start as a shop-girl in the shop at Batignol, then at the Ladies' Paradise. A terrible start, all the sufferings and all the privations imaginable. She then spoke of her present life, of the two hundred francs she earned a month, the pleasures she indulged in, the carelessness in which she allowed her days to glide away. Some jewellery, a brooch, a watch-chain, glistened on her dark blue cloth dress, coquettishly made to the figure, and she wore a velvet hat, ornamented with a large grey feather. The niece had turned very red with her shoe. She began to stammer out an explanation. "'But the same thing happened to me,' repeated Pauline. "'Come, come, I'm older than you, I'm over twenty-six, though I don't look it. Just tell me your little troubles.' Denise yielded, conquered by this friendship so frankly offered. She sat down in her petticoat, with an old shawl over her shoulders, near Pauline in full dress, and an interesting gossip ensued. End of chapter 5, part 1read by Christine G. Chapter 5, Part 2 It was freezing in the room. The cold seemed to run down the bare prison-like walls, but they did not notice that their fingers were almost frostbitten. They were so fully taken up by their conversation. Little by little, Denise opened her heart entirely, spoke of Sean and Pepe, and how much the money question tortured her, which led them both to abuse the young ladies in the dress department. Pauline relieved her mind. Oh, the hussies! If they treated you properly and in a friendly manner, you could make more than a hundred francs a month. Everybody is down on me, and I'm sure I don't know why. 
said Denise, beginning to cry. Look at Monsieur Bordoncle. He's always watching me for a chance of finding me in fault, as if I were in his way. Olshov is about the only one. The other interrupted her. What? That old monkey of an inspector? Ah, my dear, don't you trust him? You know, men with big noses like his. He may display his decoration as much as he like. There's a story about something that happened to him in our department. But what a child you are to grieve like this. What a misfortune it is to be so sensitive. Of course, what is happening to you happens to everyone. They are making you pay your footing. She seized her hands and kissed her, carried away by her good heart. The money question was a graver one. Certainly a poor girl could not support her two brothers, pay the little one's board and lodging, and regale the big one's mistresses with a few paltry sous picked up from the other's cast of customers. For it was to be fair that she would not get any salary until business improved in March. Listen to me. It's impossible for you to live in this way any longer, if I were you, said Pauline, but the noise in the corridor stopped her. It was probably Marguerite, who was accused of prowling about at night to watch the others. Pauline, who was still pressing her friend's hand, looked at her for a moment in silence, listening. Then she resumed in a very low tone, with an air of tender conviction. If I were you, I should take someone. How someone? murmured Denise, not understanding at first. When she understood, she withdrew her hands, looking very confused. This advice made her feel awkward, like an idea which had never occurred to her, and of which she could not see the advantage. "'Oh, no,' replied she simply. "'Then,' continued Pauline, "'you'll never manage. I'll tell you so plainly. Here are the figures. Forty francs for the little one, a five-franc piece now and again for the big one, and then there's yourself. You can't always go about dressed like a pauper, with boots that make the other girls laugh at you. Yes, really, your boots do you a deal of harm. Take someone. It would be much better. No, repeated Denise. Well, you are very foolish. It is inevitable, my dear, and so natural. We all do it sooner or later. Look at me. I was a probationer like you, without a sou. We are boarded and lodged, it's true. But there's our dress. Besides, it's impossible to go without a copper in one's pocket, shut up in one's room, watching the flies. So you see girls forcibly drift into it. She then spoke of her first lover, a lawyer's clerk whom she had met at a party at Modon. After him came a post-office clerk, and, finally, ever since the autumn, she had been keeping company with the salesman at the Bon Marche, a very nice tall fellow, with whom she spent all her leisure time. Never more than one sweetheart at a time, however. She was very respectable in her way, and became indignant when she heard talk of those girls who yielded to the first-comer. "'I don't tell you to misconduct yourself, you know,' said she quickly. "'For instance, I should not like to be seen with your Clara, for fair people should say I was as bad as she. But when a girl stays quietly with one lover, and has nothing to blame herself for, do you think that wrong?' "'No,' replied Denise. "'But I don't care for it, that's all.' There was a fresh silence. In the small icy-cold room they were smiling to each other, greatly affected by this whispered conversation." "'Besides, one must have some affection for someone before doing so,' resumed she, her cheeks scarlet. Pauline was astonished. She set up a laugh, and embraced her a second time, saying, "'But, my darling, when you meet and like each other! You are funny. People won't force you. Look here, would you like Borsch to take us somewhere in the country on Sunday? He'll bring one of his friends.' "'No,' said Denise, in her gently obstinate way. Pauline insisted no longer.' Each one was free to act as she liked. What she had said was out of pure kindness of heart, for she felt really grieved to see a comrade so miserable. And as it was nearly midnight, she got up to leave. But before doing so, she forced Denise to accept the six francs she wanted, begging her not to trouble about the matter, but to repay the amount when she earned more. Now, added she, blow your candle out, so that they can't see which door opens. You can light it again immediately. The candle blown out, they shook hands, and Pauline ran off to her room, without leaving any trace in the darkness but the vague rustling of her petticoats, amidst the deep slumber of the occupants of the other little rooms. Before going to bed, Denise wanted to finish her boot and do her washing. The cold became sharper still as the night advanced, but she did not feel it. This conversation had stirred up her heart's blood. She was not shocked. It seemed to her that everyone had a right to arrange her life as she liked, when alone and free in the world. She had never given way to such ideas. 
her sense of right and her healthy nature maintained her naturally in the respectability in which she had always lived. About one o'clock she at last went to bed. No, she did not love any one, so what was the use of disarranging her life, of spoiling the maternal devotion she had vowed for her two brothers? However, she did not sleep. A crowd of indistinct forms passed before her closed eyes, vanishing in the darkness. From this moment Denise took an interest in the love-stories of the department. During the slack moments they were constantly occupied by their affairs with the men. Gossiping tales flew about, stories of adventures amused the girls for a week. Clara was a scandal. She had three lovers, without counting a string of chance admirers whom she had in tow. And if she did not leave the shop, where she did the least work possible, disdaining the money which she could easily and more agreeably earn elsewhere, it was to shield herself from her family for she was mortally afraid of old Prunaire, who threatened to come to Paris and break her arms and legs with his clogs. Marguerite, on the contrary, behaved very well, and was not known to have any lover. This caused some surprise, for all knew of her adventure, her coming to Paris to be confined in secret. How had she come to have the child, if she were so virtuous? And there were some who hinted at an accident, adding that she was now reserving herself for her cousin at Grenoble. The young ladies also joked about Madame Frédéric, declaring that she was discreetly connected with certain great personages. The truth was that they knew nothing of her love affairs, for she disappeared every evening, stiff as a starch in her widow's ill temper, evidently in a great hurry, though nobody knew where she was running off to so eagerly. As to Madame Aurélie's passions, her pretended larks with obedient young men, they were certainly false mere inventions spread abroad by discontented saleswomen just for fun. Perhaps she had formerly displayed rather too much motherly feeling for one of her son's friends, but she now occupied too high a place in the drapery business to allow her to amuse herself with such childish matters. Then there was the crowd leaving in the evening, nine girls out of every ten having young men waiting for them at the door. In the Place Gaillon, along the Rue de la Michaudière, in the Rue Neuve Saint Augustine, there was always quite a troop of men standing motionless, watching for the girls coming out, and, when they came, each one gave his arm to his lady and disappeared, talking with a marital tranquillity. But what troubled Denise most was to have discovered Columban's secret. He was continually to be seen on the other side of the street, at the door of the old Elbeuf, his eyes raised, and never quitting the young ladies in the ready-made department. When he felt Denise was watching him, he blushed and turned away his head, as if afraid she might betray him to Genevieve, although there had been no further connection between the Baudus and their niece since her engagement at the Ladies' Paradise. At first she had thought he was in love with Marguerite, on seeing his despairing looks, for Marguerite, being very quiet, and sleeping in the building, was not very easy to get at. But what was her astonishment to find that Columban's ardent glances were intended for Clara? He had been like that for months— devoured by passion on the opposite side of the way, without finding the courage to declare himself, and that for a girl who was perfectly free, who lived in the Rue Louis le Grand, and whom he could have spoken to any evening before she walked off on the arm of a fresh fellow. Clara herself appeared to have no idea of her conquest. Denise's discovery filled her with a painful emotion. Was love, then, such a stupid thing as that? What? This fellow, who had real happiness within his reach, was ruining his life— enraptured with this good-for-nothing's girl, as if she were a saint. From that day she was seized with a feeling of grief every time she saw Genevieve's pale and suffering face behind the green panes of the old Elbeuf. In the evening Denise could not help thinking a great deal on seeing the young ladies march off with their sweethearts. Those who did not sleep at the ladies' paradise disappeared until the next day, bringing back into their departments an outside odour, a sort of troubling, unknown impression. The young girl was sometimes obliged to reply with a smile to a friendly nod from Pauline, whom Borch waited for every evening regularly at half-past eight, at the corner of the fountain in the Place Gaillon. Then, after having gone out the last, and taken a furtive walk, always alone, she was invariably the first in, going upstairs to work, or to bed, her head filled with dreams, full of curiosity about this outdoor life, of which she knew nothing. She certainly did not envy the young ladies, she was happy in her solitude, in that unsociableness to which her timidity condemned her, as to a refuge. But her imagination carried her away, 
She tried to guess things, evoking the pleasures constantly described before her, the cafés, the restaurants, the theatres, the Sundays spent on the water and in the country taverns. This filled her with a mental weakness, a desire mingled with lassitude, and she seemed to be already tired of those amusements which she had never tasted. However, there was but little room for these dangerous dreams in her daily working life. During the thirteen hours' hard work in the shop, there was no time for any display of tenderness between the salesmen and the saleswomen. If the continual fight for money had not abolished the sexes, the unceasing press of business which occupied their minds and fatigued their bodies would have sufficed to kill all desire. But very few love affairs had been known in the establishment amidst the hostilities and friendships between the men and the women, the constant elbowings from department to department. They were all nothing but the wheels, turned round by the immense machine, abdicating their personalities, simply contributing their strength to this commonplace, powerful total. It was only outside that they resumed their individual lives, with the abrupt flame of awakening passions. Denise, however, one day saw Albert Lhomme slipping a note into the hand of a young lady in the underclothing department, after having several times passed through with an air of indifference. The dead season, which lasts from December to February, was commencing, and she had periods of rest, hours spent on her feet, her eyes wandering all over the shop, waiting for customers. The young ladies of her department were especially friendly with the salesmen who served the lace, but their intimacy never went any further than some rather risky jokes, exchanged in whispers. In the lace department there was a second hand, a gay youth who pursued Clara with all sorts of abominable stories, simply for a joke, so careless at heart that he made no effort to meet her outside, and thus it was, from counter to counter, between the gentlemen and the young ladies, a series of winks, nods, and remarks, which they alone understood. At times they indulged in some sly gossip with their backs half-turned, and with a dreamy air, in order to put the terrible bordoncle off the scent. As for Deloche, for a long time he contented himself with smiling at Denise when he met her, but, getting bolder, he occasionally murmured a friendly word. The day she had noticed Madame Auralie's son give a note to the young lady in the underlinen department, Deloche was asking her if she had enjoyed her lunch, feeling to want to say something, and unable to find anything more amiable. He also saw the white paper, and looking at the young girl, they both blushed at this intrigue carried on before them. But under these rumours which gradually awoke the woman in her, Denise still retained her infantine peace of mind. The one thing that stirred her heart was meeting with her tongue. But even that was only gratitude in her eyes. She simply thought herself touched by the young man's politeness. He could not bring a customer to the department without her feeling quite confused. Several times, on returning from a pay desk, she found herself making a detour, uselessly passing the silk counter, her bosom heaving with emotion. One afternoon she met Moray there, who seemed to follow her with a smile. He paid no more attention to her now, only addressing a few words to her from time to time, to give her a few hints about her toilet, and to joke with her, as an impossible girl, a little savage almost like a boy, of whom he would never make a coquette, notwithstanding all his knowledge of women. Sometimes he even ventured to laugh at and tease her, without wishing to acknowledge to himself the charm which this little saleswoman inspired in him, with her comical head of hair. Before this mute smile, Denise trembled, as if she were in fault. Did he know why she was going through the silk department, when she could not herself have explained what made her make such a detour? Hutar, moreover, did not seem to be aware in any way of the young girl's grateful looks. The shop girls were not his style. He affected to despise them, boasting more than ever of extraordinary adventures with the lady customers. A baroness had been struck with him at his counter, and the wife of an architect had fallen into his arms one day, when he went to her house about an error in measuring he had made. Beneath this Norman boasting he simply concealed girls picked up in cafés and music halls. Like all young gentlemen in the drapery line, he had a mania for spending, fighting in his apartment the whole week with a miser's greediness, with the sole wish to squander his money on Sunday on the race-courses, in the restaurants and dancing saloons never thinking of saving a penny, spending his salary as soon as he drew it, absolutely indifferent about the future. Favier did not join him in these parties. Hutin and he, so friendly in the shop, bowed to each other at the door, where all further intercourse ceased. 
a great many of the shopmen, in continual contact indoors, became strangers, ignorant of each other's lives, as soon as they set foot in the streets. But Leonard was Hutin's intimate friend. Both lived in the same lodging-house, the Hotel de Smyrne, in the Rue Saint-Anne, a murky building entirely inhabited by shop assistants. In the morning they arrived together. Then, in the evening, the first one free, after the folding was done, waited for the other at the Café Saint-Roche, in the Rue Saint-Roche, a little café where the employees of the Ladies' Paradise usually met, brawling, drinking, and playing cards amidst the smoke of their pipes. They often stopped there till one in the morning, until the tired landlord turned them out. For the last month they had been spending three evenings a week at a free and easy at Montmartre, and they took their friends with them, creating a success for Mademoiselle Laurie, a music-hall singer, Hutin's latest conquest, whose talent they applauded with such violent blows and such a clamour that the police had been obliged to interfere on two occasions. The winter passed in this way, and Denise at last obtained three hundred francs a year fixed salary. It was quite time, for her shoes were completely worn out. For the last month she had avoided going out, for fear of bursting them entirely. "'What a noise you make with your shoes, mademoiselle,' Madame Moralie very often remarked, with an irritated look. "'It's intolerable. What's the matter with your feet?' The day Denise appeared with a pair of cloth boots, for which she had given five francs, Marguerite and Clara expressed their astonishment in a kind of half-whisper, so as to be heard. "'Hello! The unkempt girl has given up her galoshes,' said the one. "'Ah!' retorted the other. "'She must have cried over them. They were her mother's.' In point of fact, there was a general uprising against Denise. The girls of her department had found out her friendship with Pauline, and thought they saw a certain bravado in this affection displayed for a saleswoman of a rival counter. They spoke of treason, accused her of going and repeating their slightest words. The war between the two departments became more violent than ever. It had never waxed so warm. Hard words were exchanged like cannonballs, and there was even a slap given one evening behind some boxes of chemises. Perhaps this remote quarrel arose from the fact that the young ladies in the underlinen department wore woolen dresses, whilst those in the ready-made one wore silk. In any case, the former spoke of their neighbours with a shocked air of respectable girls, and facts proved that they were right, for it had been remarked that the silk dresses appeared to have a certain influence on the dissolute habits of the young ladies who wore them. Clara was taunted with her troop of lovers, even Marguerite had, so to say, had her child thrown in her face, whilst Madame Frédéric was accused of all sorts of concealed passions. And this was solely on account of that Denise. "'Now, young ladies, no ugly words. Behave yourself,' Madame Aurélie would say with her imperial air, amidst the rising passions of her little kingdom. "'Show who you are.' At heart she preferred to remain neutral. As she confessed one day, when talking to Moret, these girls were all about the same, one was as good as the other.' but she suddenly became impassioned when she learned from Bortoncle that he had just caught her son downstairs kissing a young girl belonging to the underlinen department, the saleswoman to whom he had passed several letters. It was abominable, and she roundly accused the underlinen department of having laid a trap for Albert. Yes, it was a got-up affair against herself. They were trying to dishonour her by ruining a child without experience, after seeing that it was impossible to attack her department. Her only object in making such a noise was to complicate the business, for she knew what her son was, fully aware that he was capable of doing all sorts of stupid things. For a time the matter assumed a grave aspect. Mignon, the glove salesman, was mixed up in it. He was a great friend of Albert's, and the rumour got circulated that he favoured the mistresses Albert sent him, girls with big chignons, who rummaged in the boxes for hours together and there was also a story about some Swedish kid gloves given to the girl of the underlinen department, which was never properly cleared up. At last the scandal was hushed up, out of regard for Madame Aurélie, whom Moret himself treated with deference. Bortoncle contented himself a week after with dismissing, for some slight offence, the girl who allowed herself to be kissed. If they shut their eyes to the terrible doings of their employees outdoors, the managers did not tolerate the least nonsense in the house and it was Denise who suffered for all this. Madame Aurélie, although perfectly well aware of what was going on, nourished a secret rancour against her. She saw her laughing one evening with Pauline, and took it for bravado, concluding that they were gossiping over her son's love affairs, 
and she caused the young girl to be isolated more than ever in the department. For some time she had been thinking of inviting the young ladies to spend a Sunday near Rambouillet, at Trégol, where she had bought a country house with the first hundred thousand francs she had saved, and she suddenly decided to do so. It would be a means of punishing Denise, of putting her openly on one side. She was the only one not invited. For a fortnight in advance, nothing was talked of but this party. The girls kept their eyes on the sky, and had already mapped out the whole day, looking forward to all sorts of pleasures, donkey riding, milk and brown bread, and they were to be all women, which was more amusing still. As a rule, Madame Aurélie killed her holidays in this way, going out with her lady friends, for she was so little accustomed to being at home, she always felt so uncomfortable, so strange, during the rare occasions she could dine with her husband and son, that she preferred to throw up even those occasions, and go and dine at the restaurant. Lhomme went his own way, enraptured to resume his bachelor existence, and Albert, greatly relieved, went off with his beauties, so that, unaccustomed to being at home, feeling in each other's way, and wearying each other when together on a Sunday, they paid nothing more than a flying visit to the house, as to some common hotel where people take a bed for the night. Regarding the excursion to Rambolet, Madame Aurélie simply declared that propriety prevented Albert joining them, and that the father himself would display great tact by refusing to come, a declaration which enchanted the two men. However, the happy day was drawing near, and the young girls chatted more than ever, relating their preparations in the way of dress, as if they were going on a six-months tour, whilst Denise had to listen to them, pale and silent in her abandonment. "'Ah, they make you wild, don't they?' said Pauline to her one morning. "'If I were you, I would just catch them nicely. They are going to enjoy themselves.' I would enjoy myself too. Come with us on Sunday. Borsch is going to take me to Joinville. No, thanks, said the young girl with her quiet obstinacy. But why not? Are you still afraid of being taken by force? And Pauline laughed heartily. Denise also smiled. She knew how such things came about. It was always during some similar excursion that the young ladies had made the acquaintance of their first lovers, brought by chance by a friend, and she did not want to. Come, resumed Pauline, I assure you that Borsch won't bring any one. We shall be all by ourselves. As you don't want to, I won't go and marry you off, of course. Denise hesitated, tormented by such a strong desire to go that the blood flew to her cheeks. Since the girls had been talking about their country pleasures, she had felt stifled, overcome by a longing for fresh air, dreaming of the tall grass into which she could sink down up to the neck, of the giant trees the shadows over which should flow over her like so much cooling water. Her childhood, spent in the rich verdure of the cottontine, was awakening with a regret for sun and air. "'Well, yes,' said she at last. Everything was soon arranged. Borsch was to come and fetch them at eight o'clock, in the Place Gaillon, from where they would take a cab to the Vianzon station. Denise, whose twenty-five francs amount was quickly swallowed up by the children, had only been able to do up her old black woollen dress, by trimming it with strips of cheek poplin, and she had also made herself a bonnet, a shape covered with silk and ornamented with a simple blue ribbon. In this simple attire she looked very young, like an overgrown child, exceedingly clean, rather shamefaced and embarrassed by her luxuriant hair, which appeared through the nakedness of her bonnet. Pauline, on the contrary, displayed a pretty violet and white striped silk dress, a hat richly trimmed and laden with feathers, jewels round her neck and rings on her fingers, which gave her the appearance of a well-to-do tradesman's wife. It was like a Sunday revenge on the woollen dress she was obliged to wear all the week in the shop, whilst Denise, who wore her uniform silk from Monday to Saturday, resumed, on Sunday, her thin woollen dress of misery. "'There's Borsch, said Pauline, pointing to a tall fellow standing near the fountain. She introduced her lover, and Denise felt at her ease at once. He seemed such a nice fellow. Borsch, big, strong as an ox, had a long Flemish face, in which his expressionless eyes twinkled with an infantine puerility. Born at Dunkerque, the younger son of a grocer, he had to come to Paris, almost turned out by his father and brother, who thought him a fearful dunce. However, he made three thousand five hundred francs a year at the Bon Marche. He was rather stupid, but a very good hand in the linen department. The woman thought him nice. "'And the cab?' asked Pauline. They had to go as far as the boulevard. It was already rather warm in the sun, 
the glorious May morning seemed to laugh on the street pavement. There was no cloud in the sky, quite a gaiety floated in the blue air, transparent as crystal. An involuntary smile played on Denise's lips. She breathed freely. It seemed to her that her bosom was throwing off the stifling sensation of six months. At last she no longer felt the stuffy air and the heavy stones of the ladies' paradise weighing her down. She had then the prospect of a long day in the country before her, and it was like a new lease of life, an endless joy, into which she entered with all the glee of a little child. However, when in the cab, she turned her eyes away, feeling very awkward as Pauline bent over to kiss her lover. "'Oh, look!' said she, her head still at the window. "'There's Monsieur Lhomme. How he does walk! He's got his French horn,' added Pauline, leaning out. "'What an old stupid! One would think he was running to meet his girl!' End of chapter 5, part 2section twelve of the ladies paradise by emile sola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain read by christine g chapter five part three l'homme with his instrument under his arm was spinning along past the gymnase theatre his nose in the air laughing with delight at the thought of the treat in store for him he was going to spend the day at a friend's a flautist at a small theatre where a few amateurs indulged in a little chamber music on Sundays, as soon as breakfast was over. "'At eight o'clock! What a madman!' resumed Pauline. "'And you know that Madame Oralie and all her clique must have taken the Rambouillet train that left at half-past six. It's very certain the husband and wife won't come across each other.' Both then commenced talking of the Rambouillet excursion. They did not wish it to be rainy for the others, because they themselves would be obliged to suffer as well, but if a cloud could burst over there, without extending to Joinville, it would be funny all the same. Then they attacked Clara, a dirty slut, who hardly knew how to spend the money her men gave her. Hadn't she bought three pairs of boots all at the same time, which she threw away the next day, after having cut them with her scissors, on account of her feet, which were covered with bunions? In fact, the young ladies were just as bad as the fellows. They squandered everything, never saving a sou, wasting two or three hundred francs a month on dress and dainties. "'But he's only got one arm,' said Borch all of a sudden. "'How does he manage to play the French horn?' He had kept his eyes on Lom. Pauline, who sometimes amused herself by playing on his stupidity, told him the cashier kept the instrument up by placing it against the wall. He thoroughly believed her, and thought it very ingenious. Then, when stricken with remorse, she explained to him in what way Lom had adapted to his stump a system of keys, which he made use of as a hand. He shook his head, full of suspicion, declaring that they wouldn't make him swallow that. "'You are really too stupid,' she retorted laughingly. "'Never mind, I love you all the same.' They reached the Vienzen station, just in time for a train. Borsch paid— but Denise had previously declared that she wished to pay her share of the expenses. They would settle up in the evening. They took second-class tickets, and found the train full of a gay, noisy throng. At Nogan, a wedding party got out, amidst a storm of laughter. At last they arrived at Joinville, and went straight to the island to order lunch, and they stopped there, lingering on the banks of the Marne, under the tall poplars. It was rather cold in the shade, a sharp breeze was blowing in the sunshine, extending far into the distance, on the other side of the river, the limpid purity of a plain dotted with cultivated fields. Denise lingered behind Pauline and her lover, who were walking with their arms round each other's waists. She had picked a handful of buttercups, and was watching the flow of the river, happy, her heart beating, her head drooping, each time Borge leant over to kiss his mistress. Her eyes filled with tears, and yet she was not suffering. What was the matter with her that she had this feeling of suffocation? And why did this vast landscape, where she had looked forward to having so much enjoyment, fill her with a vague regret she could not explain? Then, at lunch, Pauline's noisy laugh bewildered her. That young lady, who loved the suburbs with the passion of an actress living in the gaslight, in the thick air of a crowd, wanted to lunch in an arbour, notwithstanding the sharp wind. She was delighted with the sudden gust which blew up the tablecloth, 
she thought the arbour very funny in its nudity, with the freshly painted trellis-work, the lozenges of which cast a reflection on the cloth. She ate ravenously, devouring everything with the voracity of a girl badly fed at the shop, making up for it outside by giving herself an indigestion with the things she liked. This was her vice. She spent most of her money in cakes and indigestible dainties of all kinds, favourite dishes stowed away in her leisure moments. As Denise seemed to have had enough of the eggs, fried fish, and stewed chicken, she restrained herself, not daring to order any strawberries, a luxury still very dear, for fear of running the bill up too high. "'Now, what are we going to do?' asked the Borsch when the coffee was served. As a rule, Pauline and he returned to Paris to dine, and finished their day in some theatre. But at Denise's request, they decided to stay at Joinville all day. They would be able to have their fill of the country." So they stopped, and wandered about the fields all the afternoon. They spoke for a moment of going for a row, but abandoned the idea. Borsch was not a good waterman. But they found themselves walking along the banks of the Marne, all the same, and were greatly interested by the life on the river, the squadrons of yawls and other boats, and the young men who formed the crews. The sun was going down. They were returning to Joinville, when they saw two boats coming downstream at a racing speed, exchanging volleys of insults, in which the repeated cries of sawbones and counter-jumpers dominated. "'Hello!' said Pauline. "'It's Monsieur Rotin.' "'Yes,' said Borsch, shading his face with his hand. "'I recognise his mahogany boat. The other one is manned by students, no doubt.' And he explained the deadly hatred existing between the young students and the shopmen. Denise, on hearing Hutin's name mentioned, suddenly stopped and followed, with fixed eyes, the frail skiff spinning along like an arrow. She tried to distinguish the young man among the rowers, but could only manage to make out the white dresses of two women, one of whom, who was staring, wore a red hat. Their voices were drowned by the rapid flow of the river. "'Pitch him in, sawbones! Duck him, the counter-jumpers!' In the evening they returned to the restaurant on the island, but it had turned too chilly. They were obliged to dine in one of the closed rooms, where the tablecloths were still damp from the humidity of the winter. After six o'clock the tables were all occupied, yet the excursionists still hurried in, looking for a corner, and the waiters continued to bring in more chairs and forms, putting the plates closer together and crowding the people up. It was stifling. They had to open the windows. Outdoors the day was waning. A greenish twilight fell from the poplars so quickly that the proprietor, unprepared for these meals under cover, and having no lamps, was obliged to put a wax candle on each table. The uproar became deafening with laughing, calling out and the clacking of the table utensils. The candles flared and melted in the draught from the windows, whilst moths fluttered about in the air, warmed by the odour of the food, and traversed by sudden gusts of cold wind. "'What fun they're having, eh?' said Pauline, very busy with a plate of matelote, which she declared extraordinary. She leant over to add, "'Didn't you see Monsieur Albert over there?' It was really young Lom, in the middle of three questionable women, a vulgar-looking old lady in a yellow bonnet, suspiciously like a procuress, and two young girls of thirteen or fourteen, forward and painfully impudent creatures. He, already intoxicated, was knocking his glass on the table, and talking of drubbing the waiter if he did not bring some liqueurs immediately. "'Well,' resumed Pauline, "'there's a family, if you like, the mother at Rambouillet, the father in Paris, and the son at Jouinville. They won't tread on one another's toes.' Denise, who detested noise, smiled, however, and tasted the joy of ceasing to think, amid such uproar. But all at once they heard a noise in the other room a burst of voices which drowned the others. They were yelling, and must have come to blows, for one could hear a scuffle, chairs falling down, quite a struggle, amid which the river cries again resounded. Duck em, counter-jumpers! Pitch em in the sawbones! And when the hotel-keeper's loud voice had calmed this tempest, Hutin suddenly made his appearance, wearing a red jersey and a little cap at the back of his head. He had on his arm the tall, fair girl, who had been staring, and who, in order to wear the boat's colours, had planted a bunch of poppies behind her ear. They were greeted on entering by a storm of applause, and his face beamed with pride. He swelled out his chest, assuming a nautical rolling gait, showing off a blow which had blackened his cheek, 
puffed up with their joy at being noticed. Behind them followed the crew. They took a table by storm, and the uproar became something fearful. "'It appears,' explained Borge, after having listened to the conversation behind him, "'it appears that the students have recognised the woman with Hutin as an old friend from the neighbourhood, who now sings in a music hall at Montmartre. So they were kicking up a row for her. These students never pay their women.' "'In any case,' said Pauline stiffly, "'she's jolly ugly with her carroty hair. "'Really, I don't know where Monsieur Hutin picks them up, "'but they're an ugly, dirty lot.' Denise turned pale and felt an icy coldness, as if her heart's blood were flowing away, drop by drop. She had already, on seeing the boats from the bank, felt a shiver, but now she no longer had any doubt. This girl was certainly with Hutin. With trembling hands and a choking sensation in her throat, she ceased eating. "'What's the matter?' asked her friend. "'Nothing,' stammered she. "'It's rather warm here.' But Hutin's table was close to theirs, and when he perceived Borge, whom he knew, he commenced a conversation in a shrill voice, in order to attract further attention. "'I say!' cried he. "'Are you as virtuous as ever at the Bonne Marche?' "'Not so much as all that,' replied Borge, turning very red. "'That won't do. You know they only take virgins there, and there's a confessional box permanently fixed for the salesmen who venture to look at them.' "'A house where they marry you. No thanks.' The other fellows began to laugh. Leonard, who belonged to the crew, added, "'It isn't like the Louvre. There they have a midwife attached to the ready-made department. My word of honour. The gaiety increased. Pauline herself burst out. The idea of the midwife seemed so funny. But Borch was annoyed by the jokes about the innocence of his house. He launched out all at once. "'Oh, you're not too well off at the ladies' paradise.' "'sacked for the slightest thing, "'and a governor who seems to tout for his lady customers.' "'Hutar no longer listened to him, "'but commenced to praise the house in the Place Clichy. "'He knew a young girl there so excessively aristocratic "'that the customers dared not speak to her "'for fear of humiliating her. "'Then, drawing up closer, "'he related that he had made a hundred and fifteen francs that week. "'Oh, a capital week! "'Favier left behind with fifty-two francs, "'the whole lot floored and it was visible he was bursting with money, he would not go to bed till he had liquidated a hundred and fifteen francs. Then, as he gradually became intoxicated, he attacked Robineau, that fool of a second hand who affected to keep himself apart, going so far as to refuse to walk in the street with one of his salesmen. "'Shut up,' said Leonard. "'You talk too much, old man.' The heat had increased. The candles were guttering down onto the tablecloths stained with wine, and through the open windows, when the noise within ceased for an instant, there entered a distant prolonged voice, the voice of the river, and of the tall poplars sleeping in the calm night. Borch had just called for the bill, seeing that Denise was now quite white, her throat choked by the tears she withheld. But the waiter did not appear, and she had to submit to her tense loud talk. He was now boasting of being more superior to Leonard because Leonard cared for nothing, simply squandering his father's money, whilst he, Hutin, was spending his own earnings, the fruit of his intelligence. At last Borge paid, and the two girls went out. "'There's one from the Louvre,' murmured Pauline in the outer room, looking at the tall thin girl putting on her mantle. "'You don't know her. You can't tell,' said the young man. "'Oh, can't I? They've got a way of draping themselves. She belongs to the midwife's department.' If she heard, she must be pleased. They got outside at last, and Denise heaved a sigh of relief. For a moment she had thought she was going to die in that suffocating heat, amidst all those cries, and she still attributed her faintness to the want of air. Now she breathed freely in the freshness of the starry night. As the two young girls were leaving the garden of the restaurant, a timid voice murmured in the shade. "'Good evening, ladies.' "'It was the loge. They had not seen him at the further end of the front room, where he was dining alone, after having come from Paris on foot, for the pleasure of the walk. On recognising this friendly voice, Denise, suffering, yielded mechanically to the want of some support. "'Monsieur Deloche, come back with us,' said she. "'Give me your arm.' Pauline and Borge had already gone on in front. They were astonished, never thinking it would turn out like this, and with this fellow above all. However, 
As there was still an hour before the train started, they went to the end of the island, following the bank, under the tall poplars, and, from time to time, they turned round, murmuring, "'But where are they? Ah, there they are. It's rather funny all the same.' At first Denise and Deloche remained silent. The noise from the restaurant was slowly dying away, changing into a musical sweetness in the calmness of the night, and they went further in amongst the cool of the trees, still feverish from that furnace, the lights of which were disappearing one by one behind the foliage. Opposite them there was a sort of shadowy wall, a mass of shade in which the trunks and branches buried themselves so compact that they could not even distinguish any trace of the path. However, they went forward quietly, without fear. Then, their eyes getting more accustomed to the darkness, they saw on the right the trunks of the poplars, resembling sombre columns upholding the domes of their branches, pierced with stars, whilst on the right the water assumed occasionally in the darkness the brightness of a mirror. The wind was subsiding. They no longer heard anything but the flowing of the river. I, "'I am very pleased to have met you,' stammered Deloche at last, making up his mind to speak first. "'You can't think how happy you render me in consenting to walk with me.' And, aided by the darkness, after many awkward attempts, he ventured to tell her he loved her. He had long wanted to write to her and tell her so, and perhaps she would never have known it had it not been for this lovely night coming to his assistance, this water that murmured so softly, and these trees which screened them with their shade. But she did not reply. She continued to walk by his side with the same suffering air, and he was trying to look into her face when he heard a sob. "'Oh! Good heavens!' he exclaimed. "'You are crying, mademoiselle. You are crying. Have I offended you?' "'No, no!' she murmured. She tried to keep back her tears, but she could not. Even when at table she had thought her heart was about to burst. She abandoned herself in the darkness entirely, stifled by her sobs, thinking that if Hutin had been in Deloche's place, and said such tender things to her, she would have been unable to resist. This confession made to herself filled her with confusion. A feeling of shame burnt her face, as if she had already fallen into the arms of that Hutin, who was disporting himself with those girls. "'I didn't mean to offend you,' continued Deloche, almost crying also. "'No, but listen,' said she, her voice still trembling. "'I am not at all angry with you, but never speak to me again as you have just done. What you ask is impossible. Oh, you are a good fellow, and I am quite willing to be your friend, but nothing more. You understand, your friend.' He shuddered. After a few steps taken in silence, he stammered. I "'In fact, you don't love me.' And as she spared him the pain of a brutal no, he resumed in a soft, heartbroken voice. "'Oh, I was prepared for it. I have never had any luck. I know I can never be happy. At home they used to beat me. In Paris I have always been a drudge. You see, when one does not know how to rob other fellows of their mistresses, and when one is too awkward to earn as much as the others, why, the best thing is to go into some corner and die. Never fear. I shan't torment you any more. As for loving you, you can't prevent me, can you? I shall love you for nothing, like a dog. There— Everything escapes me. That's my luck in life. And he, too, burst into tears. She tried to console him, and in their friendly effusion they found they belonged to the same department. She to Valence, he to Bricubec, eight miles from each other, and this was a fresh tie. His father, a poor needy bailiff and sickly jealous, used to drub him, calling him a bastard, exasperated with his long pale face and toe-like hair, which, said he, did not belong to the family and they got talking about the vast pastures, surrounded with quick-set hedges, of the shady paths winding beneath the elm-trees, and of the grass-grown roads, like the alleys in a park. Around them night was getting darker, but they could still distinguish the rushes on the banks, and the interlaced foliage, black beneath the twinkling stars, and a peacefulness came over them. They forgot their troubles, brought nearer by their ill-luck, in a closer feeling of friendship. Well asked Pauline of Denise, taking her aside when they arrived at the station. The young girl understood by the smile and the stare of tender curiosity. She turned very red and replied, "'But never, my dear. I told you I did not wish to. He belongs to my part of the country. We were talking about Valence.' 
Pauline and Borsch were perplexed, put out in their ideas, not knowing what to think. Deloche left them in the Place de la Bastille. Like all young probationers, he slept at the house, where he had to be in by eleven o'clock. Not wishing to go in with him, Denise, who had got permission to go to the theatre, accepted Borsch's invitation to accompany Pauline to his home. He, in order to be nearer his mistress, had moved into the Rue Saint-Roche. They took a cab, and Denise was stupefied on learning on the way that her friend was going to stay all night with the young man. Nothing was easier. They only had to give Madame Cabille five francs. All the young ladies did it. Borsch did the honours of his room, which was furnished with old empire furniture, given him by his father. He got angry when Denise spoke of settling up, but at last accepted the fifteen francs twelve sous which she had laid on the chest of drawers. But he insisted on making her a cup of tea, and he struggled with the spirit lamp and saucepan, and then was obliged to go and fetch some sugar. Midnight struck as he was pouring out the tea. "'I must be off,' said Denise. "'Presently,' replied Pauline. "'The theatres don't close so early.' Denise felt uncomfortable in this bachelor's room. She had seen her friend take off her things, turn down the bed, open it, and pat the pillows with her naked arms, and these preparations for a night of love-making carried on before her, troubled her, and made her feel ashamed, awakening once in her wounded heart the recollection of Hutin. Such ideas were not very salutary. At last she left them, at a quarter past twelve, but she went away confused, when in reply to her innocent, "'Good night!' Pauline cried out thoughtlessly, "'Thanks! We are sure to have a good one!' The private door leading to Moret's apartments and to the employees' bedrooms was in the Rue Neveau Saint Augustine. Madame Cabille opened the door and gave a glance in order to mark the return. A night light was burning dimly in the hall, and Denise, finding herself in this uncertain light, hesitated and was seized with fear, for on turning the corner of the street she had seen the door close on the vague shadow of a man. It must have been the governor coming home from a party, and the idea that he was there in the dark waiting for her perhaps, caused her one of those strange fears with which she still inspired her, without any reasonable cause. Someone moved on the first floor, a boot creaked, and losing her head entirely, she pushed open the door, which led into the shop, and which was always left open for the night watch. She was in the printed cotton department. "'Good heavens! What shall I do?' she stammered in her emotion. The idea occurred to her that there was another door upstairs leading to the bedrooms, but she would have to go right across the shop. She preferred this, notwithstanding the darkness reigning in the galleries. Not a gas-jet was burning. There were only a few oil-lamps hung here and there on the branches of the lustres, and these scattered lights, like yellow patches, their rays lost in the gloom, resembled the lanterns hung up in a mine. Big shadows loomed in the air. One could hardly distinguish the piles of goods, which assumed alarming profiles, fallen columns, squatting beasts, and lurking thieves. The heavy silence, broken by distant respirations, increased still more in the darkness. However, she saw where she was. The linen department on her left formed a dead colour, like the blueness of houses in the street under the summer sky. Then she wished to cross the hall immediately, but running up against some piles of printed calico, she thought it safer to follow the hosiery department, and then the woollen one. There she was frightened by a loud noise of snoring. It was Joseph, the messenger, sleeping behind some articles of mourning. She quickly ran into the hall, now illuminated by the skylight, with a sort of crepuscular light, which made it appear larger, full of a nocturnal church-like terror, with the immobility of its shelves, and the shadows of its yard meshes, which described reversed crosses. She now fairly ran away. In the mercery and glove department she nearly walked over some more messengers, and only felt safe when she at last found herself on the staircase. But upstairs, before the ready-made department, she was seized with fear on perceiving a lantern moving forward, twinkling in the darkness. It was the watch, two firemen marking their passage on the faces on the indicators. She stood a moment, unable to understand it, watched them passing from the shawl to the furniture department, then to the underlinen one, terrified by their strange manoeuvres, by the grinding of the key, and by the closing of the iron doors which made a murderous noise. When they approached, she took refuge in the lace department, but a sound of talking made her hastily depart, and run off to the outer door. She had recognised Deloche's voice. 
he slept in his department, on a little iron bedstead which he set up himself every evening, and he was not asleep yet, recalling the pleasant hours he had just spent. "'What? Is that you, mademoiselle?' said Moret, whom Denise found before her on the staircase, a small pocket candlestick in his hand. She stammered, and tried to explain that she had come to look for something. But he was not angry. He looked at her with his paternal, and at the same time curious, air. "'You had permission to go to the theatre, then?' "'Yes, sir.' "'And have you enjoyed yourself? What theatre did you go to?' "'I have been in the country, sir.' That made him laugh. Then he asked, laying a certain stress on this question, "'All alone?' "'No, sir, with a lady friend,' replied she, her cheeks burning, shocked at the idea which he no doubt entertained. He said no more, but he was still looking at her in her simple black dress and hat trimmed with a single blue ribbon. Was this little savage going to turn out a pretty girl? She looked all the better for her day in the open air, charming with her splendid hair falling over her forehead. And he, who during the last six months had treated her like a child, sometimes giving her advice, yielding to a desire to gain experience, to a wicked wish to know how a woman sprung up and lost herself in Paris, no longer laughed, experiencing a feeling of surprise and fear mingled with tenderness. No doubt it was a lover who embellished her like this. At this thought he felt as if stung to the quick by a favourite bird with which he was playing. "'Good night, sir,' murmured Denise, continuing her way without waiting. He did not answer, but stood watching her till she disappeared. Then he entered his own apartments. End of chapter 5, part 3section 13 of the ladies paradise by emile sola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain read by christine g chapter 6 part 1 when the dead summer season arrived there was quite a panic at the ladies paradise the reign of terror commenced a great many employees were sent away on leave and others were dismissed in dozens by the principals who wished to clear the shop no customers appearing during the July and August heat. Moret, on making his daily inspection with Bortoncle, called aside the managers, whom he had prompted during the winter to engage more men than were necessary, so that the business should not suffer, leaving them to weed out their staff later on. It was now a question of reducing expenses by getting rid of quite a third of the shop people, the weak ones who allowed themselves to be swallowed up by the strong ones. Come! he would say. You must have some who don't suit you. We can't keep them all this time doing nothing. And if the manager hesitated, hardly knowing whom to sacrifice, he would continue. Make your arrangements. Six salesmen must suffice. You can take on others in October. There are plenty to be had. As a rule, Bordoncle undertook the executions. He had a terrible way of saying, Go and be paid, which fell like a blow from an axe. Anything served him as a pretext for clearing off the superfluous staff. He invented misdeeds, speculating on the slightest negligence. "'You were sitting down, sir. Go and be paid.' "'You dare to answer me? Go and be paid.' "'Your shoes are not clean. Go and be paid.' And even the bravest trembled in presence of the massacre which he left behind him. Then, this system not working quick enough, he invented a trap by which he got rid in a few days— without fatigue, of the number of salesmen condemned beforehand. At eight o'clock he took his stand at the door, watch in hand, and at three minutes past the hour the breathless young people were greeted with the implacable, "'Go and be paid!' This was a quick and cleanly method of doing the work. "'You've an ugly mug,' he ended by saying one day to a poor wretch whose nose, all on one side, annoyed him. "'Go and be paid!' The favoured ones obtained a fortnight's holiday without pay, which was a more humane way of lessening the expenses. The salesmen accepted their precarious situation, obliged to do so by necessity and habit. Since their arrival in Paris, they had roamed about, commencing their apprenticeship here, finishing it there, getting dismissed or themselves resigning all at once, as interest dictated. When business stood still, the workmen were deprived of their daily bread and this was well understood in the indifferent march of the machine. The useless workmen were quickly thrown aside, like so much old plant. There was no gratitude shown for services rendered. 
so much the worse for those who did not know how to look after themselves. Nothing else was now talked of in the various departments. Fresh stories circulated every day. The dismissed salesmen were named, as one counts the dead in time of cholera. The shawl and the woolen departments suffered especially. Seven employees disappeared from them in one week. Then the underlinen department was thrown into confusion. A customer had nearly fainted away, accusing the young person who had served her of eating garlic, and the latter was dismissed at once, although, badly fed and dying of hunger, she was simply finishing a collection of bread crusts at the counter. The authorities were pitiless at the least complaint from the customers. No excuse was admitted, the employee was always wrong, and had to disappear like a defective instrument, hurtful to the proper working of the business and the others bowed their heads, not even attempting any defence. In the panic which was raging, each one trembled for himself. Mignon, going out one day with a parcel under his coat, notwithstanding the rules, was nearly caught, and really thought himself lost. Leonard, who was celebrated for his idleness, owed to his father's position in the drapery tray that he was not turned away one afternoon that Bordoncle found him dozing between two piles of English velvets but the Lhommes were especially anxious, expecting every day to see their son Albert sent away, the governor being dissatisfied with his conduct at the pay-desk. He frequently had women there who distracted his attention from his work, and twice Madame Moralie had been obliged to plead for him with the principals. Denise was so menaced amid this general clearance that she lived in the continual expectation of a catastrophe. It was in vain that she summoned up her courage— struggling with all her gaiety and all her reason not to yield to the misgiving of her tender nature. She burst out into blinding tears as soon as she had closed the door of her bedroom, desolated at the thought of seeing herself in the street, on bad terms with her uncle, not knowing where to go, without a sou saved, and having the two children to look after. The sensations she had felt the first few weeks sprang up again. She fancied herself a grain of seed under a powerful millstone, and, utterly discouraged, she abandoned herself entirely to the thought of what a small atom she was in this great machine, which would certainly crush her with its quiet indifference. There was no illusion possible. If they sent away any one from her department, she knew it would be her. No doubt, during the Rambolet excursion, the other young ladies had incensed Madame Moralie against her, for since then that lady had treated her with an air of severity in which there was a certain rancour. Besides, they could not forgive her going to Joinville, regarding it as a sign of revolt, a means of setting the whole department at defiance, by parading about with the young lady from a rival counter. Never had Denise suffered so much in the department, and she now gave up all hope of conquering it. "'Leave them alone,' repeated Pauline. A lot of stuck-up things as stupid as donkeys. But it was just these fine lady airs which intimidated Denise. Nearly all the saleswomen, by their daily contact with the rich customers, assumed certain graces, and finished by forming a vague nameless class, something between a work girl and a middle-class lady. But beneath their art in dress, and the manners and phrases learnt by heart, there was often only a false superficial education, the fruits of attending cheap theatres and music halls, and picking up all the current stupidities of the Paris pavement. "'You know that unkempt girl has got a child,' said Clara one morning, on arriving in the department. And, as they seemed astonished, she continued, "'I saw her yesterday myself, taking the child out for a walk. She's got it stowed away in the neighbourhood somewhere.' Two days after, Marguerite came up after dinner with another piece of news. "'A nice thing! I've just seen the unkempt girl's lover, a workman, just fancy. "'Yes, a dirty little workman, with yellow hair, who was watching her through the windows.' "'From that moment it was an accepted truth. "'Denise had a workman for a lover, and an infant concealed somewhere in the neighbourhood. "'They overwhelmed her with spiteful illusions. "'The first time she understood, she turned quite pale before the monstrosity of their suppositions. "'It was abominable.' She tried to explain and stammered out, "'But they are my brothers!' "'Oh, oh, her brothers!' said Clara in a bantering tone. Madame Moralie was obliged to interfere. "'Be quiet, young ladies. You have better go on changing those tickets. 
Mademoiselle Baudu is quite free to misbehave herself out of doors, if only she worked a bit when here. This curt defence was a condemnation. The young girl, feeling choked as if they had accused her of a crime, vainly endeavoured to explain the facts. They laughed and shrugged their shoulders, and she felt wounded to the heart. On hearing the rumour, Deloche was so indignant that he wanted to slap the faces of the young ladies in Denise's department, and was only restrained by the fear of compromising her. Since the evening at Joinville, he entertained a submissive love, an almost religious friendship with her, which he proved by his faithful dog-like looks. He was careful not to show his affection before the others, for they would have laughed at them, but that did not prevent his dreaming of the avenging blow, if ever any one should attack her before him. Denise finished by not answering the insults. It was too odious, nobody would believe it. When any girl ventured a fresh solution, she contented herself with looking at her with a sad, calm air. Besides, she had other troubles, material anxieties which took up her attention. Sean went on as bad as ever, always worrying her for money. Hardly a week passed that she did not receive some fresh story from him, four pages long, and when the house postman brought her these letters, in a big, passionate handwriting, she hastened to hide them in her pocket, for the saleswoman affected to laugh, and sung snatches of some doubtful ditties. Then, after having invented a pretext to go to the other end of the establishment and read the letters, she was seized with fear. Poor Sean seemed to be lost. All his fibs went down with her. She believed all his extraordinary love adventures, her complete ignorance of such things making her exaggerate the danger. Sometimes it was a two-franc piece to enable him to escape the jealousy of some woman. At other times five francs, six francs, to get some poor girl out of a scrape, whose father would otherwise kill her so that as her salary and commission did not suffice, she had conceived the idea of looking for a little work after business hours. She spoke about it to Robineau, who had shown a certain sympathy for her since their meeting at Vincart's, and he had procured her the making of some neckties at five sous a dozen. At night, between nine and one o'clock, she could do six dozen, which made thirty sous, out of which she had to deduct four sous for a candle. But as this sum kept Sean going, she did not complain of the want of sleep, and would have thought herself very happy, had not another catastrophe once more overthrown her budget calculations. At the end of the second fortnight, when she went to the necktie dealer, she found the door closed. The woman had failed, become bankrupt, thus carrying off her eighteen francs six sous, a considerable sum on which she had been counting for the last week. All the annoyances in the department disappeared before this disaster. "'You look dull.' said Pauline, meeting her in the furniture gallery, looking very pale. "'Are you in want of anything?' But as Denise already owed her friend twelve francs, she tried to smile and replied, "'No, thanks. I've not slept well, that's all.' It was the 20th of July, when the panic caused by the dismissals was at its worst. Out of the four hundred employees, Bordoncle had already sacked fifty, and there were rumours of fresh executions. She thought but little of the menaces which were flying about, entirely taken up by the anguish of one of Sean's adventures, still more terrifying than the others. This very day he wanted fifteen francs, which some alone could save him from the vengeance of an outraged husband. The previous evening she had received the first letter opening the drama. Then, one after the other, came two more. In the last, which she was finishing when Pauline met her, Sean announced his death for that evening, if she did not send the money. She was in agony. Impossible to take it out of Pepe's board, pay two days before. Every sort of bad luck was pursuing her, for she had hoped to get her eighteen francs six sous through Robineau, who could perhaps find the necktie dealer, but Robineau, having got a fortnight's holiday, had not returned the previous night as he was expected to do. However, Pauline still questioned her in a friendly way. When they met, in an out-of-the-way department, they conversed for a few minutes, keeping a sharp lookout the while. Suddenly, Pauline made a move as if to run off, having observed the white tie of an inspector who was coming out of the shawl department. "'Ah, it's only old Jove,' murmured she in a relieved tone. "'I can't think what makes the old man grin as he does when he sees us together. In your place I should beware, for he's too kind to you.' He's an old humbug, as spiteful as a cat, and thinks he's still got his troopers to talk to. It was quite true. Jove was detested by all the salespeople for the severity of his treatment. 
more than half the dismissals were the result of his reports and with his big red nose of a rakish ex-captain he only exercised his leniency in the departments served by women why should i be afraid asked Anise. well replied pauline laughing perhaps you may exact some return several of the young ladies try to keep well with him Jove had gone away pretending not to see them and they heard him dropping on to a salesman in the lace department guilty of watching a fallen horse in the rue neveau saint augustine by the way resumed pauline weren't you looking for monsieur robineau yesterday he's come back denise thought she was saved thanks i'll go round the other way then and pass through the silk department so much the worse they sent me upstairs to the workroom to fetch a bodkin and they separated the young girl with a busy look as if she were running from pay-desk to pay-desk in search for something arrived on the stairs and went down into the hall it was a quarter to ten the first lunch-bell had rung a warm sun was playing on the windows and notwithstanding the grey linen blinds the heat penetrated into the stagnant air now and then a refreshing breath arose from the floor which the messengers were gently watering it was a somnolence a summer siesta in the midst of the empty space around the counters like the interior of a church wrapped in sleeping shadow after the last mass some listless salesmen were standing about a few rare customers were crossing the galleries and the hall with the fatigued step of women annoyed by the sun just as denise went down pavier was measuring a dress length of light silk with pink spots for madame Botarel, arrived in paris the previous day from the south since the commencement of the month the provinces had been sending up their detachments one saw nothing but queerly dressed ladies with yellow shawls green skirts and flaring bonnets the shopmen indifferent were too indolent to laugh at them even pavier accompanied madame Botarel to the mercery department and on returning said to Hutton, "'Yesterday they were all Auvergnat women. Today they're all Provençal. I'm sick of them.' But Hutin rushed forward. It was his turn, and he had recognised the pretty lady, the lovely blonde whom the department thus designated, knowing nothing about her, not even her name. They all smiled at her. Not a week passed without her coming to the lady's paradise, always alone.' This time she had a little boy of four or five with her, and this gave rise to some comment. "'She's married, then?' asked Favier, when Hutin returned from the pay-desk, where he had debited her with thirty yards of duchess satin. "'Possibly,' replied he, "'although the youngster proves nothing. Perhaps he belongs to a lady friend. What certain is that she must have been weeping. She's so melancholy, and her eyes are so red.' A silence ensued. The two salesmen gazed vaguely into the depths of the shop. Then Favier resumed in a low voice. "'If she's married, perhaps her husband's given her a drubbing.' "'Possibly,' repeated Hutin, "'unless it be a lover who has left her.' And after a fresh silence he added, "'Anyway, I don't care a hang.' At this moment Denise crossed the silk department, slackening her pace and looking around her, trying to find Robinon. She could not see him, so she went into the linen department then passed through again the two salesmen had noticed her movements there's that bag of bones again murmured hutin she's looking for robinot said favier i can't think what they're up to together oh nothing smutty robinot's too big of a fool they say he has procured her for a little work some neckties what a speck eh hutin was meditating something spiteful when denise passed near he stopped her saying is it me you're looking for she turned very red since the joinville excursion she dared not read her heart full of confused sensations she was constantly recalling his appearance with that red-haired girl and if she still trembled before him it was doubtless from uneasiness had she ever loved him did she love him still she hardly liked to stir up these things which were painful to her no sir she replied embarrassed Hutard then began to laugh at her uneasy manner. "'Would you like us to serve him to you? Favier, just serve this young lady with Robinot.' She looked at him fixedly, with a sad, calm look with which she had received the wounding remarks the young ladies had made about her. Ah, he was spiteful. He attacked her as well as the others. And she felt a sort of supreme anguish, the breaking of a last tie. 
her face expressed such real suffering that favier though not of a very tender nature came to her assistance monsieur robineau is in the stock-room said he no doubt he will be back for lunch you'll find him here this afternoon if you want to speak to him denise thanked him and went up to her department where madame Aurélie was waiting for her in a terrible rage what she had been gone half an hour where had she just sprung from not from the workroom that was quite certain the poor girl hung down her head thinking of this avalanche of misfortunes all would be over if robineau did not come in however she resolved to go down again in the silk department robineau's return had provoked quite a revolution the salesman had hoped that disgusted with the annoyances they were incessantly causing him he would not return and in fact there was a moment when pressed by vincar to take over his business he had almost decided to do so hutin's secret working the mine he had been laying under the second hand's feet for months past was about to be sprung during robineau's holidays hutin who had taken his place as second hand had done his best to injure him in the minds of the principals and get possession of his situation by an excess of zeal he discovered and reported all sorts of trifling irregularities suggested improvements and invented new designs in fact every one in the department from the unpaid probationer longing to become a salesman up to the first salesman who coveted the situation of manager they all had one fixed idea and that was to dislodge the comrade above them to ascend another rung of the ladder swallowing him up if necessary and this struggle of appetites this pushing the one against the other even contributed to the better working of the machine provoking business and increasing tenfold the success which was astonishing paris behind hutin there was favier then behind favier came the others in a long line one heard a loud noise as of jawbones working robineau was condemned each one was grabbing after his bone so that when the second hand reappeared there was a general grumbling the matter had to be settled the salesman's attitude appeared so menacing that the head of the department had sent robineau to the stock-room in order to give the authorities time to come to a decision we would sooner all leave if they kept him declared hutin this affair bothered boutemont whose gaiety ill accorded with such an internal vexation he was pained to see nothing but scowling faces round him however he wished to be just come leave him alone he doesn't hurt you but they protested energetically what doesn't hurt us an insupportable object always irritable capable of walking over your body he is so proud this was the great bitterness of the department robineau nervous as a woman was intolerably stiff and susceptible they related scores of stories a poor little fellow who had fallen ill through it and lady customers even who had been humiliated by his nasty remarks well gentlemen i won't take anything on myself said boutemont i'm notified the directors and i'm going to speak about it shortly the second lunch bell rang the clang of which came up from the basement distant and deadened in the close air of the shop hutin and favier went down from all the counters the salesmen were arriving one by one helter-skelter hastening below the narrow entrance to the kitchen a damp passage always lighted with gas the throng pushed forward without a laugh or a word amidst an increasing noise of crockery and a strong odour of food at the extremity of the passage there was a sudden halt before a wicket flanked with piles of plates armed with forks and spoons which he was plunging in the copper pans a cook was distributing the portions and when he stood aside the flaring kitchen could be seen behind his white covered belly of course muttered hutin consulting the bill of fare written on a blackboard above the wicket beef and pungent sauce or skate never any roast meat in this rotten shop their boiled beef and fish don't do a bit of good to a fellow moreover the fish was universally neglected for the pan was quite full favier however took some skate behind him hutin stooped down saying beef and pungent sauce with a mechanical movement the cook picked up a piece of meat and poured a spoonful of sauce over it and hutin suffocated by the ardent breath from the kitchen had hardly got his portion before the words beef pungent sauce beef pungent sauce followed each other like a litany whilst the cook continued to pick up the meat and pour over the sauce with the rapid and rhythmical movement of a well-regulated clock. 
but the skate's cold declared favier whose hand felt no warmth from the plate they were all hurrying along now with their plates held up straight for fear of running up against one another ten steps further was the bar another wicket with a shiny sink counter on which were ranged the shares of wine small bottles without corks still damp from rinsing and each took one of these bottles in his empty hand as he passed and then completely laden made for his table with a serious air careful not to spill anything hutar grumbled this is a fine dance with all this crockery their table favier's and his was at the end of the corridor in the last dining-room the rooms were all alike old cellars twelve feet by fifteen which had been cemented over and fitted up as refectories but the damp came through the paintwork the yellow walls were covered with greenish spots and from the narrow air-holes opening on the street on a level with the pavement there fell a livid light incessantly traversed by the vague shadows of the passers-by in july as in december one was stifled in the warm air laden with nauseous smells coming from the neighbourhood of the kitchen hutar went in first on the table which was fixed at one end to the wall and covered with american cloth there were only the glasses knives and forks marking off the places a pile of clean plates stood at each end whilst in the middle was a big loaf a knife sticking in it with a handle in the air hutar got rid of his bottle and laid down his plate then after having taken his napkin from the bottom of a set of pigeon-holes the sole ornament on the walls he heaved a sigh and sat down i am fearfully hungry too he murmured it's always like that replied favier who took his place on the left nothing to eat when one is starving the table was rapidly filling it contained twenty-two places at first nothing was heard but a loud clattering of knives and forks the gormandizing of big fellows with stomachs emptied by thirteen hours daily work formerly the employees had an hour for meals which enabled them to go outside to a cafe and take their coffee and they would dispatch their dinner in twenty minutes anxious to get into the street but this stirred them up too much they came back careless indisposed for business and the managers had decided that they should not go out but pay an extra three halfpence for a cup of coffee if they wanted it so that now they were in no hurry but prolonged the meal not at all anxious to go back to work before time a great many read some newspaper between mouthfuls the journal folded and placed against their bottle others their first hunger satisfied talked noisily always returning to the eternal grievance of the bad food the money they had earned what they had done the previous sunday and what they were going to do on the next one i say what about your robineau asked the salesman of hutin the struggle between the salesmen of the silk department and their second hand occupied all the counters the question was discussed every evening at the cafe saint roche until midnight hutin who was busy with his piece of beef contented himself with replying well he's come back robineau has then suddenly getting angry he resumed but confound it they've given me a bit of a donkey i believe it's becoming disgusting my word of honour you needn't grumble said favier i was flat enough to ask for skate it's putrid they were all speaking at once some complaining some joking at a corner of the table against the wall the loche was silently eating he was afflicted with an enormous appetite which he had never been able to satisfy and not earning enough to afford any extras he cut himself enormous chunks of bread and swallowed up the least savoury platefuls with an air of greediness they all laughed at him crying favier pass your skate to deloche he likes it like that and your meat out deloche wants it for his dessert the poor fellow shrugged his shoulders and did not even reply it wasn't his fault if he was dying of hunger besides the others might abuse the food as much as they liked they swallowed it up all the same but a low whistling stopped their talk moret and bourdoncle were in the corridor for some time the complaints had become so frequent that the principals pretended to come and judge for themselves the quality of the food they gave thirty sous a head per day to the chief cook who had to pay everything provisions coal gas and staff and they displayed a naive astonishment when the food was not good this very morning even each department had deputed a spokesman Mignon and Leonard had undertaken to speak for their comrades, and in the sudden silence all ears were stretched out to catch the conversation going on in the next room, 
where Moray and Bordoncle had just entered. The latter declared the beef excellent, and Mignon, astonished by this quiet affirmation, was repeating, "'But chew it, and see!' whilst Leonard, attacking the skate, was gently saying, "'But it stinks, sir.' Moray then launched into a cordial speech. He would do everything for his employees' welfare. He was their father, and would rather eat dry bread than see them badly fed. "'I promise you to look into the matter.' said he in conclusion, raising his voice so that they should hear it from one end of the passage to the other. The inquiry being finished, the noise of the knives and forks commenced once more. Hutar muttered, "'Yes, reckon on that, and drink water. Ah, they're not stingy of soft words. Want some promises, they are, and they continue to feed you an old boot leather, and to chuck you out like dogs.' The salesman who had already questioned him repeated, "'You say that, Robin all but a noise of heavy crockery-ware drowned his voice. The men changed their plates themselves, and the piles at both ends were diminishing. When a kitchen help brought in some large tin dishes, Hutar cried out, "'Baked rice! This is a finisher!' "'Good for a pennyworth of gum,' said Favier, serving himself. Some liked it, others thought it too sticky. There were some who remained quite silent, plunged in the fiction of their newspaper, not even knowing what they were eating." They were all mopping their foreheads. The narrow cellar-like apartment was full of a ruddy steam, whilst the shadows of the passers-by were continually passing in black bands over the untidy cloth. "'Pass the loche de bread!' cried out one of the wags. Each one cut a piece, and then dug the knife into the loaf up to the handle, and the bread still went round. "'Who'll take my rice for dessert?' asked Hutar. When he had concluded his bargain with a short, thin young fellow, he attempted to sell his wine also, but no one would take it. It was known to be detestable. "'As I was telling you, Robinot is back,' he continued, amid a cross-fire of laughter and conversation that was going on. "'Oh, his affair is a grave one. Just fancy, he has been debauching the saleswomen. Yes, and he gets some cravats to make.' "'Silence!' exclaimed Favier. "'They're just judging him.' and he pointed to Bottemont, who was walking in the passage between Moray and Bordoncle, all three absorbed in an animated conversation, carried on in a low tone. The dining-room of the managers and second-hands happened to be just opposite. Therefore, when Bottemont saw Moray pass, he got up, having finished, and related the affair, explaining the awkward position he was in. The other two listened, still refusing to sacrifice Robineau, a first-class salesman, who dated from Madame Hedouin's time, but when he came to the story of the neckties, Bordoncle got angry. Was this fellow mad to interfere with the saleswomen and procure them extra work? The house paid dear enough for the women's time. If they worked on their own account at night, they worked less during the day in the shop. That was certain. Therefore it was a robbery. They were risking their health, which did not belong to them. No, the night was made for sleep. They must all sleep, or they would be sent to the right about. Getting rather warm, remarked Hutar. Every time the three men passed the dining-room, the shopmen watched them, commenting on the slightest gestures. They had forgotten the baked rice, in which a cashier had just found a brace button. "'I heard the word cravat,' said Favier, "'and you saw how Bordoncle's face turned pale as once.'" End of chapter 6, part 1「Section 14 of the Ladies' Paradise by Emile Sola, translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter 6, Part 2 Moray shared his partner's indignation. That a saleswoman should be reduced to work at night seemed to him an attack on the organization of the Ladies' Paradise. Who was the stupid that couldn't earn enough in the business? But when Boutemont named Denise, he softened down, and invented excuses. Ah, yes, that poor little girl, she wasn't very sharp, and was greatly burdened, it was said. Bordoncle interrupted him to declare they ought to send her off immediately. They would never do anything with such an ugly creature, he had always said so, and he seemed to be indulging a spiteful feeling. Moret, perplexed, affected to laugh. Dear me, what a severe man! Couldn't they forgive her for once? They could call in the culprit and give her a scolding. In short, 
Robineau was the most to blame, for he ought to have dissuaded her, he, an old hand, knowing the ways of the house. Well, there's the governor laughing now, resumed Favier, astonished, as the group again passed the door. Ah, by Jove, exclaimed Toutain, if they persist in shoving Robineau on our shoulders, we'll make it lively for them. Bourdoncle looked straight at Moret. Then he simply assumed a disdainful expression to initiate that he saw how it was, and thought it idiotic. Boutemont resumed his complaints, the salesmen threatened to leave, and there were some very good men amongst them. But what appeared to touch these gentlemen especially was the rumour of Robineau's friendly relations with Gorgon. The latter, it was said, was urging the former to set up for himself in the neighbourhood, offering him an amount of credit to run in opposition to the ladies' paradise. There was a pause. Ah, Robineau was thinking of showing fight, was he? Moret had become serious. He affected a certain scorn, avoided coming to a decision, treating it as a matter of no importance. They would see, they would speak to him. And he immediately commenced to joke with Boutemont, whose father, arrived two days before from his little shop at Montpellier, had been nearly choked with rage and indignation on seeing the immense hall in which his son reigned. They were still laughing about the old man, who, recovering his southern assurance, had immediately commenced to run everything down, pretending that the drapery business would soon go to the dogs. "'Here's Robineau,' said Boutemont. "'I sent him to the stock-room to avoid any unpleasant occurrence. Excuse me if I insist, but things are in such an unpleasant state that something must be done.' Robineau, who had just come in, passed by the group with a bow, on his way to the table. Moret simply repeated, "'All right, we'll see about it.' And they separated. Hutin and Favier were still waiting for them, but on seeing they did not return, relieved their feelings. Was the governor coming down like this to every meal, to count the mouthfuls? A nice thing if they could not even eat in peace. The truth was, they had just seen Robineau come in, and the governor's good humour made them anxious for the result of the struggle they were engaged in. They lowered their voices, trying to find fresh subjects for grumbling. "'But I'm dying of hunger,' continued Hutin aloud. "'One is hungrier than ever on getting up from table.' And yet he had eaten two portions of dessert, his own and the one he had exchanged for his plate of rice. All at once he cried out, "'Hang it! I'm going in for an extra. Victor, give me another dessert!' The waiter was finishing serving the desserts. He then brought in the coffee, and those who took it gave him their three sous there and then. A few fellows had gone away, dawdling along the corridor, looking for a dark corner in which they could smoke a cigarette. The others remained at table before the heaps of greasy plates and dishes, rolling up the breadcrumbs into little bullets, going over the same old stories, in the odour of broken food, and the sweltering heat that was reddening their airs. The walls reeked with moisture, a slow asphyxia fell from the mouldy ceiling. Standing against the wall was the loge, stuffed with bread, digesting in silence, his eyes on the air-hole. His daily recreation, after lunch, was to watch the feet of the passers-by spinning along the street, a continual procession of living feet, big boots, elegant boots, and ladies' tiny boots, without head or body. On rainy days it was very dirty. "'What? Already?' exclaimed Hutin. A bell rang at the end of the passage. They had to make way for the third lunch. The waiters came in with pails of warm water and big sponges to clean the American cloth. Gradually the rooms became empty. The salesmen returned to their departments, lingering on the stairs. In the kitchen, the head cook had resumed his place at the wicket, between the pants of skate, beef, and sauce, armed with his forks and spoons ready to fill the plates anew with the rhythmical movement of a well-regulated clock. As Hutin and Favier slowly withdrew, they saw Denise coming down. "'Monsieur Robineau is back, mademoiselle,' said the former with sneering politeness. "'He is still at table,' added the other. "'But if it's anything important, you can go in.' Denise continued on her way without replying or turning round but when she passed the dining-room of the managers and second-hands, she could not help just looking in, and saw that Robineau was really there. She resolved to try and speak to him in the afternoon, and continued her journey along the corridor to her dining-room, which was at the other end. The women took their meals apart, in two special rooms. 
Denise entered the first one. It was also an old cellar, transformed into a refectory, but it had been fitted up with more comfort. On the oval table, in the middle of the apartment, the fifteen places were further apart, and the wine was in decanters. A dish of skate and a dish of beef with pungent sauce occupied the two ends of the table. Waiters in white aprons attended to the young ladies, and spared them the trouble of fetching their portions from the wicket. The management had thought that more decent. "'You went round, then?' asked Pauline, already seated and cutting herself some bread. "'Yes,' replied Denise, blushing. "'I was accompanying a customer.' But this was a falsehood. Clara nudged her neighbour. What was the matter with the unkempt girl? She was quite strange in her ways. One after the other she had received letters from her lover. Then she went running all over the shop like a madwoman, pretending to be going to the workroom, where she did not even make an appearance. There was something up that was certain. Then Clara, eating her skate without disgust, with the indifference of a girl who had been used to nothing better than rancid bacon, spoke of a frightful drama, the account of which filled the newspapers. "'You've heard about that man cutting his mistress's throat with a racer, haven't you?' "'Well,' said a little, quiet, delicate-looking girl belonging to the underlinen department, "'he found her with another fellow. Serve her right.' But Pauline protested. "'What? Just because one had ceased to love a man, he should be allowed to cut your throat? Ah, no, never!' And stopping all at once, she turned round to the waiter, saying, "'Pierre, I can't get through this beef. Just tell them to do me an extra, an omelette, nice and soft, if possible.' To pass away the time, she took out some chocolate which she began eating with her bread, for she always had her pockets full of sweetmeats. "'Certainly isn't very amusing with such a fellow,' resumed Clara. "'And some people are fearfully jealous, you know. Only the other day there was a workman who pitched his wife into a well.' She kept her eyes on her niece, thinking she had guessed her trouble on seeing her turn pale. Evidently this little prude was afraid of being beaten by her lover, whom she no doubt deceived. It would be a lark if he came right into the shop after her, as she seemed to fear he would. But the conversation took another turn. One of the girls was giving a recipe for cleaning velvet. They then went on to speak of a piece at the gaiety, in which some darling little children danced better than any grown-up persons. Pauline, saddened for a moment at the sight of her omelette, which was overdone, resumed her gaiety on finding it went down fairly well. "'Pass the wine,' said she to Denise. "'You should go in for an omelette. "'Oh, the beef is enough for me.' replied the young girl, who, to avoid expense, confined herself to the food provided by the house, no matter how repugnant it might be. When the waiter brought in the baked rice, the young ladies protested. They had refused it the previous week, and hoped it would not appear again. Their niece, inattentive, worrying about Sean after Clara's stories, was the only one to eat it. All the others looked at her with an air of disgust. There was a great demand for extras. They gorged themselves with jam. This was a sort of elegance. They felt obliged to feed themselves with their own money. "'You know the gentlemen have complained,' said the little delicate girl from the underlinen department. "'And the management has promised.' They interrupted her with a burst of laughter, and commenced to talk about the management. All the girls took coffee but Denise, who couldn't bear it, she said. And they lingered there before their cups, the young ladies from the underlinen department in woolen dress, with middle-class simplicity the young ladies from the dress department in silk, their napkins tucked under their chins, in order not to stain their dresses, like ladies who might have come down to the servants' hall to dine with their chambermaids. They had opened the glazed sash of the air-hole to change the stifling poisoned air, but they were obliged to close it at once. The cab-wheels seemed to be passing over the table. "'Hush!' exclaimed Pauline. "'Here's that old beast!' It was Jove, the inspector, who was rather fond of prowling about at meal-times, when the young ladies were there. He was supposed, in fact, to look after their dining-rooms. With a smiling face he would come in and walk round the tables. Sometimes he would even indulge in a little gossip, and inquire if they had made a good lunch. But as he annoyed them and made them feel uncomfortable, they all hastened to get away. Although the bell had not rung, Clara was the first to disappear. The others followed her, so that soon only Denise and Pauline remained. The latter, after having drunk her coffee, was finishing her chocolate drops. All at once she got up, saying, "'I'm going to send the messenger for some oranges. Are you coming?' "'Presently,' replied Denise, 
who was nibbling at a crust, determined to wait till the last, so as to be able to see Robinot on going upstairs. However, when she found herself alone with Jove, she felt uneasy, so she quitted the table. But as she was going towards the door, he stopped her, saying, Mademoiselle Baudu. Standing before her, he smiled with a paternal air. His thick grey moustache and short cropped hair gave him a respectable military appearance, and he threw out his chest, on which was displayed the red ribbon of his decoration. "'What is it, Monsieur Jove?' asked she, feeling reassured. "'I caught you again this morning, talking upstairs behind the carpet department. You know it is not allowed, and if I reported you, she must be very fond of you, your friend Pauline.' His moustache quivered, a flame lighted up his enormous nose. "'What makes you so fond of each other, eh?' Denise, without understanding, was again becoming seized with an uneasy feeling. He was getting too close, and was speaking right in her face. It, "'It's true we were talking, Monsieur Jove, she stammered, "'but there's no harm in talking a bit. "'You are very good to me, and I am very much obliged to you.' "'I ought not to be good,' said he. "'Justice and nothing more is my motto, but when it's a pretty girl.' and he came closer still, and she felt really afraid. Pauline's words came back to her memory. She now remembered the stories going about, stories of girls terrified by old Jove into buying his good will. In the shop, as a rule, he confined himself to little familiarities, such as pinching the cheeks of the complacent young ladies with his fat fingers, taking their hands in his, and keeping them there as if he had forgotten them. This was very paternal, and he only gave way to his real nature outdoors, when they consented to accept a little refreshment at his place in the Rue des Moineaux. "'Leave me alone,' murmured the young girl, drawing back. "'Come,' said he, "'you're not going to play the savage with me, who always treats you well. Be amiable. Come and take a cup of tea and a slice of bread and butter with me this evening. You are very welcome.' She was struggling now. "'No! No!' The dining-room was empty. The waiter had not come back. Jove, listening for the sound of any footsteps, cast a rapid glance around him, and, very excited, losing control over himself, going beyond his fatherly familiarities, he tried to kiss her on the neck. "'What a spiteful, stupid little girl! When one has a head of hair like yours, one should not be so stupid. Come round this evening, just for fun.' But she was very excited, shocked and terrified at the approach of this burning face, of which she could feel the breath. Suddenly she pushed him, so roughly that he staggered and nearly fell on the table. Fortunately a chair saved him, but in the shock some wine left in a glass spurted onto his white necktie and soaked his decoration. And he stood there, without wiping himself, choked with anger at such brutality. What, when he was expecting nothing, when he was not exerting his strength, and was yielding simply to his kindness of heart? Ah, you will be sorry for this, on my word of honour. Denise ran away. Just at that moment the bell rang, but troubled, still shuddering, she forgot Robinot, and went straight to her counter, not daring to go down again. As the sun fell on the frontage of the Place Gaillon of an afternoon, they were all stifling in the first-floor rooms, notwithstanding the grey linen blinds. A few customers came, put the young ladies into a very uncomfortable, warm state, and went away without buying anything. Everyone was yawning, even under Madame Moralis' big sleepy eyes. Towards three o'clock, Denise, seeing the first hand falling off to sleep, quietly slipped off and resumed her journey across the shop with a busy air. To put the curious ones, who might be watching her, off the scent, she did not go straight to the silk department. Pretending to want something in the lace department, she went up to Deloche and asked him a question. Then, on the ground floor, she passed through the printed cottons department, and was just going into the cravat one, when she stopped short, startled and surprised. Sean was before her. "'What? It's you!' she murmured, quite pale. He had on his working blouse, and was bareheaded, with his hair in disorder, the curls falling over his girlish face. Standing before a showcase of narrow black neckties, he appeared to be thinking deeply. "'What are you doing here?' resumed Denise. "'What do you think?' replied he. "'I was waiting for you. You won't let me come. So I came in, but haven't said anything to anybody.' You may feel quite safe. Pretend not to know me, if you like. Some salesmen were already looking at them with astonishment. Sean lowered his voice. She wanted to come with me, you know. Yes, she's close by, opposite the fountain. 
Give me the fifteen francs quick, or we are done for as sure as the sun is shining on us. Denise lost her head. The lookers on were grinning, listening to this adventure. And as there was a staircase behind the cravat department leading to the lower floor, she pushed her brother along and quickly led him below. Downstairs he continued his story, embarrassed, inventing his facts, fearing not to be believed. The money is not for her. She is too respectable for that. And as for her husband, he does not care a straw for fifteen francs. Not for a million would he allow his wife. A glue manufacturer, I tell you. People very well off indeed. No, it's for a low fellow, one of her friends, who has seen us together. And if I don't give him this money this evening... Be quiet, murmured Denise. Presently, do get along. They were now in the parcel's office. The dead season had thrown the vast floor into a sort of torpor, in the pale light from the air-holes. It was cold as well, a silence fell from the ceiling. However, a porter was collecting from one of the compartments the few packets for the neighbourhood of the Madeleine, and, on the larger sorting-table, was seated Campion, the chief clerk, his legs dangling and his eyes wandering about. Sean began again. The husband, who has a big knife. "'Get along,' repeated Denise, still pushing him forward. They followed one of the narrow corridors, where the gas was kept continually burning. To the right and the left in the dark vaults, the reserve goods threw out their shadows behind the gratings. At last she stopped opposite one of these. Nobody was likely to pass that way, but it was not allowed, and she shuddered. "'If this rascal says anything,' resumed Jean, "'the husband, who has a big knife—' "'Where do you expect I can find fifteen francs?' exclaimed Denise in despair. "'Can't you be more careful? You're always getting into some stupid scrape.' He struck his chest amidst all his romantic inventions. He had almost forgotten the exact truth. He dramatized his money once, but there was always some immediate necessity behind this display. "'By all that is sacred, it's really true this time. I was holding her like this, and she was kissing me.' She stopped him again and lost her temper, feeling on thorns, completely at a loss. "'I don't want to know. Keep your wicked conduct to yourself. It's too bad. You ought to know better. You're always tormenting me.' I'm killing myself to keep you in money. Yes, I have to stay up all night at work. Not only that, you are taking the bread out of your little brother's mouth. Sean stood there with his mouth wide open, and all the colour left his face. What? It was not right. And he could not understand. He had always treated his sister like a comrade. He thought it quite a natural thing to open his heart to her. But what choked him above all was to learn she stopped up all night. The idea that he was killing her, and taking Pepe's share as well— affected him so much that he began to cry. "'You're right, I am a scamp,' exclaimed he. "'But it isn't wicked, really, far from it, and that's why one always does it. This woman, Denise, is twenty, and thought it such fun because I'm only seventeen. Really now, I am quite furious with myself. I could slap my face.' He had taken her hands and was kissing them and inundating them with tears. "'Give me the fifteen francs, and this shall be the last time. I swear to you, or rather—' "'No, don't give me anything. I prefer to die. "'If the husband murders me, it will be a good riddance for you.' "'And as she was crying as well, he was stricken with remorse. "'I say that, but of course I'm not sure. "'Perhaps he doesn't want to kill anyone. "'We'll manage. I promise you that, darling. "'Good-bye. I'm off.' "'But a sound of footsteps at the end of the corridor frightened them. "'She quickly drew him close to the grating, in a dark corner. "'For an instant they heard nothing but the hissing of a gas-burner near them.' Then the footsteps drew nearer, and, on stretching out her neck, she recognised Jove, the inspector, who had just entered the corridor, with his stiff military walk. Was he there by chance, or had someone at the door warned him of Sean's presence? She was seized with such a fright that she knew not what to do, and she pushed Sean out of the dark spot where they were concealed, and drove him before her, stammering, "'Be off! Be off!' Both galloped along, hearing Jove behind them, for he also had begun to run. They crossed the parcel's office again, and arrived at the foot of the stairs leading out into the Rue de la Michaudière. "'Be off!' repeated Denise. "'Be off! If I can, I'll send you the fifteen francs all the same.' Sean, bewildered, scampered away. The inspector, who came up panting, out of breath, could only distinguish a corner of his white blouse, and his locks of fair hair flying in the wind. He stood a moment to get his breath, and resume his correct appearance. He had on a brand-new white necktie, the large bow of which shone like a snowflake. "'Well, this is nice behaviour, mademoiselle,' said he, his lips trembling. "'Yes, it's nice, very nice. If you think I'm going to stand this sort of thing in the basement, you're mistaken.' 
and he pursued her with this whilst she was returning to the shop, overcome with emotion, unable to find a word of defence. She was sorry now she had run away. Why hadn't she explained the matter, and brought her brother forward? They would now go and imagine all sorts of villainies, and say what she might, they would not believe her. Once more she forgot Robinon, and went straight to her counter. Jove immediately went to the manager's office to report the matter. But the messenger told him Monsieur Moret was with Monsieur Portoncle and Monsieur Robinon. They had been talking together for the last quarter of an hour. In fact, the door was half open, and he could hear Moret gaily asking Robinon if he had had a pleasant holiday. There was not the least question of a dismissal. On the contrary, the conversation fell on certain things to be done in the department. "'Do you want anything, Monsieur Joffe? explained Moret. "'Come in.' But a sudden instinct warned the inspector. As Bordoncle had come out, he preferred to relate the affair to him. They slowly passed through the shawl department, walking side by side, the one leaning over and talking in a low tone, the other listening, not a sign on his severe face betraying his impression. "'All right,' said the latter at last. And as they had arrived close to the dress department, he went in. Just at that moment, Madame Aurélie was scolding Denise. Where had she come from again? This time she couldn't say she had been to the workroom. Really, these continual absences could not be tolerated any longer. Madame Aurélie, cried Bordoncle. He had decided on a bold stroke, not wishing to consult Moret for fear of some weakness. The first hand came up, and the story was once more related in a low voice. They were all waiting in the expectation of some catastrophe. At last, Madame Aurélie turned round with a solemn air. Mademoiselle Baudou, and her puffy emperor's mask assumed the immobility of the all-powerful. Go and be paid! The terrible phrase sounded very loud in the empty department. The niece stood there pale as a ghost, without saying a word. At last she was able to ask in broken sentences. Me! Me! What for? What have I done? Bordoncle replied, harshly, that she knew very well, that she had better not provoke any explanation, and he spoke of the cravats, and said that it would be a fine thing if all the young ladies received men down in the basement. "'But it was my brother!' cried she, with the grievous anger of an outraged virgin. Marguerite and Clara commenced to laugh. Madame Frédéric, usually so discreet, shook her head with an incredulous air. Always her brother. Really, it was very stupid.' Denise looked round at all of them. Bordoncle, who had taken a dislike to her the first day. Jove, who had stopped to serve as a witness, and from whom she expected no justice. Then these girls, whom she had not been able to soften by nine months of smiling courage, who were happy, in fact, to turn her out of doors. What was the good of struggling? What was the use of trying to impose herself on them when no one liked her? And she went away without a word, not even casting a last look towards this room where she had so long struggled. But as soon as she was alone, before the hall staircase, a deeper sense of suffering filled her grieved heart. No one liked her, and the sudden thought of Moret had just deprived her of all idea of resignation. No, no, she could not accept such a dismissal. Perhaps he would believe this villainous story, this rendezvous with a man down in the cellars. At the thought, a feeling of shame tortured her, and anguish with which she had never before been afflicted. She wanted to go and see him to explain the matter to him, simply to let him know the truth, for she was quite ready to go away as soon as he knew this. And her old fear, the shiver which chilled her when in his presence, suddenly developed into an ardent desire to see him, not to leave the house without telling him she had never belonged to another. It was nearly five o'clock, and the shop was waking up into life again in the cool evening air. She quickly started off to Moray's office, but when she arrived at the door, a hopeless, melancholy feeling again took possession of her. Her tongue refused its office. The intolerable burden of existence again fell on her shoulders. He would not believe her. He would laugh like the others, she thought, and this idea made her almost faint away. All was over. She would be better alone, out of the way, dead. And, without informing Pauline or Deloche, she went at once and took her money. "'You have, mademoiselle?' said the clerk. Twenty-two days, that makes eighteen francs and fourteen sous, to which must be added seven francs for commission. That's right, isn't it? Yes, sir. Thanks. And Denise was going away with her money, when she at last met Robinot. He had already heard of her dismissal, and promised to find the necktie dealer. In a lower tone he tried to console her, but lost his temper. What an existence! 
to be at the continual mercy of a whim, to be thrown out at an hour's notice, without even being able to claim a full month's salary. Denise went up to inform Madame Cabin, saying she would try and send for her box during the evening. It was just striking five when she found herself on the pavement of the Place Gaillon, bewildered, in the midst of the crowd of people and cabs. The same evening when Robineau got home, he received a letter from the management informing him, in a few lines, that for certain reasons relating to the internal arrangements, they were obliged to deprive themselves of his services. He had been in the house seven years, and it was only that afternoon that he was talking to the principals. This was a heavy blow for him. Hutin and Favier were crowing in the silk department, as loudly as Clara and Marguerite in the dress one. A jolly good riddance. Such clean sweeps made room for the others. Deloche and Pauline were the only ones to regret Denise's departure, exchanging, in the rush of business, bitter words of regret at losing her, so kind, so well behaved. Ah, oh, said the young man, if ever she succeeds anywhere else, I should like to see her come back here and trample on the others, a lot of good-for-nothing creatures. It was Bordoncle who in this affair had to bear the brunt of Moray's anger. When the latter heard of Denise's dismissal, he was exceedingly annoyed. As a rule, he never interfered with the staff, but this time he affected to see an encroachment on his power, an attempt to override his authority. Was he no longer master in the place, that they dared to give orders? Everything must pass through his hands, absolutely everything, and he would immediately crush any one who should resist. Then, after making personal inquiries, all the while in a nervous torment which he could not conceal, he lost his temper again. This poor girl was not lying. It was really her brother. Campion had fully recognised him. Why was she sent away, then? He even spoke of taking her back. However, Bordoncle, strong in his passive resistance, bent before the storm. He watched Moret, and one day when he saw him a little calmer, ventured to say in a meaning voice, "'It's better for everybody that she's gone.' Moret stood there looking very awkward, the blood rushing to his face. "'Well,' replied he, laughing. Perhaps you're right. Let's go and take a turn downstairs. Things are looking better. We took nearly a hundred thousand francs yesterday. End of chapter 6, part 2Chapter Seven, Part One. For a moment, Denise stood bewildered on the pavement, in the sun which still shone fiercely at five o'clock. The July heat warmed the gutters. Paris was blazing with the chalky whiteness peculiar to it in summer time, and which produced quite a blinding glare. The catastrophe had happened so suddenly; they had turned her out so roughly that she stood there turning her money over in her pocket in a mechanical way, asking herself where she was to go, and what she was to do. A long line of cabs prevented her quitting the pavement near the Lady's Paradise. When she at last risked herself amongst the wheels, she crossed over the Place Gaillon, as if she intended to go into the Rue Louis-le-Grand. Then she altered her mind, and walked towards the Rue Saint-Roche. But still she had no plan, for she stopped at the corner of the Rue Neveau de Petit Chance, and finally followed it, after looking around her with an undecided air. Arrived at the Passage Choselle, she passed through and found herself in the Rue Monsigny, without knowing how, and ultimately came into the Rue Neveau Saint Augustine again. Her head was filled with a fearful buzzing sensation. She thought of her box on seeing a commissionaire, but where was she to have it taken to, and why all this trouble? when an hour ago she had a bed to go to. Then her eyes fixed on the houses. She began to examine the windows. There were any number of bills, apartments to let. She saw them confusedly, repeatedly seized by the inward emotion which was agitating her whole being. Was it possible, left alone so suddenly, lost in this immense city in which she was a stranger, without support, without resources? She must eat and sleep, however. The streets succeeded one another, the Rue de Molan, the Rue Saint-Anne. She wandered about the neighbourhood, frequently retracing her steps, always brought back to the only spot she really knew well. Suddenly she was astonished. She was again standing before the Lady's Paradise, 
and to escape this obsession she plunged into the Rue de la Michaudière. Fortunately, Baudu was not at his door. The old Elbeuf appeared to be dead behind its murky windows. She would never have dared to show herself at her uncle's, for he affected not to recognize her any more, and she did not wish to become a burden to him in the misfortune he had predicted for her. But, on the other side of the street, a yellow bill attracted her attention. Furnished room to let. It was the first that did not frighten her, so poor did the house appear. She soon recognized it, with its two low stories and rusty-colored front, crushed between the ladies' paradise and the old Hôtel du Villard. On the threshold of the umbrella shop, old Bourras, hairy and bearded like a prophet, and with his glasses on his nose, stood studying the ivory handle of a walking-stick. Hiring the whole house, he underlet the two upper floors furnished, to lighten the rent. "'You have room, sir?' asked Denise, obeying an instinctive impulse. He raised his great bushy eyes, surprised to see her, for he knew all the young persons at the ladies' paradise, and, after observing her clean dress and respectable appearance, he replied, "'It won't suit you.' "'How much is it, then?' replied Denise. Fifteen francs a month.' She asked to see it. On arriving in the narrow shop, and seeing that he was still eyeing her with an astonished air, she told him of her departure from the shop, and of her wish not to trouble her uncle. The old man then went and fetched a key, hanging on a board in the back shop, a small dark room, where he did his cooking and had his bed. Beyond that, behind a dirty window, could be seen a backyard about six feet square. "'I'll walk in front to prevent you falling,' said Bourras, entering the damp corridor which ran along the shop. He stumbled against the lower stair, and commenced the ascent, reiterating his warnings to be careful. Look out! The rail was close against the wall. There was a hole at the corner. Sometimes the lodgers left their dust-boxes there. Denise, in complete obscurity, could distinguish nothing, only feeling the chilliness of the old damp plaster. On the first floor, however, a small window looking into the yard enabled her to see vaguely, as at the bottom of a piece of sleeping-water. The rotten staircase, the walls black with dirt, the cracked and discoloured doors. "'If only one of these rooms were vacant,' resumed Bourras, "'you would be very comfortable there, but they are always occupied by ladies.' On the second floor the light increased, showing up with a raw paleness the distress of the house. A journeyman baker occupied the first room, and it was the other, the further one, that was vacant. When Bourras had opened the door, he was obliged to stay on the landing in order that Denise might enter with ease. The bed placed in the corner nearest the door left just room enough for one person to pass. At the other end there was a small walnut wood chest of drawers, a deal table stained black, and two chairs. The lodgers who did any cooking were obliged to kneel before the fireplace, where there was an earthenware stove. "'You know,' said the old man, it is not luxurious, but the view from the window is gay. You can see the people passing in the street. And, as the niece was looking with surprise at the ceiling just above the bed, where a chance lady lodger had written her name, Ernestine, by drawing the flame of the candle over it, he added with a good-natured smile, If I did a lot of repairs, I should never make both ends meet. There you are. It is all I have to offer. I shall be very well here, declared the young girl. She paid a month in advance, asked for the linen, a pair of sheets and two towels, and made her bed without delay, happy, relieved to know where she was going to sleep that night. An hour after she had sent the commissionaire to fetch her box, and was quite at home. During the first two months she had a terribly hard time of it. Being unable to pay for Pepe's board, she had taken him away, and slept him on an old sofa lent by Bourras. She could not do with less than thirty sous a day, including the rent, even by consenting to live on dry bread herself, in order to procure a bit of meat for the little one. During the first fortnight she got on pretty well, having begun her housekeeping with about ten francs. Besides, she had been fortunate enough to find the cravat dealer, who paid her eighteen francs six sous. But after that she became completely destitute. It was in vain she applied to the various shops, at La Place Cligy, the Bon Marche, the Louvre. The dead season had stopped business everywhere. They told her to apply again in the autumn. More than five thousand employees, dismissed like her, were wandering about Paris in want of places. She then tried to obtain a little work elsewhere, but in her ignorance of Paris she did not know where to apply, 
often accepting most ungrateful tasks, and sometimes even not getting her money. Certain evenings she gave Pepe his dinner alone, a plate of soup, telling him she had dined out, and she would go to bed, her head in a whirl, nourished by the fever which was burning her hands. When Sean dropped suddenly into the midst of this poverty, he called himself a scoundrel with such a despairing violence that she was obliged to tell some falsehood to reassure him, and often found means of slipping a two-franc piece into his hand to prove that she still had money. She never wept before the children. On Sundays, when she would cook a piece of veal in the stove, on her knees before the fire, the narrow room re-echoed with the gaiety of children, careless about existence. Then, when Sean had returned to his master's and Pepe was sleeping, she spent a frightful night in anguish about the coming day. Other fears kept her awake. The two ladies on the first floor received visitors up to a late hour, and sometimes a visitor mistook the floor and came banging at Denise's door. Bourras, having quietly told her not to answer, she buried her face under her pillow to escape hearing their oaths. Then her neighbour, the baker, had shown a disposition to annoy her. He never came home till the morning, and would lay in wait for her as she went to fetch her water. He even made holes in the wall to watch her washing herself, so that she was obliged to hang her clothes against the wall. But she suffered still more from the annoyances of the street, the continual persecution of the passers-by. She could not go downstairs to buy a candle, in these streets swarming with the debauches of the old quarters, without feeling a warm breath behind her, and hearing crude, insulting remarks, and the men pursued her to the very end of the dark passage, encouraged by the sordid appearance of the house. Why had she no lover? It astonished people, and seemed ridiculous. She would certainly have to yield one day. She herself could not have explained why she resisted, menaced as she was by hunger, and perturbed by the desires with which the air around her was warm. One evening Denise had not even any bread for Pepe soup, when a gentleman, wearing a decoration, commenced to follow her. On arriving opposite the passage he became brutal, and it was with a disgusted, shocking feeling that she banged the door in his face. Then, upstairs, she sat down, her hands trembling. The little one was sleeping. What should she say if he woke up and asked for bread? and yet she had only to consent, and her misery would be over. She could have money, dresses, and a fine room. It was very simple. Every one came to that, it was said, for a woman alone in Paris could not live by her labour. But her whole being rose up in protestation, without indignation against the others, simply averse to the disgrace of the thing. She considered life a matter of logic, good conduct, and courage. Denise frequently questioned herself in this way an old love-story floated in her memory, the sailor's betrothed, whom her love guarded from all perils. At Valence she had often hummed over this sentimental ballad, gazing on the deserted street. Had she also a tender affection in her heart that she was so brave? She still thought of Hutin, full of uneasiness. Morning and evening she saw him pass under her window. Now that he was second-hand he walked by himself, amid the respect of the simple salesman. He never raised his head, she thought she suffered from his vanity, and watched him pass without any fear of being discovered. And as soon as she saw Moret, who also passed every day, she began to tremble, and quickly concealed herself, her bosom heaving. He had no need to know where she was lodging. Then she felt ashamed of the house, and suffered at the idea of what he thought of her, although perhaps they would never meet again. The niece still lived amidst the agitation caused by the lady's paradise. A simple wall separated her room from her old apartment, and, from early morning, she went over her day's work, feeling the arrival of the crowd, the increased bustle of business. The slightest noise shook the old house hanging on the flank of the colossus. She felt a gigantic pulse beating. Besides, she could not avoid certain meetings. Twice she had found herself face to face with Pauline, who had offered her services, grieved to see her so unfortunate, and she had even been obliged to tell a falsehood to avoid receiving her friend or paying her a visit, one Sunday, at Borges. But it was more difficult still to defend herself against the luscious, desperate affection. He watched her, aware of all her troubles, waited for her in the doorways. One day he wanted to lend her thirty francs, a brother's savings, he said, with a blush. And these meetings made her regret the shop, continually occupying her with the life they led inside, as if she had not quitted it. No one ever called upon Denise. 
One afternoon she was surprised by a knock. It was Columban. She received him standing. He, looking very awkward, stammered at first, asked how she was getting on, and spoke of the old Elberth. Perhaps it was Uncle Baudu who had sent him, regretting his rigour, for he continued to pass his niece without taking any notice of her, although quite aware of her miserable position. But when she plainly questioned her visitor, he appeared more embarrassed than ever. No, no, it was not the governor who had sent him, and he finished by naming Clara. He simply wanted to talk about Clara. Little by little he became bolder, and asked Denise's advice, supposing that she could be useful to him with her old friend. It was in vain that she tried to dishearten him by reproaching him with the pain he was causing Genevieve, all for this heartless girl. He came up another day, and got into the habit of coming to see her. This sufficed for his timid passion. He continually commenced the same conversation, unable to resist, trembling with joy to be with the girl who had approached Clara. And this caused Denise to live more than ever at the lady's paradise. It was towards the end of September that the young girl experienced the blackest misery. Pepe had fallen ill, having caught a severe cold. He ought to have been nourished with good broth, and she had not even a piece of bread. One evening, completely conquered, she was sobbing, in one of those sombre straits which drive women on to the streets, or into the Seine, when old Bourras gently knocked at the door. He brought a loaf, and a milk-can full of broth. "'There's something for the youngster,' said he, in his abrupt way. "'Don't cry like that. It annoys my lodgers.' And as she thanked him in a fresh outburst of tears, he resumed, "'Do keep quiet. Tomorrow, come and see me. I've some work for you.' Bourras, since the terrible blow dealt him by the ladies' paradise by their opening and umbrella department, had ceased to employ any workmen. He did everything himself to save expenses, the cleaning, mending, and sewing. His trade was also diminishing, so that he was sometimes without work, and he was obliged to invent something to do the next day, when he installed a niece in a corner of his shop. He felt that he could not let any one die of hunger in his house. "'You'll have two francs a day,' said he. "'When you find something better, you can leave me.' She was afraid of him, and did the work so quickly that he hardly knew what else to give her to do. He had given her some silk to stitch, some lace to repair. During the first few days she did not dare raise her head, uncomfortable to know he was close to her, with his lion-like mane, hooked nose, and piercing eyes, under his thick, bushy eyebrows. His voice was harsh, his gestures extravagant, and the mothers of the neighbourhood often frightened their youngsters by threatening to send for him, as they would for a policeman. However, the boys never passed his door without calling out some insulting words, which he did not even seem to hear. All his maniacal anger was directed against the scoundrels who dishonoured his trade, by selling cheap, trashy articles, which dogs would not consent to use. Denise trembled whenever he burst out thus. "'Art is done for, I tell you. There is not a single respectable handle made now. They make sticks, but as for handles, it's all up. Bring me a proper handle, and I'll give you twenty francs.' He had a real artist's pride. Not a workman in Paris was capable of turning out a handle like his, light and strong. He carved the knobs especially with charming ingenuity, continually inventing fresh designs, flowers, fruit, animals, and heads, subjects conceived and executed in a free and lifelike style. A little pocket-knife sufficed, and he spent whole days, spectacles and nose, chipping bits of boxwood and ebony. "'A pack of ignorant beggars,' said he, who are satisfied with sticking a certain quantity of silk on so much whalebone. They buy their handles by the gross, handles ready-made, and they sell just what they like. I tell you, art is done for.' Denise began to take courage. He had insisted on having Pepe down in the shop to play, for he was wonderfully fond of children. When the little one was crawling about on all fours, neither of them had room to move, she in her corner doing the mending, he near the window, carving with his little pocket-knife. Every day now brought on the same work and the same conversation. Whilst working, he continually pitched into the lady's paradise, never tired of explaining how affairs stood. He had occupied his house since 1845, and had a thirty years lease, at a rent of 1,800 francs a year, and, as he made a thousand francs out of his four furnished rooms, he only paid 800 for the shop. It was a mere trifle, 
he had no expenses, and could thus hold out for a long time still. To hear him, there was no doubt about his triumph. He would certainly swallow up the monster. Suddenly he would interrupt himself. "'Have they got any dog's heads like that?' And he would blink his eyes behind his glasses, to judge the dog's head he was carving, with its lip turned up and fangs out, in a lifelike growl. Pepe, delighted with the dog, would get up, placing his two little arms on the old man's knee. "'As long as I make both ends meet, I don't care a hang about the rest.' The latter would resume, delicately shaping the dog's tongue with the point of his knife. "'The scoundrels have taken away my profits, but if I am making nothing, I am not losing anything yet, or at least but very little. And, you see, I am ready to sacrifice everything rather than yield.' He would brandish his knife, and his white hair would blow about in a storm of anger. "'But,' Denise would mildly observe, without raising her eyes from her needle, "'if they made you a reasonable offer,' it would be wiser to accept. Then his ferocious obstinacy would burst forth. Never! If my head were under the knife, I would say no, by heavens. I've another ten years' lease, and they shall not have the house before then, even if I should have to die of hunger within the four bare walls. Twice already have they tried to get over me. They offered me twelve thousand francs for my good will, and eighteen thousand francs for the last ten years of my lease, in all thirty thousand not for fifty thousand even. I have them in my power, and intend to see them licking the dust before me. Thirty thousand francs! It's a good sum, Denise would resume. You could go and establish yourself elsewhere, and suppose they were to buy the house. Bourras, putting the finishing touches to his dog's tongue, would appear absorbed for a moment, an infantine laugh pervading their venerable prophet's face. Then he would continue. The house, no fear! They spoke of buying it last year, and offered eighty thousand francs, twice as much as it's worth. But the landlord, a retired fruiterer, as big a scoundrel as they, wanted to make them shell out more. But not only that, they are suspicious about me. They know I'm not so likely to give way. No, no, here I am, and here I intend to stay. The emperor with all his cannon could not turn me out. Denise never dared to say any more. She would go on with her work, whilst the old man continued to break out in short sentences, between two cuts with his knife, muttering something to the effect that the game had hardly commenced. Later on they would see wonderful things. He had certain plans which would sweep away their umbrella counter, and, in his obstinacy, there appeared a personal revolt of the small manufacturer against the threatening invasion of the great shops. Pepe, however, would at last climb on his knees, and impatiently stretch out his hand towards the dog's head. "'Give it me, sir.' "'Presently, my child,' the old man would reply in a voice that suddenly became tender. "'He hasn't any eyes. We must make his eyes now.' And whilst carving the eyes, he would continue talking to Denise. "'Do you hear them? Isn't there a roar next door? That's what exasperates me more than anything. My word of honour, to have them always on my back with their infernal locomotive-like noise.' "'It made his little table tremble,' he asserted. The whole shop was shaken, and he would spend the entire afternoon without a customer, in the trepidation of the crowd which overflowed the ladies' paradise. It was from morning to night a subject for eternal grumbling. Another good day's work. They were knocking against the wall. The silk department must have cleared ten thousand francs, or else he made merry over a showery day which had killed the receipts, and the slightest rumours, the most unimportant noises, furnished him with subjects of endless comment. "'Ah! Someone has slipped down. "'Ah! If they could only all fall and break their backs. "'That, my dear, is a dispute between some ladies. "'So much the better. So much the better. "'Do you hear the parcels falling onto the lower floor? "'It's disgusting.' "'It did not do for Denise to discuss his explanations, "'for he retorted bitterly by reminding her of the shameful way they had dismissed her. "'She was obliged to relate for the hundredth time her life in the dress department,' the hardship she had endured at first, the small unhealthy bedrooms, the bad food, and the continual struggle between the salesmen, and they were thus talking about the shop from morning to night, absorbing it hourly in the very air they breathed. "'Give it me, sir,' Pepe would repeat, with eager outstretched hands. The dog's head finished, Bourras would hold it at a distance, then examine it closely with childish glee. "'Take care, it will bite you.' "'There, go and play, and don't break it if you can help it.' 
Then, resuming his fixed idea, he would shake his fist at the wall. "'You may do all you can to knock the house down. You shan't have it, even if you invade a whole neighbourhood. Denise had now her daily bread assured her, and she was extremely grateful to the old umbrella dealer, whose good heart she felt beneath his strange, violent ways. She had a strong desire, however, to find some work elsewhere, for she often saw him inventing some trifle for her to do. She fully understood that he did not require a workwoman in the present slack state of his business, and that he was employing her out of pure charity. Six months had passed thus, and the dull winter season had again returned. She was despairing of finding a situation before March, when, one evening in January, Deloche, who was watching for her in a doorway, gave her a bit of advice. Why did she not go and see Robineau? Perhaps he might want someone. In September, Robineau had decided to buy Vincard's silk business, trembling all the time lest he should compromise his wife's sixty thousand francs. He had paid forty thousand for the goodwill and stock, and was starting with the remaining twenty thousand. It was not much, but he had Gaujean behind him to back him up with any amount of credit. Since his disagreement with the Ladies' Paradise, the latter had been longing to stir up a system of competition against the Colossus, and he thought victory certain by creating special shops in the neighbourhood, where the public could find a large and varied choice of articles. The rich Lyons manufacturers, such as Dumontel, were the only ones who would accept the big shop's terms, satisfied to keep their looms going with them looking for their profits by selling to less important houses. But Gorgon was far from having the solidity and staying power possessed by Dumontel. For a long time a simple commission agent, it was only during the last five or six years that he had had looms of his own, and he still had a lot of work done by other makers, furnishing them with the raw material and paying them by the art. It was precisely this system which, increasing his manufacturing expenses, had prevented him competing with Dumontel for the supply of the Paris paradise. This had filled him with rancour. He saw in Robineau the instrument of a decisive battle to be declared against these drapery bazaars, which he accused of ruining the French manufacturers. When Denise called, she found Madame Robineau alone, daughter of an overseer in the Department of Highways, entirely ignorant of business matters, she still retained the charming awkwardness of a girl educated in a Blois convent. She was dark, very pretty, with a gentle, cheerful manner, which gave her a great charm. She adored her husband, living solely by his love. As Denise was about to leave her name, Robineau came in and engaged her at once, one of his two saleswomen having left the previous day to go to the ladies' paradise. "'They don't leave us a single good hand,' said he. However, with you I shall feel quite easy, for you are like me, you can't be very fond of them. Come to-morrow. In the evening, Denise hardly knew how to announce her departure to Bourras. In fact, he called her an ungrateful girl, and lost his temper. Then, when, with tears in her eyes, she tried to defend herself by intimating that she could see through his charitable conduct, he softened down said that he had plenty of work, that she was leaving him just as he was about to bring out an umbrella of his invention. "'And Pepe?' asked he. This was Denise's great trouble. She dared not take him back to Madame Gras, and could not leave him alone in the bedroom, shut up from morning to night. "'Very good. I'll keep him,' said the old man. "'He'll be all right in my shop. We'll do the cooking together.' Then, as she refused, fearing it might inconvenience him, he thundered out, "'Great heavens! Have you no confidence in me? I shan't eat your child!' Denise was much happier at Robineau's. He only paid her sixty francs a month, with her food, without giving her any commissions on the sales, just the same as in the old-fashioned houses. But she was treated with great kindness, especially by Madame Robineau, always smiling at her counter. He, nervous, worried, was sometimes rather abrupt. At the expiration of the first month, Denise was quite one of the family, like the other saleswoman, a silent, consumptive little body. The Robineaus were not at all particular before them, talking of the business at table in the back shop, which looked on to a large yard. And it was there they decided one evening on starting the campaign against the ladies' paradise. Gaujean had come to dinner. After a usual roast leg of mutton, he had broached the subject in his Lyon's voice, thickened by the Rhone fogs. "'It is getting unbearable,' said he. 
they go to Dumontail, purchase the sole right in a design, and take three hundred pieces straight off, insisting on a reduction of ten sous a yard, and, as they pay ready money, they enjoy moreover the profit of eighteen per cent discount. Very often, Dumontail barely makes four sous a yard out of it. He works to keep his looms going, for a loom that stands still is a dead loss. Under these circumstances, how can you expect that we, with our limited plant, and especially with our makers, can keep up the struggle? Robinot, pensive, forgot his dinner. Three hundred pieces, he murmured. I tremble when I take a dozen, and at ninety days. They can mark up a franc or two francs cheaper than us. I have calculated there is a reduction of at least fifteen per cent in their catalogued articles, when compared with our prices. That's what kills the small houses. He was in a period of discouragement. His wife, full of anxiety, was looking at him with a tender air. She understood very little about the business. All these figures confused her. She could not understand why people took such trouble when it was so easy to be gay and love one another. However, it sufficed that her husband wished to conquer, and she became as impassioned as he himself, and would have stood to her counter till death. "'But why don't all the manufacturers come to an understanding together?' resumed Robinot violently. They could then lay down the law, instead of submitting to it. Gaujon, who had asked for another slice of mutton, was slowly masticating. Ah, oh, why, why, the looms must be kept going, I tell you, when one has weavers everywhere, in the neighbourhood of Lyon, in the Gard, in the Isere, they can't stand still a day without an enormous loss. Then we who sometimes employ makers having ten or fifteen looms are better able to control the output, as far as regards to stock, whilst the big manufacturers are obliged to have continual outlets, the quickest and largest possible, so that they are on their knees before the big shops. I know three or four who outbid each other, and who would sooner work at a loss than not obtain the orders, but they make up for it with the small houses like yours. Yes, if they exist through them, they make their profit out of you. Heaven knows how the crisis will end. It's odious, exclaimed Robinot, relieved by this cry of anger. End of chapter 7, part 1